Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President. I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question is that committees be authorised to meet during the sittings of the Senate today. All of those that few say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. I think it's the Senator Thorpe seeking the call. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day, Treasury Laws Amendment 2000, uh, 2022, Measures No. 5, Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Uh, Senator Dean Smith is here, present. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, President. I rise. I sort of feel as if something else should be happening. <laughs> Nothing else should be happening. Oh, please yeah. resume your seat, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, uh, President. I seek leave to make a one-minute statement about my new status as an independent. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted, Senator Thorpe. I inform the Senate that yesterday I resigned as a member of the Australian Greens and will sit as an independent senator for Victoria. I also inform the Senate that I should be designated as a whip for the purpose of Standing Order 24A relating to the selection of bills committee. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Thorpe. <clears throat> I'll call the clerk and we'll just restart. Senator Smith. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Treasury Laws Amendment 2022, Measures number five, Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. Uh, well, my remarks are going to be somewhat less climatic, um, but <laughs> I rise this morning, I rise, I rise this afternoon, to speak on the Treasury Laws Amendment Bill 2022, Measures number five. Uh, bill of 2022, and of course the opposition will be supporting this bill. It's largely procedural in nature, and it's well established custom and tradition of this Parliament that uh, applications for deductible gift recipient status that are agreed by the House uh, are also agreed by the Senate. This bill implements decisions taken by the previous coalition government to grant or extend deductible gift re recipient status on a number of organisations, including the Melbourne Business School, the Leaders Institute of South Australia, St Patrick's Cathedral Melbourne Restoration Fund, the Jewish Education Foundation, the Australian Education Research Organisation, Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition and the Sydney Shreva Kadisha. The bill also grants the status to Australians for Indigenous the bill also grants the status to, to Australians for Indigenous constitutional recognition limited, uh, as I previously noted, which was set out in the government's 2022-2023 October budget. I also note that the Mount Eliza Graduate School of Business and Government has ceased its operations and activities, therefore its DGR status has been removed in this bill. 
The opposition's support for the provisions in this bill should not be confused with support for the way this bill has been progressed. Indeed, the existence of this bill stands as a monument to the new Labor government's inability to manage its legislative agenda so early in its term and despite yet having, or perhaps never having, a particularly wide or deep or ambitious agenda to drive down cost of living pressures or improve productivity across the economy. Put simply, this bill should actually not have existed. Those who have watched the passage of this bill closely will note that the inclusion of just a single schedule in this bill looks exactly the same as the schedule included in the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 4 Bill. The Treasury Laws Amendment No. 4 Bill is actually currently before a Senate Economic Legislation Committee. The bill before the Senate today amplifies a significant legisla legislative failure by the government. This particular schedule had originally been incorporated into the government's Treasury Laws Amendment Bill No. 4, which meant the progress of these DGR matters would have been delayed as a result of the Parliament's consideration through the Senate Economics Committee legislation of the Treasury Laws Amendment Bills No. 4, which are due to report on the 3rd of March. So, instead, in order to progress the DGR status for these worthy organisations, the government was forced to create a new Treasury Bill in order to be able to do that. The new government's new economics team is clearly operating on training wheels, and in the last parliamentary sitting week of last year, we got a valuable insight uh, into how the new government seeks to treat the crossbench in the form of Senator McKim's uh, interactions with the Minister for Financial Services, Shine. the Honourable Stephen Jones. But I'm sure my colleagues on this side can further illuminate on that experience and those observations. But the most important matter in the first few moments of the new parliament, the first sitting day of this new parliament, is that we are going from concern to crisis in the Australian economy. Just last week, we heard that the Reserve Bank of Australia, the independent bank, in response to a question from a senator, said that 800,000 loans Think about that. 800,000 loans would shift from fixed rates to variable rates in this calendar year of 2023. Just think about that. In addition to that, the Parliamentary Library has suggested that in some months of this year, the number of fixed, to fixed loan rates shifting to variable rates could be as large as 55,000. We heard last week that the Australian Energy Regulator predicts, expects, there to be 75,000 households currently on energy hardship programs. The Australian Energy Council said it expected there to be an extra 10,000 households on energy hardship programs. But more than that, the inflationary pressure, the cost of living pressures being felt across the Australian economy, being felt across Australian households, are also starting to impact the charity and not-for-profit sector. Late in December last year, just before Christmas, the Australian Council of Social Services was forced to release a report which talked about growing pressures on Australian charities as a result of inflationary pressures in the economy and because of the surge in demand that the charity and not-for-profit sector is now starting to experience as people try, unfortunately fail, to meet those cost of living pressures. That Australian Council of Social Services report says there is a surge in demand for services, that wait lists are now getting larger and, in fact, some people in need are not being able to be serviced by community sector providers at all. And if that wasn't bad enough, last week at the Cost of Living Senate inquiry we heard from charities in the not-for-profit sector themselves about how their sector is now suffering fatigue and exhaustion 
a very, very fair comment. And when you think about the fact that the Australian charities and not-for-profit sector has been at the forefront of dealing with natural disasters in our country, not one but many, stepped up, supported Australian households, supported their local communities during the pandemic, and without any reprieve, are now being forced to respond, as they always do, respond to cost of living challenges being expect, uh, experienced by Australian households, from concern to crisis. At 2.30 today, the RBA will make its latest rate decision. I wish that rate decision was going to be no change. Now, of course, I'm not, and no one in this Senate chamber is privy to what that rate change will be until 2.30. Until but I'm not a betting person, but those of you that are betting people, you'd probably want to bet on the fact that there will be a rate rise, and it will either be 25 points or 50 points. The ninth consecutive interest rate rise. Think about that. The ninth consecutive interest rate rise, and that is going to hurt Australian households who are already struggling from inflationary pressures, already struggling, struggling with the energy, energy costs increase. So what is the government's plan? Day one, new parliamentary year, what is the government's plan to provide energy relief, to provide relief to Australian households? to put downward pressure on those inflation rates and downward pressure on those interest rate rises. What is the plan? Silence. What is the plan? Silence. What is the plan? Silence. This new Labor government is imperilling the prosperity, the hard work, the effort of Australian households and Australians will start to ask themselves, why does this new Labor government make my family poorer? Why is Anthony Albanese making my family poorer? Why is the Treasurer Mr Jim Chalmers making my family poorer? Why is the new Labor government making it harder for the charity and not-for-profit sector in our country to meet the surge in demand for services? Why? Where's the plan? The government will say it's got a plan, but you have to wait until May. I can't tell you how many further interest rate increases there will be from today until May. I can't tell you how many of those 800,000 fixed rate loans transferring to variable rate loans in 2023, I can't tell you how many will be transferring in February, in March, in April, in May. That is real hurt. That is real crisis for Australian households, no matter where they live across this country. Crickets from the government. Some in the government might want to say, well, the Treasurer, he's written us a 6,000-word essay. I don't know if Senator Pratt has had the time to read it. I don't know if Senator McAllister has had the time to read it. I don't know what their view is. None of us in this place would argue with the importance of ideas, but we all know how time poor we are and how important it is to keep ourselves focused on the real challenges of doing our job in the here and now. I suspect that many Australians, when they hear that there is no plan from Mr Chalmers for cost of living relief, when there is no plan from the Labor government on how better to support charities and not-for-profits, I think the conclusion that they might come to is that 6,000-word essay was a luxury, was largesse. 
was indulgent. The economy has gone from concern to crisis. Australian households will be starting this year with trepidation, taking their kids to school with trepidation. I'll be very interested to see what happens in May, where the government chooses to put that much needed relief. I'm someone who says I would like to see that plan sooner rather than later. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I'm rising to speak in relation to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2022 Measures No. 5 Bill. The Australian Greens will be supporting this bill. It extends deductible gift recipient status to a number of organisations. But I want to place on the record that our position, we think requiring an act of parliament for each organisation to receive DGR status shows that the system is not working as it should be. I mean, many organisations seek would seek DGR status, but they don't have the lobbying power to get themselves placed on this bill or ones before it. We need to have a transparent, fair, independent process for enabling DGR status that doesn't leave organisations focusing on a difficult bureaucratic process and doing lots of lobbying to get themselves on this list, focusing on that rather than the, on the important work that they're doing for the community. That's not to say that we don't support these organisations that are getting DGR status. In fact, we think a lot more organisations should. We just need to have a better process. The current process is not working. It is arbitrary and it is open to being politicised. I do, however, want to thank the Assistant Minister in his office for the po positive approach that they've taken to the charity's portfolio, including the appointment of the new ACNC Commissioner. It's an important sector and we really value the fact that the minister and his office are working to consult with the sector and to, beginning to begin to address some of the really important issues that the sector is facing. And we particularly welcome the appointment of Sue Woodward AM following a merit-based process to the appointment as commissioner. Her appointment has been widely welcomed by the sector and we are very glad to see someone of her calibre in this role. But sadly, when it comes to the Treasury portfolio more broadly, there is a gaping hole that hasn't been addressed. This bill is a Treasury Laws Amendment bill. If you're thinking about what the priority should be in the Treasury Laws Amendment, it is, of course, the previous government, the Morrison government's inflationary tax cuts, which will mean that the benefits of those stage three tax cuts go to the ultra-wealthy, they go to the billionaires, they go to the people who have already got so much in our society. And, and that is at the cost of the people that really need to be having money spent. I mean, every time the Treasurer gives an update, it seems that the budget impact of the Morrison government's tax cuts has grown. A recent figure was $243 billion. And, and no doubt the final impact is going to be worse than that. They were the previous government's tax cuts. For the life of me, I do not know why the current government that professes to be a progressive government is just rolling on with these incredibly regressive tax cuts. That is the amendment, that is the priority amendment that needs to be made to our Treasury laws to scrap the stage three tax cuts. Because that $243 billion, rather than providing a tax cut to the people that do not need it, do not value it, will use their tax cuts, it will be go off in some investments, uh, enable them to have you know, their next overseas holiday, enable people to perhaps do some, you know, some lovely renovations on one of their you know, seven houses that they've already got. Those tax cuts, that $243, $243 billion could go to all sorts of things which would benefit ordinary Australians, in particular to raise the rate of job seeker and other income support above the poverty line. That is what would make a real difference to people's lives. That is the number one amendment that we should be making to our Treasury laws. And this really matters because it is clear 
that this government is making a choice to amend our laws in one way but not an another way. They are making a political choice. The poverty that people are living in is a political choice. And it's particularly clear when we're debating this tax legislation. The other element of this tax, you know, yes, we're talking about charities. The impact of people living in poverty, the massive impact that that has on the charities, on the, on the charity sector. I'm currently chairing our Senate inquiry into poverty in Australia, and we are hearing heartbreaking and absolutely awful stories of what people are going through living in poverty, and largely because there are all sorts of people living in poverty in Australia, but the ones who are suffering the most are those who are living on income support that cannot afford to put a roof over their heads, to put food on the table, to pay for the medicines that they need to to address their health issues. And they are having to choose to go hungry or to pay for their, their medication. They are having to choose how long can they cope with having their rent in arrears. When are they going to have to actually decide not? You know, they can't live in that house. They are having to cope with landlords putting up the rent and being made homeless because they just cannot afford the rent on a house anywhere in our capital cities. And so then you're in a position of living in poverty and you're homeless and it's impossible to get your life back on track. And it's the charities that are left picking up the pieces. And every charity that has appeared before our inquiry so far from Anglicare, ACOS, Uniting Care, every one of them have implored us to increase the rate of income support. So rather than spending $243 billion on tax cuts for the ultra wealthy, spend that money on increasing income support. I mean, the decisions of the former Morrison government, of course, made it really clear that poverty is a political choice. So, and it matters for people's lives. I do want to take the opportunity, given we are talking about tax legislation today, given we are talking about support for charities, given that we know that it's the charities that are picking up the pieces, and given that we know that poverty is a political po choice, I want to share some of the experiences of people that have spoken with me. I mean, one constituent told me about their in experience on income support. As a young person on JobSeeker, I consistently struggled to find secure accommodation, healthy food, and was never able to save for essential big expenses like shoes or a licence. I wasn't having daily coffees. I wasn't eating at restaurants. Yes, I feel very fortunate to have been born in Australia and be eligible for social security at all. However, it shouldn't be such a degrading, time and energy consuming process to get the very bare minimum for survival. Everything from claiming support to keeping it for any period is a stressful and dehumanising ordeal. It's worse for those trying to claim disability. And that person goes on to say, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and our government has chosen to roll back support for students, the homeless, the disabled, the elderly, the inexperienced, about to enter or return to the workforce, single parents. All of these groups have substantial obstacles put in their way by our current welfare system and its draconian limitations. Poverty is a political choice. I mean, we are in a cost of living crisis, rent skyrocketing, food prices are soaring. It's more expensive than ever to see a doctor. So when we're talking about tax reform, it's very clear where our priorities should, should lie. We should be increasing income support rather than giving handouts to the ultra-wealthy. We should be spending that money on putting dental and mental care into Medicare. We should be building more affordable housing, a million affordable homes to get people off the public housing waiting lists. We could make childcare free, and we could make a real difference in people's lives, rather than enabling people like Gina Reinhart and Clive Palmer to contribute to paying you know, for their third private jet. And I remember in 2019, when the Morrison government was ramming these changes through, Labor senators in this place made points about how dangerous they were. They acknowledged the importance of the political decisions that were being made in this very chamber. As Senator Gallagher said at the time, the job of the government is to say where that money is coming from, how those tax cuts will be paid for, and whether there's a commitment from the government not to slash essential services to the Australian community in order to pay for them. Senator Wong said at the time, these are massive numbers with far-reaching consequences for health and for education and actually for the sort of society we want for Australia. 
and we have absolutely no way and the government has no way of forecasting in 2019 how it can pay for $95 billion worth of tax cuts in 2024-25. The reality is that the government is actually locking in tax cuts without identifying the spending cuts which are required to fund them. That's the hard reality. It's locking in tax cuts without identifying the spending cuts which we'll have to identify in order to pay for them. I couldn't have said it better, Senator Wong. We agree with those points, except that that $95 billion is now $234 billion. You know, we think that fundamentally, if we're talking about Treasury law amendments, that there is one amendment that needs to be made, which would make a huge difference in people's lives. So I'll finish by moving my second reading amendment to this bill, because this should be the priority, my second reading amendment. At the end of the motion, while, while, but the Senate calls on the government to abandon the inflationary Morrison government, stage three tax cuts for billionaires and the ultra wealthy, and instead raise income support payments above the poverty line. This is a Treasury Laws Amendment Bill. That is the most important amendment that sh we should be making to our Treasury laws. That should be the government's priority. It is a choice of government because poverty is a political choice. Here, here. Bloody good order, order. Senator Hanson. Senator Scar. Thank you, Senator Henderson, for that prompt. Uh, Deputy President, uh, and I think uh, one of the points I will take on board uh, is uh, those in the gallery, I hope, admire uh, the ability of senators in this place to uh, draw upon all sorts of issues uh, in relation to uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, this piece of legislation, in fact, uh, deals with a very, very discreet issue, and that is whether or not the, schedule, uh, the relevant schedule of the Act providing for diff gift deductibility for charities should be enlarged to include one, two, three, four, five, six, seven additional uh, organisations. The Australian Education Research Organisation Limited, Jewish Education Foundation, Victoria Limited, and I'll have something more to say in that respect, Melbourne Business School Limited, Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recogni Recognition Limited, Leaders Institute of South Australia Incorporated, St Patrick's Cathedral, Melbourne Restoration Fund, and extending the deductible gift uh, status of the Sydney Chevra Kadisha and the Australian Women Donors Network. So that's what this bill actually deals with. Uh, having said that, I do associate myself entirely, absolutely, completely with my good friend Senator Dean Smith's remarks, and uh, I do associate myself with um, one of Senator Rice's remarks, uh, only one, I'm afraid, uh, but, but one, uh, and that is uh, one does wonder why it is that this sort of process has to be done through legislation. Uh, when so much in this place is done through regulation, and uh, one wonders why this can't be done by way of a disallowable instrument. So, if anyone had the particular concerns with respect to deductibility, with respect to gifts made to a charity, why couldn't that be done um, raised during a disallowance procedure, as opposed to having to consider each and every one of these no doubt worthy organisations? I wanted to make some comments with respect to. Uh, what I believe is an important issue uh, with respect to arising from the inclusion of the Jewish Education Foundation Victoria uh, Limited. And, uh, when I was reflecting on this and I saw that they had been included, uh, I did some research with respect to that foundation. I congratulate all members of that foundation with respect to the important work they do to make a Jewish education more accessible uh, to members of the Jewish community, and I think that should be applauded. And from my perspective, it underlines the important place of religious schools uh, in our community, uh, and the fact that those schools, uh, that community of faith, needs to be respected and supported in every way. So I do commend uh, all of those associated with the Jewish Education Foundation, Victoria Limited. I'm so impressed by what you're doing. Uh, in that space to make a Jewish education uh, more affordable for members of the Jewish community, in particular children. 
Secondly, this is my first opportunity uh, to rise in this House to speak uh, following the release by the Executive Council of Australian Jury of its report on anti-Semitism in Australia 2022. And we need to deeply, deeply reflect upon the outcomes of this report, uh, particularly or including with respect to the education center, sector. So uh, I've referred to the Jewish Education Foundation Victoria Limited and its efforts to provide Jewish children with an opportunity to have a Jewish education. And in that context, reading the results of this report, which covers the period 1 October 2021 to 30 September 2022, research written and compiled by Julie Nathan, research director of the Executive Council of Australian Jury, makes extraordinarily disturbing reading. Very, very disturbing reading. And I've quoted from previous reports, annual reports, by the Council in this place, and I want to take this opportunity to quote from this report. And I quote from the executive summary. During the 12-month period from 1 October 2021 to 30 September 2022, there were 478 anti-Semitic incidents logged by volunteer community security groups, official Jewish state roof bodies and the ECAJ. In the previous 12-month period ending 30 September 2021, these same bodies logged 447 incidents. So in 12 months, 12 months, an increase, an increase in the number of what are horrific anti-Semitic incidents. And I'll give some examples, um, which I shouldn't have to give in this day and age. Uh, 400 and 78 this year, 447 last year. Accordingly, there was an increase, an increase of 6.9 per cent in the overall number of reported anti-Semitic incidents compared to the previous year, 2021, which had a 35 per cent increase over the number of recorded incidents in 2020. So year to year, from 2020 to 2021, an increase of 35 per cent, and then in the subsequent year, an increase of 6.9 per cent. Why is this happening? Why is this happening in our country? I want to give some examples, and they're in the education space. So I spoke about the Victorian Foundation providing assistance to uh, Jewish children to go to Jewish schools. And this is what is happening in our community in this regard. And I'll quote some of the examples. And there are pages and pages and pages of them. Two males verbally abuse security guards outside a Jewish school, Perth, 7 October 2021. Uh, a student at a high school was the victim of ongoing Semitic abuse, both verbally in person and online, and was physically assaulted in regional New South Wales, 4 November 2021. Verbal abuse by three teenagers on electric scooters who yelled Heil Hitler at two identifiably Jewish teenagers knew a Jewish school, Melbourne, 22 April 2022. The passenger of a passing vehicle yelled Jew, Jew, Jew towards a congregant outside a synagogue, Sydney, Friday 11 March 2022. And so it goes on. The occupant of a passing vehicle yelling something Jews multiple times, multiple times, towards an identifiably Jewish male and female as they crossed the pedestrian crossing outside a Jewish school. The female in the car then made a Nazi salute. Sydney, 14 May 2022. The passenger of a passing vehicle yelled expletive, expletive Jews towards identifiably Jewish individuals and security personnel outside the front of a Jewish school, Sydney, 6 June 2022. Jewish student on a public bus harassed by students from another school. The perpetrator sat behind the victim on the bus, breathing down his neck and making anti-Semitic comments about the victim being Jewish and attending a Jewish school, Dover Heights, Sydney, 9 June 2022. And so it goes on. A man exited from a tram near a Jewish school and approached a female teacher waiting outside the school, asking her if she believed pedophiles were criminals. The teacher said yes, 
The men then asked her how she could believe that, as 90 per cent of Jews are pedophiles. When the teacher walked away, he began yelling, the rabbis in the school just wanted to expletive, expletive, expletive. That's in St Kilda, Melbourne, 1 December 2022. I, don't, I think we need to know about this. I think we need to reflect on this. I don't enjoy reading these examples, but I think in this place that our Jewish community and students going to Jewish schools need to know that we are horrified that this is happening in our community. On page 45, there are further examples in the context of uh, what is happening in schools and the manifestation of anti-Semitism against students. I want to read one particular example. And, uh, I quote, a Jewish boy was forced into a locker and sprayed with deodorant to simulate a Nazi gas chamber while other students laughed and filmed the incident at a Sydney private school early 2022. And so it goes on. Earlier this month, or last month, I attended uh, the building of a new mosque in the wonderful Queensland city of Toowoomba. The previous mosque had been the subject of two arson attempts, uh, one which caused serious damage, the second uh, burnt the mosque to the ground. And the people of Toowoomba rallied, rallied around their Muslim community, their Muslim brothers and sisters, and have helped in the rebuilding of that mosque. The very best, the very best of Australian values. So whether or not it is our Jewish community or our Muslim community, we in this place and those in civic society and all Australians, all Australians need to, need to support, support our religious communities, our Jewish community, our Muslim community when they are subject to hatred and vitriol, which goes against every single thing we stand for and in this place, in this place. And I, for one, will be, um, in what I consider an appropriate way, um, to be uh, making a contribution uh, to provide solidarity um, with the people um, of the Jewish education community, to show my solidarity with them and to say to them that you have the support. You have the support of the senators in this place. You have the support of the senators in this place. Uh, and this is not the Australia. These manifestations of vile anti-Semitic conduct does not represent the Australia that we believe in. And it is not, it is not reflective of the views of the vast majority of Australians. But when these, hap these incidents occur, whether or not it's, it's vile anti-Semitic incidents directed at our Jewish community or the burning down of a mosque in Toowoomba in my home state of Queensland, which is being rebuilt, which is being rebuilt with the, the majority, vast majority of community support. We need to call out this behaviour and say that we stand, we stand with those communities who are subject to this persecution and who are subject to this awful, awful vile acts of, um, of, of racial hatred. Uh, and with that, uh, I, uh, uh, I commend this bill to, uh, to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much uh, for solving that uh, mystery, and thank you for giving me the call, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, the reason we're having this debate in the Senate today about the uh, Tax Laws Amendment Bill Number no. Five uh, is because the government has mismanaged the Parliament and has had to spin a schedule from the TLAB 4 bill into this bill uh, in order to pass it through Parliament, I imagine, this week. Now, the TLAB 4 bill is quite an ambitious bill, has lots of different component parts, uh, not many of which are related to one another, uh, but that's how these bills roll, and I understand that. Now, um, the digital currency taxation component of that bill uh, has been uh, cherry-picked out uh, by the government 
as part of its hodgepodge approach to uh, regulating digital assets. It, the government doesn't think that uh, regulating the industries of uh, not even tomorrow today is a priority. It's more important to work through the list of grievances from your favourite vested interests at the class action law firms, the unions, the super funds, etc. Uh, and as a result of that, the government for vested interests has put Australia into the, the slow lane when it comes to key uh, industry and economic policy. Uh, and this is one example here in relation to digital assets. Now, of course, uh, people will, will recall in the last calendar year there was a major collapse of a uh, cryptocurrency organisation called FTX. And of course, the solution to a lot of these issues is having strong uh, gatekeepers and having a decent licensing framework and a, uh, a system of consumer protections in place. So uh, if a consumer decides to invest in a cryptocurrency market, uh, there would be capital requirements, there'd be key personnel tests, uh, there would be a a set of regulations designed to protect consumers if things go wrong. Now, rather than progressing the agenda uh, to protect consumers, but also to advance investment into Australia, because of course uh, this is a, a race for regulation here, uh, I believe that the countries that put the, the most regulation in place on digital assets uh, perversely will be able to capture the most investment because there is a need for certainty here in relation to di digital assets. But what we see from this government, the government for vested interests, is a agenda where you see a hodgepodge tax approach uh, on uh, digital assets, uh, trying to define uh, Bitcoin as a, um, as a property asset. And then you see a, a token mapping exercise released by Minister Jones last week, but nothing on regulating the gatekeepers, nothing to protect consumers. So, as I've said before in this place, um, there will be more collapses uh, in this area. There will be more cryptocurrency, more digital asset businesses uh, that cause consumer harm when they go under. And all of these failures will be on the head of the government because, of course, the government only reacts to its favourite vested interests. Now, there's no organisation here, or there's not many strong organisations that are recommending these changes, therefore they fall on deaf ears. And it is a bit like the point Senator Rice made about how difficult it can be to get a DGR listing. Uh, you shouldn't have to be a rich and famous person to get a DGR uh, claim assessed. Uh, you shouldn't have to have uh, an individual listing uh, because, I mean, the average person, and I'm reminded here, of course, no one's average, but the typical person uh, it does not have access to ministers, ministerial officers, departments to make their case. So, uh, as this bill, this TLAB 5 bill, which is cut out of TLAB 4, continues on, uh, TLAB 4 sits on the, on the books waiting to be considered again by the parliament. Now, of course, the other thing that's in TLAB 4 uh, are the proposed financial reporting changes for super funds. And this takes us back to another favourite issue from the last calendar year, when, of course, the first act of one of the first acts of the government was to strip transparency from members of super funds so they couldn't see where the, their money was being sent off to unions. Because, of course, when you are the government for vested interest over that side of the Senate, um, and you're only interested in the, the small uh, rent-seeking uh, issues put forward by uh, small-minded people, and you, you don't take the national interest into, into account, of course it makes sense that your first issue that you take on will be removing transparency from punters so they can't see where their money has been sent off to finance a campaign at the CFMEU or some other union. Now, helpfully, very helpfully, I have to say, I have to say um, we have to thank the um, Electoral Commission last week for releasing new information, new data, which shows uh, that there are tens of millions of dollars each year 
being sent off from the super funds into the unions, and the unions are having to declare it on the AEC's website because they, of course, are captured uh, under the reporting obligations under the electoral laws. So we now know that in one fund's case, a fund called First Super, a tiny fund, uh, it paid 2.5 million bucks to the CFMEU uh, out of members' money. So they've decided that it was okay to take $2.5 million of the members' retirement savings and give it to the CFMEU as a gift or something. Um, now, we know that because of the AEC disclosures, but, but um, we don't know that members are able to access the information because that information has been cut out of the disclosures that go to the punters. Because, of course, Minister Jones made his first order to cut out that level of transparency. And I note that this week, again, very helpfully, very helpfully, the Senate will have an opportunity to consider uh, whether it will disallow this regulation that was made by, by Minister Jones, which prevents the people of Australia from seeing whether or not their funds, their super funds, are taking their retirement savings and sending it off to related parties for political and other purposes. Now, the Senate last year, I believe, made a mistake in not knocking, not knocking out that regulation then. I think this week, uh, I hope this week we will see a different result where the regulation made by Minister Jones would be knocked out and then we would revert back to the regulation made by the coalition government last parliament. Now, if that regulation was in place now, then the members would be able to see everything that the AEC told us was happening last week. And that is a big change because, as this chamber well knows, most people don't have time to wade through AEC disclosures to find these pieces of information. Um, many members will look at their annual member statements. They are interested in their balances of their superannuation because it's their money. So the stripping of that uh, information, I think, was very detrimental, and we look forward to the Senate reconsidering this matter later in the week. Um, I, I agree with Senator Scar, and I agree with Senator Rice. I think it is too hard uh, to get a DGR listing. I think it should be uh, easier to do. And I have to say, for transparency, um, I believe it is a good thing that we are listing the Australians for uh, Indigenous uh, constitutional recognition. Uh, it's a listing that I believe should have been made uh, in the last parliament. I made some attempts to uh, get that to happen, but I wasn't successful. But I'm pleased that this is happening now. And I, and I think it's, it's fair that there should also be a listing given to a, a no case. I think that's only reasonable. And I would say that there are some very good people that are associated with uh, AICR, um, including Rachel Perkins, who is continuing um, and now multi-generational effort by her family uh, to address some of the issues uh, that concern many Australians about the position of Indigenous people in this country. And uh, for anyone who took the opportunity to see uh, her recent program on the Australian wars, um, I think people will be reminded that um, even just half a generation ago, people were going through our schools in Australia and not learning the full balance of our history. I mean, when I was taught history of Australia, and of course, being a, a, a Victorian back then, um, when, you, when you're taught the history of Australia, of course, it's the history of Victoria. Um, there was no um, there was no emphasis on the on the, the dreadful policies of the Black Line uh, in Tasmania uh, and and those grotesque policies, which should be known to all Australians. And I, so I would take the opportunity to, to commend. Uh, Rachel Perkins and her work, uh, and I look forward to their efforts uh, as part of this uh, body, which is due to receive deductible gift recipient status. And I restate my point before that it is only fair that there should also be a no case put forward. Um, it is premature uh, for uh, most people, I, I would say, to uh, flag whether or not they will be voting for or against this proposal, because at this stage uh, we don't have a final proposal from the government. But uh, without taking any more time today in the Senate, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity for making a few uh, random comments about things which I think are important but not necessarily connected 
uh, just as a TLAB bill has random things that are not necessarily connected. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I don't uh, seek to add too much to the Senate's time here. I just wanted to highlight the, that this bill provides tax deductible status to a group called Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition, who are Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition. Well, in a media release released last week, it says uh, Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition is a key fundraising and organising vehicle in the campaign for a constitutional recognition through a voice to Parliament. So, effectively, this bill provides tax deductible status for the group campaigning for the yes side of the voice debate. Now, I am not against that. Uh, I welcome uh, uh, supporting uh, groups that are contributing to a political debate, but I do want to highlight a glaring inconsistency here that there is no equivalent tax deductible status being given uh, to a group uh, to, to advocate for the no side of this campaign. Now, if you are listening to this, uh, uh, you might be getting the uh, very stark feeling that somehow the government, uh, that our betters in society are stacking the dice against the no campaign here. There's a lot of people who are desperate to see uh, this yes vote. Our constitution will be changed on race-based lines. And this is another example uh, of the playing field being tilted in favour of the yes case in a way that is completely inconsistent with past our past democratic practices and is seeking to influence and change our constitution in a non-democratic way. Well, if you are listening to this, and I, I realise a lot of people don't know what The Voice is yet, most still think it's a reality TV show, uh, but if you don't know what it is, just remember that your betters, the politicians, are really, really keen to have it. And in my experience, if a politician is really, really keen to get something, it's probably not good for you. It's probably not going to be best for our society and our community because my experience down here in Canberra is they often don't put your interests first. So while this bill does not provide an equal playing field for the yes and no case, I have great faith in wisdom, in the common sense uh, and uh, uh, appropriate cynicism about authority that Australians represent, they will not have the wool pulled over their eyes. They will see this what it is for, that this is a blatant attempt to support one side of a political debate and not another. It should not stand uh, in our democracy, and I'm hopeful the Australian people will make sure it doesn't later this year. Thank you. Senator Canavan. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, as Senator Bragg observed about his own contribution, uh, it's been a wide-ranging debate which has canvassed uh, a range of issues, few of which are directly connected to the substance of the bill before us. Um, and to that extent, uh, it's not my intention to range quite as widely uh, as, as all of my Senate colleagues. But I did want to make uh, just this one comment. Um, Senator Scar, of course, took the opportunity to um, elevate some of the recently published research about an increase in uh, reported incidents of anti-Semitism and racism. Um, he sought to uh, make some comments here, I think, about our shared obligation and responsibility to combat these behaviours and to combat the beliefs that enable them and support them. Because words matter. And words, as Senator, Star Senator Scar's earlier contribution uh, demonstrate for us, can lead to action, to giving permission uh, to people who believe that it's OK to bully, intimidate, harass and vilify people on the basis of their faith or on the basis of their race. And it's completely unacceptable. Racism and anti-Semitism is completely unacceptable, and I hope that everyone in this chamber would share that view and would understand our mutual responsibility to combat it. Um, but to return to the matters that are before the Senate in, in the bill that's before us, uh, the bill, of course, amends the Income Tax Assessment Act um, to include the Australian Education Research Organisation Limited, the Jewish Education Foundation, Melbourne Business School Limited, Australians for Indigenous Constitutional Recognition, the Leaders Institute of South Australia, and St Patrick's Cathedral Melbourne Restoration Fund on the list of deductible gift recipients. It extends the current listing for Sydney uh, Chevra Kadisha and Australian Women Donors Network, and it removes the listing for Mount Eliza Graduate School of Business and Government Limited. I think 
people here and people listening understand that deductible gift recipient status allows members of the public to receive income tax donations, uh, deductions for the donations that they make to these organisations. In contemplating this legislation, and I hope providing support for it, the parliament uh, and the Australian government are supporting these organisations in their provision of valuable community services by granting them deductible gift status. And I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator McAllister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Uh, Senator McAllister. Okay. Is a um, is a division still required? Uh, the, I still have an indication from senators that uh, a division is still required. So. We will continue the division, but um, thank you for indicating that, Senator McAllister. Lock the doors.
The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint uh, Senator Rice the teller for the ayes, and I appoint Senator Cadell teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 42. The question is resolved in the negative. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been circulated. Oh, apologies, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Thank you, Clark. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage on this bill? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move, that the, I move that the bill now be uh, heard, read a third time. The question is that the bill now be read a third time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk.
a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. In support amendment 2022 measures number one bill 2022, second reading debate. Thank you, Clark. This might allow senators to vacate the chamber if they are not taking part in this part of the debate. And I give the call to Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. And a pleasure, as always, to rise to make a contribution to the debate on this occasion on the Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill 2022. Um, and uh, I just at the outset want to commend the work that my colleague, um, the Honourable Alan Tudge MP, put in in the other place in relation to the Coalition's response to this bill. Um, to begin with, the purpose of this bill is to give effect to, uh, broadly speaking, two legislative changes which were introduced before the last election um, by the Coalition, which of course uh, lapsed at the dissolution of the Parliament. Um, and they were the Education Legislation Amendment, Measures No. 1, Bill 2022, and the Higher Education Legislation Amendment 2021, Measures No. 1, Bill 2021. The bill before us today gives effect to the Help for Rural Doctors and Nurse Practitioners, practitioners measure announced, uh, as I've already said, by the Coalition in the 2021-22 MyEFO. And the measures uh, contained herein provide a partial or full higher, higher beg your pardon, education loan um, program or help debt reduction for rural doctors and nurse practitioners who reside and practice in regional, rural or remote Australia. Uh, this measure was previously included in the Education Legislation Amendment Measures No. 1, Bill 2022. Uh, the bill also changes the definition of a grandfathered student uh, to clarify grandfathering arrangements under the Job Ready Graduates Package of Reforms to Higher Education, um, as we've referred to them as the HELP grandfathering measures. These changes correct an unintended consequence of the grandfathering provisions to ensure that honours students remain eligible for grandfathering arrangements where their course commenced before the year 2021. And the changes were previously included in the other bill I referenced earlier, the Higher Education Legislation Amendment 2021 Measures No. 1, Bill 2021. So with regard to some of the specific elements here, um, obviously I'd like to turn first to the Helpful Rural Doctors and Nurse, nurse Practitioners measure. Uh, the Help for Rural Doctors and Nurse Practitioners measure was announced by the Coalition, as I've already said, in the MAIFO 2021-22. Uh, this measure encouraged uh, the relocation or was aimed to encourage the relocation and retention of eligible doctors and nurse practitioners by reducing their outstanding help hex debt. The measure allowed for the waiver of indexation on outstanding help debts for eligible doctors and nurse practitioners while they're residing in and completing eligible work in a rural remote or very remote area. Help hex debts for doctors can, of course, be up to the value of uh, $100,000, which is not a small sum. The value of the debt reduction will be guided by the location um, eligible doctors and nurses locate to using the modified Monash model. The modified uh, Monash model depicts the remoteness of the location, with the MM1 representing a major city through to MM7 representing a very remote location. And the eligible locations for this measure uh, will be areas MM3 through to MM7. And for example, doctors and nurse practitioners who chose to uh, work in a remote area will need to provide a minimum of 24 hours um, a week of MBS build services for a period equivalent to half the duration of their degree to have their full HEX help debt waived. Uh, for doctors and nurse practitioners who chose to work in a rural or regional area, they'll need to provide a minimum of 24 hours uh, a week of MBS build services for a period uh, equivalent to the duration of their whole degree. The measures will be backdated as per the Coalition's announcement uh, back in the MAIFO, and eligibility will be retrospectively applied um, with comm commencement from 1 January 2022. The program is expected to encourage up to 850 eligible doctors or nurses to relocate to a rural, regional or remote area each year. And this bill establishes the program eligibility requirements for the target health practitioners and the nature of the work to be undertaken to achieve benefits of the program and provides for secondary legislation, which is the 
uh, Help Debtor Guidelines Health Practitioner to articulate the specifics of eligible participants, eligible locations and eligible work and to support the administration of the program. The legislation to enact this measure was previously uh, included in the Education Legislation Amendment Measures No. 1 Bill 2022, which again was introduced by the Coalition in February of last year, which of course also lapsed at the dissolution of the Parliament. Why is there a focus on doctors and nurse practitioners? Well, individuals living in regional Australia, as we know, um, experience poorer health outcomes than their city counterparts, and this is, of course, attributed to less access to preventative health services, such as the services of a GP. According to the 2022 AIHW Health of the Nation report, GPs living and working in regional Australia experience greater job satisfaction than those living in urban areas, yet there's still a chronic shortage of GPs, particularly those in country communities. However, with only one in seven graduates in medicine choosing the path of general practice, securing doctors in rural and remote Australia is becoming increasingly difficult. And according to Richard Colbrand, the CEO of the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network, there isn't a town in rural New South Wales that isn't at risk of being able to sustain a primary care, uh, sustain primary care in their communities. Without general practice, patients will uh, turn to the already overstretched uh, em emergency departments and won't seek medical treatment at all, leading to poorer health outcomes. Uh, as I've already said, this is coalition legislation in, in essence. It was introduced before the last election. Uh, and uh, we therefore support the bill. Um, there will be an amendment uh, during the committee stage, and I look forward to speaking to that at that point. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, um, Deputy Chair. I wish to speak to the Higher Education Support Amendment um, 2022 Measures No. 1, Bill 2022. And I will come to the Greens' position on this bill in a few minutes. But I want to start by saying that this bill is a massive missed opportunity, both with respect to student debt and changes, and also with changes to the terrible, punitive, and cruel Job Ready Graduates Bill that was pushed through by the Liberals and that hiked fees and cut university funding. The entire Job Ready Graduates package was a complete disaster, and it's not sufficient to just fix the grandfathering error, nor is it sufficient to pretend that nothing can be done to fix that disaster until after the university accord process, which is only due to deliver its final report at the end of this year, with recommendations years away from being implemented. When current policy is causing problems for so many people and is deeply flawed, like this job ready graduates, urgent action is warranted. Job-ready graduates raise student fees and cut billions from Commonwealth contributions to teaching and learning. It failed in its attempt to encourage more enrollments in priority courses, such as science, engineering, and mathematics, and burden hundreds of thousands of students with billions in additional collective debt, shifting the overall cost of university education away from the Commonwealth and onto students. Job-ready graduates, as designed, had unfair and disproportionate impacts on students who may already be marginalized, subject to structural discrimination, or at greater risk of dropping out, including women, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, low SES students, first and family students, and students who live in regional areas. It just entrenched pre-existing inequalities. As the CEO of the Grattan Institute, Daniel Wood stated in relation to the Job Ready Graduates Bill back in 2020, and this is what she said, I honestly think it's one of the worst designed policies that I have ever seen. Even if you accept its stated rationale, it doesn't go anywhere near achieving it. So the current bill that we are debating is a missed opportunity with regards to this particular grandfathering requirement and also with regards to the student debt. Education is a right, not a privilege reserved for those who can afford to pay for it. It should be universal and it should be free at all levels. And it is a travesty that student debt exists in the first place. It should be completely wiped. Tinkering around the edges and reducing student debt for certain cohorts 
is totally insufficient. The need to address ballooning student debt in this country has never been greater. And again, it's not a problem which should be palmed off until after the accord process has wrapped up. If inflation continues to rise, as is expected, student debt is likely to be indexed by around 7% on June 1 this year. And this means that a person with an average help debt of around $24,770 will face an increase of over $1,700 to that debt. And this is pretty staggering, particularly in the midst of a cost of living crisis, which is hitting young people the hardest. The increase in debt will be much higher for those who are shackled with the biggest study debt burden. For those close to, for, for close to 600,000 people who have a health debt of $40,000, debts could rise by almost $3,000. These debts are holding people back from being able to get a car loan, a loan to purchase their first home, and severely limiting the amount that they are able to borrow. Ballooning student debt so it's already causing harm. And last year, I heard from so many people about how rising student debt was holding them back. And I just want to put on the record here what some of them said. So one said, I'm literally 20 and already owe more than $20,000. That's more than $1,000 for every year of my life. Another one said, my HEX and student loan comes to $80,000. Indexation will mean all I have paid in the last 12 months comes to nothing. And then there's this, I've just finished my degree, mum of two who staggered through it during lockdowns and about to enter the full-time working world, feeling like I'm behind before I even begin. Um, another person told me, I'm going to pay about three and a half thousand in hex this year and at the end of the year my hex debt will increase by $4,760. Absolute nightmare. And then this is the last one I'm going to read out today, although there's plenty more. This year, my debt went up by more than the compulsory payments reduced it by. Paying thousands to still have my hex debt growing is so disheartening. And that is why I say that this bill is just tinkering around the edges and not sufficient. At the very least, we need to freeze indexation now to stop pouring fuel on the student debt crisis. We also need to raise the minimum repayment threshold to the median wage so we can ease the cost of living pressures for millions. And that's why I have introduced a bill to do just that. The bill we are debating amends the grandfathering provisions in the Higher Education Support Act to make them fairer and introduces a scheme for eligible doctors and nurses to have their health debts reduced or wiped if they live and work in rural and remote areas for a period based on the length of their degree. The bill also allows for the waiver of indexation in relation to eligible health practitioners' health debts while they are working in rural or remote areas. And so the Greens will support this bill because it does fix at least one broken element of the Liberals' job-ready graduates package the current unfair grandfathering of fee increases, which saw students who enrolled in honor, honors courses who were hit by such high fees. Um, it does also at least introduce measures to lower and wipe student debt for one cohort of students, so that's a step forward. But what we really need to work towards is the complete wiping of all student debt in this country and making education free for all. And I'm proud to be a member of the first and the only party in Australia to commit to this vision. And that's why I will be moving a second reading amendment um, to this effect to make sure that student debt is wiped um, and to recognize that tertiary education, like all education, is an essential service and it should be universal and free. Thank you, Senator. Senator Smith, Mario. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I'm also rising today to make a few brief remarks on measures within the Higher Education Support Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill. 
And particularly, I want to acknowledge the measures within this bill that work to encourage doctors and nurse practitioners to live and work in rural, remote and very remote areas in Australia. This bill will allow for eligible doctors and nurse practitioners to have their help debts reduced or wiped if they live and work in those areas for a period based on the length of their degree. And I rise today to welcome these initiatives as part of the bill because we know that bringing healthcare professionals to our regions is urgent business. As a senator for South Australia, as I travel around our state, I have heard countless times the difficulties South Australians living in our regions, in our remote areas, in our rural areas have in accessing adequate healthcare services, quality healthcare services, and importantly, continuity of care in the services that they do access. We know that the provision of healthcare services in our regions is simply not up to scratch. And over the past few years since I've been elected, we've seen things like the repeated cancellation of obstetric services in Sejuna. This happening over and over again, leaving women and their families with huge distances to travel to give birth, travelling far away from their families and their support networks at an already stressful period in their lives. And we see it in the provision of completely substandard health facilities in rural and regional South Australia in towns like Sejuna, where thankfully this government, the Labor government, in partnership with our state Labor government, is finally rebuilding the local health clinic, Yadu Health, something I have been campaigning for years on in this case, in, in this place, a, a situation we had in Sejuna which was completely substandard and where the previous government refused to act. We know communities. There are, in communities there are people travelling incredibly long distances to see their GPs and who have suffered from a lack of timely access to quality health care and, of course, to a lack of continuity of care from their health care providers. And we know, especially when it comes to managing chron uh, chronic disease and complex conditions, a trusted relationship matters. Continuity of care matters. In towns like Murray Bridge, a town that can be disadvantaged at times by its proximity to Adelaide, a town where it can be close enough to miss out on some good services because it's assumed that it's easy enough to get to Adelaide, these types of measures will really matter. Acting Deputy President, our healthcare systems have been under strain. They need help, and I'm proud to be part of a government not afraid of doing the hard work to tackle these challenges. So whilst I appreciate this bill is primarily relating to higher education, I did want to note and uh, draw out the measures within this bill which go to having an impact on workforce, having an impact on the, the workforce of doctors and nurses in our regions. This is a critical issue, one which I think we have seen repeated failures in over, over many, many years, which have left people in my state very, very disadvantaged. And any measure that we can do as a government and as a parliament, which will mean we have access to better services, continuity of care, more professionals out in our regions, our rural and remote areas, making a difference to their local communities, providing that continuity of care, providing those services locally in a way which is accessible, in a way which allows people to stay closer to their families, closer to their support networks and, of course, closer to their employment is a really positive thing. So I do commend those measures in the bill and look forward to continuing to work uh, amidst this government's broader work and efforts on strengthening Medicare, strengthening our healthcare system, because we know after, after nine years of the previous government it has never been in worse shape. So there is a lot of work to do, and I, I commend the measures in this bill, which will hopefully make a difference in regional South Australia. Thank you, Senator. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. At the outset, we should note, we should note that the purpose of this bill is actually to give effect to two legislative changes that were introduced by the coalition government. So this bill actually gives effect to two changes introduced by the previous government which Senator Smith heavily criticised in her contribution in this place. And the first change gives effect to the Higher Education Low Pro Loan Program Debt Reduction Scheme for rural doctors and nurse practitioners who reside and practice in regional, rural or remote Australia. And then the second, the second change in this legislation is to fix an anomaly such that students who are undertaking honours programs actually also qualify for the assistance. So the basic proposition, the basic proposition is that if those people who are studying medicine, studying nursing, choose to work 
and leave in a regional or remote community, then the quid pro quo is that they're given fee relief in terms of their university fees. And that is entirely appropriate. And hopefully, hopefully, and I share this ambition with Senator Smith, hopefully will go some way towards alleviating the crisis that is currently occurring, especially in remote and regional communities in, in relation to health care. Research from the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association provides some really startling facts, some startling facts in terms of the health of people living in rural and remote communities as opposed to the health of those who had the benefit of living in larger major cities. People in, and I quote from uh, an information statement which they released, uh, which, leads a number, which lists a number of these differences. Firstly, people in rural and remote areas on average have shorter lives, higher levels of illness and more disease risk factors than those in major cities. Shorter lives, higher levels of illness and more disease risk factors than those living in major cities. The next point is quite startling. Mortality rates for males in very remote areas are 1.4 times higher than those living in major cities and 1.8 times higher for females. Mortality rates are that much higher for our fellow Australians who are living in remote communities. Age standardised suicide rates increase with remoteness, and the total burden of disease rate in remote and very remote areas is 1.4 times higher than in major cities. People living in rural and remote areas are more likely to have long-term health conditions including arthritis, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, stroke and mental health conditions. A higher proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with worse health outcomes than other Australians live in rural and remote areas. So the need is there, the need is there, but the supply of health professionals is wanting. And that's one of the things which this bill seeks to address. In the limited time available before two-minute statements, uh, I do want to make some reflections on the current state of the health system in my home state of Queensland. What is happening in Queensland, especially in regional Queensland, is an absolute disgrace. An absolute disgrace. Gladstone Hospital, and I'm reading from an ABC article dated 15 January 2023, Gladstone Hospital in central Queensland, this is a city of 60,000 people, city of 60,000 people, has been on maternity bypass for more than six months. For more than six months. And this is a city which typically, typically, the population, uh, women of Gladstone give birth to approximately 600 babies a year. 600 a year, population of 60,000, but the Queensland public health system under the Palaszczuk Labor government is incapable of providing obstetric services. And don't just believe me in relation to this. Let me quote to you from the National Association of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists president, Mr Gino Pecoraro. He said, and I quote, Gladstone had the specialist staff, but their ill treatment by the health department led them to fleeing. So we had the obstetricians in Gladstone, but they were treated so appallingly by the Queensland Health Department under the Anastasia Palaszczuk Labor government, they actually left the system. They couldn't bear working in the system. This cannot be stressed enough, Dr Pecoraro said. Doctors, myself included, have been warning the health department of the imminent collapse of maternity services for two years. The root cause of this collapse was the closure of the private maternity unit in Gladstone. This led to private specialists previously living and working in Gladstone moving out. Dr Pecoraro said following the closure, specialists were prevented from delivering private patients in the public hospital. So that's the issue. It's an ideological issue. It's an ideological issue that the Labor Party state government in Queensland wouldn't permit private patients for obstetricians being able to be delivered in a public hospital. Why? Why have this ideological blind spot in terms of the cooperation between the public health system and the private health system? When we look around the world, when we look at the health system in the United States, surely we all observe or well, we should all observe that one of the strengths of Australia is a strong public health system and a strong private health system, and the two should be working together to provide the best health services to all people, 
including Queenslanders living and working in our remote and regional communities, who do so much for this country and produce so much in terms of revenue to pay for health services and education services, which under the Queensland Labor government they simply aren't getting. It's a travesty. 60,000 people, a city of 60,000 people without an obstetrician to deliver babies. It's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And I think, uh, I think the people of Queensland should carefully reflect on the situation of our health department thank and our you, health Senator system Scar. in the lead up to you, the next election. Thank you, Senator Scar. You will be in continuation. You're finished. That's good. Thank you. It is now 1.30, so I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. Senator Payment. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Over the break, I had the pleasure of meeting with Aisha and Stephen from the Western Australian Justice Association. Wajah are university students studying across a, a range of academic fields with a shared passion for social justice. They're currently focusing on exploring ways to prevent young people coming into contact uh, with the criminal justice system with early intervention and community-based support programs. Now, to see West Aussies taking the initiative to meaningfully collaborate with community groups, not-for-profit organisations, and the legal sector in such a professional way, all whilst balancing their studies and work, gives me so much hope for the future of leadership in this country. The reports their work generates can make a significant contribution to shaping a system where promoting rehabilitation is a priority and imprisonment is a last resort. Groups like Waja deserve a seat at the table when these issues are being discussed and under this government, they will get one. As someone who's decided to get involved in politics at a young age, I know the struggle of questioning if your opinion matters when talking about such important issues, especially with people who may seem more experienced or knowledgeable. But once I started working on local campaigns and meeting Labor MPs, I quickly realised that they wanted to hear what I had to say. By campaigning with young people, I found a way to raise my voice and make a difference. It gave me the confidence to keep talking, to keep being heard, and now as Senator for WA, I have the privilege of being able to highlight the incredible work being done by other young Australians. Young people's voices are important, so I encourage any young person out there with passion to follow the lead of wider students, get involved, and to create a better Australia for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Smith, Dean. Not just a chance to rebuild, but a chance to improve. Last month, WA's West Kimberley region, an area of my state I know particularly well, experienced what has been described as a once-in-a-hundred-year flood. This disaster is unprecedented in its scale, with meteorologist James Ashley outlining that the amount of water moving down the Fitzroy River in a day is about what Perth uses water-wise in 20 years. Water levels at Fitzroy Crossing eventually peaked at 15.8 metres, 1.8 metres above the previous record, with homes and supermarkets and streets inundated. The pain and upheaval that this has brought communities across the West Kimberley already living with isolation and other challenges is difficult to imagine. From remote Indigenous communities to major towns such as Derby, there was the risk and in many cases the reality of being cut off due to road closures, including a 700 kilometre section of the Great Northern Highway. At this early point in the recovery and repair, I pay tribute to those communities affected for the remarkable courage and determination and endurance that they have shown. They have been an inspiration to many across our country. Thankfully, our Australian Defence Forces has again demonstrated its outstanding professionalism operating throughout the region to assist locals in every way possible. The delivery of essential food and medical supplies as well as emergency services personnel through fixed and rotary wing aircraft has provided a critical lifeline. But the issues for those in the West Kimberley are far from over, among them food supply and power outages across many towns and communities. The WA McGowan government must now do more to plan to catalogue the weaknesses revealed by these floods and ensure that when the next seasonal flooding occurs, you, these Senator, communities are better prepared. Expired. Senator Pocock. 
Thank you. Today I rise to speak in solidarity with the brave people of Iran whose lives are on the line as they fight for their human rights. I was deeply saddened to hear of the death of 22-year-old Kurdish woman Gina Amani after she was arrested by and died, it seems, at the hands of the Iranian so-called morality police. I'm deeply concerned about Iran's execution of civilians who have joined protests in response to Gina Amani's death. Every day we wake to news of more Iranian protesters sentenced to death, and this must end. In January, I was approached by the Iranian community in South Australia concerned for two young men, Ashia Tadistan, only 18, and Javad Rui, 35. In response, I wrote to the Islamic Republic Embassy to declare my political sponsorship of Ashia and Javad. Ashia was arrested for allegedly throwing a bottle at a police kiosk and lending someone a cigarette lighter. Javad's crime was dancing in the street. Javad has a mental illness and his family have questioned whether he was even aware a protest was taking place. Both men were imprisoned and tortured by the Islamic Republican Guard Corp and sentenced to death on co confessions exacted under torture. Javad's torture was particularly severe, causing him to suffer paralysis. For a time, he lost the ability to speak. At one point, his interrogation had to be paused so that a doctor could determine if he was still alive. Through political sponsorship, we share these prisoners' names and stories. We say their names. We voice our concern for their physical and mental health. We monitor and condemn the cruelty and injustice of their persecution and that of so many other Iranians. I was pleased to see the government's decision last week to expand sanctions against the Islamic Republic. However, I stand with the Iranian community when I say more action is needed. It's time for the government to listen to the Iranian community and do Thank more you, to attend this Prokop. appalling violence. I give the call to Senator Davey. Thank you. I rise on behalf of my colleague, Senator Raffi and myself as co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friends of Landcare. We rise to remember the life of Hori Prasad, an environmentalist who dedicated his life to promoting sustainable land use practices around the world. Hori is widely credited with developing the first land care programs in Victoria from 1986, which have grown to become a national success across Australia, helping communities adopt sustainable practices that deliver both productivity and environmental outcomes. Landcare is now an international success, with Hori becoming uh, head of the Global Landcare Organisation, a non-government organisation that works with local communities, providing technical assistance and training, as well as supporting research and development of new technologies and sustainable practices for land use. In June 2021, Hori was recognised for his contributions to conservation and the environment with an Order of Australia medal. He remained an active and interested member of the Global Land Care Organisation until his sad passing on Christmas Day 2022. Hari Passad was a true champion of the environment. He will be deeply missed by all who knew him and by the countless individuals and community organisations around the world who have benefited from his work. Vale, Hori Passad. Thank you, Senator. Senator McCarthy. Did you know that every minute of every day across Australia a child is going into hospital? And our children in Australia find that experience sometimes not to be the best of experiences. Sometimes it can be okay. But it's thanks to organisations like the Starlight Foundation Australia that has uh, given opportunities to families around hospitals across the country. And this month they're holding the Super Swim Challenge Month uh, to raise funds to assist the work that they do to make life that little bit better for uh, children in hospital, wherever they may be. In the Northern Territory, uh, over 60 communities in some of the most remote places in the Northern Territory, from the Central Desert and all the way up to the top end, are visited by the Starlight uh, Children's Foundation. And Starlight captains trek to remote communities with doctors and nurses and join them in local clinics to help engage with and interact uh, with the local children, and often obviously learning 
about the cultural practices in some of the areas and some of the languages as well. And I know it's really good for some of the starlight captains. Kids are often keen to come to community clinics knowing that uh, the starlight captains are around. And I just bring it to the attention of the Senate that this month in particular is a fundraising month for the Starlight Children's Foundation across Australia. And uh, if you're keen, as I have been, uh, I've put my hand up to swim uh, for the Children's <laughs> Starlight Children's Foundation. So you're very welcome to go on my web page and, and see if you can uh, donate towards them. It's uh, caring for our kids, all kids across Australia and their experiences in hospital, and just to make it that little bit better for their families, but especially for the children themselves. So please uh, sponsor me in my swim. <laughs> Thank you, Senator, Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Acting Deputy. If you eat Cadbury chocolate, and let's be honest, I reckon most of you do, odds are that a Tassie family farmed the dairy to make that chocolate. I think that's pretty cool. Did you know that local dairy farmers in northwest Tasmania supply almost a billion litres of milk to Cadbury a year? And that makes about 60,000 tonnes of chocolate. I was lucky enough to visit the Bernie Cadbury factory a few weeks ago. The Bernie factory is where the fresh, local milk is collected. I love getting to do on-site visits, meet the amazing Tassie people who are working so hard and learn about how the fabulous technology they're using results in product. After the milk is processed in Burnie, it's transported to Cadbury's factory in Claremont, just outside of Hobart. And I'm looking forward to doing the Cadbury's paddock to plate and sampling the finished product at the Claremont factory soon. Cadbury's has been operating in Tasmania for over 100 years. Today they employ 700 direct and indirect full-time workers, and the company contributes a huge amount to the Tasmanian economy. We've talked a lot about local manufacturing in the past few years. We don't make cars here anymore, but in the pandemic we realised we were completely reliant on China for critical health equipment, and we need to do more stuff here. Cadbury shows that making stuff in Australia is possible, that you can have success doing it. They've proven that local manufacturing can be competitive globally. Investing in making things here is investing in Australian jobs. Doesn't that just make sense? It did to Cadbury's, and you can see the benefits to Tasmania. So next time you're enjoying a little piece of chocolate, thinking about the amazing Tassie dairy farmers and hundreds of Tassie workers who made it possible. What an amazing story, and I can't wait to see what they do in the next 100 years. Thank you, Senator. Senator Canavan. Uh, many Australians have had what should otherwise have been a blissful summer ruined by the scourge of violent crime. On Boxing Day, Emma Lavelle, a mum of two, was fatally stabbed by violent criminals at her home just north of Brisbane. I have had a stream of incidents reported to me through my office over the summer. Australians deserve to live safely in their homes, but their governments are failing to deliver that basic human right. The tragic stories are backed up by the statistics. There has been a staggering 63 per cent increase in juveniles breaking into people's homes and businesses in Queensland since mid-2019. What happened in mid-2019? Well, in August 2019, the Queensland government changed the Youth Justice Act. In the words of the government's explanatory note about these changes, they had the objective of removing legislative barriers to enable young people to be granted bail. The changes told judges that the principle should be detention as a last resort and that the bail decision-making framework incorporated an explicit presumption in favour of release. The Queensland Premier has cowardly blamed judges for the rise in violent crime when judges have just been clearly implementing her own laws to put violent criminals back onto our streets. The local police know the offenders, but their hands are tied by Queensland's lax lack, youth crime laws. The Queensland government has finally, after much, much pressure, woken up to the problem, and they say they are going to prioritise changes to the youth justice laws when the Queensland parliament meets next week. What they need to do is eat some humble pie and admit that their 2019 changes have been an absolute disaster. Uh, if there is credible evidence that a juvenile has committed a crime, they deserve a fair trial, but they should not have the presumption in favour of release. The Australian people deserve the presumption in favour of their safety, and it's high time the Queensland government put the interests of law-abiding citizens first. I want to particularly give credit to Julie West, who has established a petition uh, which has attracted almost 150,000 signatures asking for the Queensland government to act to protect Queenslanders and guarantee their safety. Thank you, Senator. Senator Green. Thank you very much. Um, as a senator for Queensland, particularly one from the far north, I am incredibly proud of the unique and special relationship our state shares with Papua New Guinea. 
Often in my travels to PNG or when meeting with visiting delegations, I'm reminded that my electorate office is actually closer to Port Moresby than it is to Brisbane. And so during January, I was very privileged to join the Prime Minister on his first official visit to Papua New Guinea. I joined a delegation including our Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Pat Conroy, and the High Commissioner of Papua New Guinea and key Australian officials. Over three days, we were honoured to tour their national parliament, see the length and breadth of their beautiful country, and of course travel to WIWAC to pay our respects to the former Prime Minister, the father of Papua New Guinea, Michael Samare, and meet with his family. It was a historic event not just for our government but for Papua New Guinea's parliamentary history. Our Prime Minister was the first foreign leader to ever make an address to the PNG parliament. I was proud to listen to um, the speech that he delivered as he affirmed our import the importance of our relationship and the strength of the connection that our two countries have. As a Queenslander especially, I know how much we have in common with our friends across the way. A border we share a climate we share, hopes and anxieties we share as well. And of course, we share our love for rugby league, the true religion, I think, of both Queenslanders and Papua New Guineans. As a representative of communities with deep links to PNG, it was an honour to represent our country and learn more about the closeness of our dearest relationship. So many of Australians have commented on the pride that they feel that our country is finally restoring its relationships and reputation on the world stage, and I thank our host, um, the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, um, thank uh, you, Senator for Green. His... Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I want to acknowledge someone very special in the chamber with us today, Mr. Beruz Buchani. Beruz is an author who lives in New Zealand, but his journey here from Iran has been long and it's been dangerous. He's here in Australia to promote his new book, Freedom Only Freedom. And earlier today, he made a really important address to the Australian people from right here in Parliament House, the home of Australia's democracy. And many people, including opposition leader Peter Dutton, said that Beruz would never set foot in Australia. But here he is, not only in Australia, but in our Parliament House and today in this Senate chamber. So let's be clear about this. Peter Dutton lost and Beruz Bachani won. And that is a triumph. It is a triumph over 10 years where Beruz and many others have faced dehumanisation, have faced being brutalised. They've witnessed rapes, murders, armed assault, child sex abuse. They've seen people die, many people multiple people die under a bipartisan policy of cruelty. It is an absolute triumph that Beruz Bachani is here in this chamber today. But while Beruz is free, there are others who are not, and there are still people on Nauru and in Papua New Guinea after 10 long years in exile who are still suffering, and it is time to end their suffering. They must immediately be offered transfer to Australia so they can be looked after here. Ultimately, that is the responsibility of this parliament, and that is what the Greens are calling on all senators from Thank all parties you, Senator to McKim. support. Senator Pocock, David. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to pay tribute to a great scientist, a great communicator, and a great Canberran the late Emeritus Professor Will Steffen. William Lee Steffen was a gifted scientist and a powerful communicator. He was kind and generous and loved by many in the science community and at the ANU. Will Steffen was an intellectual giant, a leader in climate change and earth, sci earth system science. He dedicated his career to advancing the science on climate change and, importantly, sharing those findings with Australians and the global community. He was a world-renowned scientist and, I believe, one of the most influential thinkers of our time. He was a contributing author and a reviewer on five IPCC assessments and special reports, as well as scores of other critical scientific publications. Professor Stephan 
help to advance our knowledge on the Anthropocene, planetary boundaries and tipping points. He was a powerful leader and a cherished mentor to so many within and outside the scientific community. Known for his clear, crisp communication style, his voice has been heard in classrooms, within this very building, in courts, at the United Nations and in our homes, through the TV, the radio and on countless podcasts. Professor Stefan has left an incredible legacy, a wealth of advice that our parliament would do well to heed. I'm pleased to echo his advice into this chamber in his honour. The climate has tipping points beyond which lies an irreversible path to a new state. Our next actions will shape the future of the earth and its inhabitants for centuries, potentially millennia. Vale, Professor Will Stephan. Thank you. Uh, Senator, Senator Reynolds, you have the call. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I raise to uh, discuss a piece of what I see as unfinished business as the Minister for the NDIS, and that is the introduction of the NIIS, uh, the National Injury Insurance Scheme. In 2011, the Productivity Commission recommended two uh, schemes, first the NDIS but also the NIIS, uh, which is for people who have acquired catastrophic injuries for example, in motor vehicle accidents, people who fall off ladders, etc., who are not, uh, who don't qualify for the NDIS. Now, as minister, I did write to the then treasurer, but unfortunately, the election uh, occurred. So, in September, I wrote to the new treasurer, to the ministers for health, and also NDIS. Um, I haven't yet had a response, but I hope that's because they are actioning uh, this. This scheme is not only the right thing to do. Uh, but it's also uh, economically sound, as it would take significant pressure off the NDIS, but also provide people who are currently not covered when they have catastrophic accidents. Uh, it would provide all of the acute care, the rehabilitation and also the disability supports that they need to live uh, the best life that they can with the accidents, uh, with the, after the accident that they have had. I'd also like to pay a uh, special tribute to Kerry Ann Kennelly, who has campaigned tirelessly after the experience she had uh, with her husband's accident. And again, well, you know, she noted that while they had the financial resources to look after him, uh, many others do not. So I commend the NIIS to this chamber, and I would ask in due course that members support the private members' bill that I'll be bringing forward to introduce this scheme. Hopefully it won't be necessary and that the new government will act on this with the other states and territories. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Thank you very much. I rise to express dismay at the abysmal state of health services available to Australians living in remote areas. I refer to an article in the Curumal newspaper this week which referred to the best for the bush report compiled by the Royal Flying Doctor Service. This report, which should be compulsory reading for all senators, revealed that Australian women living in very remote areas had life expectancies 19 years lower than women living in major cities. The report revealed Australian men in very remote areas had life expectancies almost 14 years lower than men living in major cities. According to this alarming report, Australians living in the bush are 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalised, 2.3 times more likely to die by suicide and 3.8 times more likely to die from diabetes. These are appalling statistics. They reflect not only a general lack of competence in successive Labor and coalition governments failing to address the rural health issues, but also an overemphasis on Indigenous health care at the expense of non-Indigenous Australians in the bush. The gaps in Indigenous health outcomes are very real, and it's usually all that we hear about. But this RFDS report makes it clear poor health in remote Australia is not just an Indigenous problem. Isn't it time we do away with racially exclusive health programs and address people's health based on need, not race? Race should not be a factor in any government policy ever. Either we are all Australians fairly and equally, or we are not. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to talk about truth telling. Australia has a dark past, and as a nation, we need to acknowledge our shared history and acknowledge the hurt and trauma that this history continues to cause. 
Only then can we move forward together. The impacts of colonisation, dispossession and forced removal are still felt by First Nations peoples, families and communities every single day. On January the 25th, the last day of freedom, I, along with many other prominent West Australians, called for the establishment of an independent truth-telling commission for Western Australia. The truth can be painful, which is why we shy away from it, we ignore it, we pretend it didn't happen, and that only maintains the oppressive structures that have led us here in the first place. Having an independent truth-telling commission will cut through the misinformation of intergenerational trauma experienced by First Nations people and highlight our enduring resilience and active resistance always. It will provide an opportunity for First Nations people to document and protect their stories, their truth, and uncover the untold and unrecognised parts of our history, something that will enrich the lives of all Australians. Truth-telling allows First Nations people to share our cultural heritage and the truth on their terms. It acknowledges sovereignty and self-determination and is an opportunity for healing and for justice. I'm encouraged by the comments this week by former WA Governor Kim Beasley, who said truth-telling on the frontier wars of, in, in the Australian War Memorial will give Aboriginal people the dignity of, resi of resistance. Truth-telling can and must take many forms. First Nations people face injustices that go unanswered and we need a mechanism to hold governments to account about their inactions on these injustices. Truth-telling and treaty-making are essential parts of a reconciled society and as the Senator for Western Australia, I'm calling on the WA government to establish a truth-telling commission and the federal government to take action on advancing the work of the Makarrata Commission. Thank you, Senator. Senator MacDonald. Show societies the length and breadth of this country are a vital part of their communities and the people that make up the largest volunteer network in the land. So, on behalf of the RNA, I'd like to express our great sadness at the passing of Mr Fred Andrews, our 2019 Ecker legend, and our th thoughts are with his family at this very sad time. Fred began his association with the show as a harness racing competitor in the early 70s, moving on to RNA trotting and swabbing steward roles, which he fulfilled until 2018, when he retired at the age of 92, a mainstay of the Ecker Horse Stables for nearly half a century. Fred was highly regarded, admired and greatly respected by all. His passion for horse racing and the show's horse competition was inspiring and his contribution to the show was remarkable. And in 2019, he was awarded the RNA's highest honour, the Ecker Legend Award. The Le Ecker Legend Award is bestowed on those who have made an extraordinary contribution to the show. The award was introduced in 2004, and just 15 people have been awarded this prestigious honour. It is the selfless dedication of people like Fred which has made the people show what it is today. And for 50 years, he gave so generously of his time to help make the ECA a wonderful event for our competitors and our patrons. We join with all the ECA family in mourning the loss of a remarkable, remarkable man whose ECA legacy we greatly revere and appreciate, because it is with the support and the volunteerism of volunteers and people like Mr Fred Andrews that makes us all the richer for it. Thank you. Senator Sheldon, you have the call. On this day in 2009 in Victoria, Australia's deadliest bushfire disaster began. 173 lives were lost in the Black Saturday bushfires. More than 2,000 homes destroyed, $1 billion in recovery costs. Now That was bad enough, but through the lens of time, we know natural hazards will keep climbing in frequency and intensity. In just a couple of weeks, we will mark a year since the beginning of one of, our most, one of our most catastrophic flooding disasters. The Eastern Australian floods were estimated by the Insurance Council of Australia to have cost $5.65 billion. They had a particular devastating impact on the New South Wales Northern Rivers region, where five people died in a rolling crisis beginning on February the 28th. You'd think a bipartisan approach would have been the best approach, as the months of flooding went on. And yet, when the former Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, looked at what needed to be done, he was having none of it. In the northern rivers and elsewhere, Mr Morrison simply decided some residents were more deserving than others 
and allocated relief funding accordingly. Favouritism. That is disgusting. Now it turns out his approach mirrored the way the New South Wales Coalition government approached its own black summer bushfires disaster of 2019-20. A New South Wales Auditor General's report found that former Deputy Premier John Bellalaro rorted a $541.8 million bushfire grant scheme that so that some Labor electorates would miss out, despite, despite being in dire need. There is a much better way to deal with disaster. The Albanese government will treat and tread the better path, not just ones who vote for us, but for all Australians Thank you, Senator on behalf. Sheldon. The time for two-minute statements has expired. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, um, President. Uh, for the information of senators, I table a revised ministry list, as tabled yesterday by the Prime Minister in the House of Representatives. It reflects a small alteration to ministerial representation in the House and some typographical changes, and I seek leave to have the revised list incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Wong. I will now move to question time. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Alice Springs, Tennant Creek and other remote towns across the Northern Territory have endured the failures of this government's policy agenda, with child sexual abuse, assaults and property damage a daily occurrence in many remote communities. In response to growing community concern and considerable pressure from the general public, the Prime Minister finally recently visited Alice Springs with less than four hours on the ground. Can the minister advise why the Prime Minister thought it was acceptable to be a FIFO PM in Alice? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and I'm uh, disappointed that Senator McKenzie, on an issue such as what we are seeing in Alice Springs, would be would choose to make such a light-hearted quip in that way. Um, we, we, we all know. We all know. Uh, senators, please continue, Senator Wong. Uh, the Prime Minister, just on the visit first, before I go to the more substantive issue, which is uh, the uh, dis intergenerational disadvantage, the, the violence, uh, the, um, uh, the, what we are seeing on the ground uh, in Alice Springs. I, I, I am advised that the Prime Minister had planned to visit Alice Springs in December, but no, the, he, he, he contracted COVID. He contracted COVID. Uh, and so that was delayed. Now, obviously, the next opportunity he was able to visit was the 24th of January. Uh, Minister Burney has visited Alice Springs on a number of occasions, and of course, we are quite blessed in the Labor Party to have Senator McCarthy, uh, the uh, member for Lingiari, and many others who uh, engage very closely uh, on these issues. Now, it is the case. Uh, it is the case that. Uh, yesterday, um, the Prime Minister, uh, as you know, announced uh, uh, additional support uh, for uh, the Northern Territory. Uh, and uh, it is the case uh, that it is the case that the Stronger Futures program, which ended under you, which ended under you, with no plan, with no plan. So, it, so, so, so it is interesting in this place that you wish to come in here and play partisan politics on an issue where you drop the ball, where, where you drop the ball at the end uh, of the you, Stronger Senator Futures Wong. Your time has expired. Order. I'm going to call uh, Senator McKenzie for her order. Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. Before the election, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, "If I'm the Prime Minister." I won't go missing when the going gets tough, or pose for photos and then disappear when the job's done. Can the minister advise the Senate why the Prime Minister spent three nights at the Australian Open posing for photos and not a single night in Alice Springs? Uh, thank you, Senator McKenzie. Uh, Senator Wong. Uh, uh, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, that uh, Senator McKenzie chooses to remind everyone of what Mr. Morrison was like. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I would what I would say what I would say is this: 
Uh, first on the tennis, I mean, uh, you know, I, I hope that this is. I hope that you are very careful about who on your side has gone to major sporting events, uh, because because I can say to you, I can say to you, I, I, I remember a lot of Liberal Party ministers with a lot of good hats at the Melbourne Cup and other things. So Senator Wong, please resume your seat, Senator Mackenzie. Point of order on relevance, Madam uh, President. Just a moment, Senator Mackenzie. Order on my right, Senator Mackenzie. Point of order on relevance, Madam President. The minister was asked about time in Alice Springs, talking to local communities and addressing the crisis that's unfolding there. Uh, Not thank you. And I would ask for silence. Order. I would ask for silence. I had difficulty hearing Senator Wong because of all of the interjections. Senator Wong. Well, um, I, I, I were, were, were that you did ask me that question, because that, I would have treated that question with some respect. But no, you want to make a partisan point. Yep. You want to make a partisan point about the tennis. As you want to make a partisan point about the tennis. Let me say this: Stronger Futures ended in July 2022. There was no plan, uh, part of the previous government, to manage the transition. We have listened to community. We have listened to community and we have provided additional uh, resources. You, Senator Wong, to your time has expired. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Senator McKenzie, second supplementary. Community leaders have warned the serious crime wave affecting the Northern Territory communities has the potential to spread to other remote communities across Western Australia, Queensland and South Australia, with the government's abolition of the cashless debit card. When will the Prime Minister visit those other communities where the CDC has been abolished? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Wong. Well, well I'm asked now about the CDC. Um, uh, I would make a, make a few points. Um, uh, first, in relation to uh, what we are seeing in the Northern Territory, uh, it is distressing. It is uh, deeply worrying and it is devastating for communities and that's why we're acting that is why we're acting and that is why recognizing recognizing Order on my that left. senator cash and senator rustin He's a very good minister. Uh, that is why uh, the prime minister after consultation with the northern territory government uh, and after consultation uh, with the um, uh, ms anderson Daryl and anderson uh, has, provide, has made a decision, with the, su the support of the Cabinet, to provide $250 million worth of additional funding for support. Uh, it is a reminder of uh, how much uh, all governments uh, need to do to address the intergenerational disadvantage you, which we Wong. are seeing. The time for this question has expired. Senator Pratt. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. In recent days, the world has been confronted with devastating scenes following earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. Can the minister update the Senate on the situation on the ground, please? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Senator Pratt for her question. And certainly, particularly overnight, what we have seen uh, in Turkey and Syria uh, has been devastating. Uh, and I know this is an issue that many colleagues in the chambers, uh, chamber are uh, concerned about and, and share Senator Pratt's interest uh, and concern about these issues. So I want to acknowledge that so many from the parliament uh, include, and across the community have reached out to my office uh, to express concern and to ask what they can do and what our country can do. Uh, the true extent of this devastation is still emerging. Uh, what we do know is that, that, is that at 4.13 a.m. local time on Monday, a magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck at Nurdar, Turkey, in the far east of the country near the border with Syria. Uh, then, at 1.24 p.m. that afternoon, a second of magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake struck Elbistan, which is 80 kilometres to the south. The affected provinces have been devastated by a series of 100 aftershocks. The devastation of, this earth, of the earthquake spanned both Turkey and Syria, and we know that these are extraordinarily vulnerable parts of the world, parts of the world which are already <coughs> devastated by conflict and by disruption. 
I'm not in a position to advise the Senate of verified numbers. What I can say is that media reports just before I came into question time uh, put the number of those who have perished in these earthquakes of at least 3,800. This will almost certainly rise. Rescuers are still searching through collapsed buildings. Access to the affected areas is being hampered by damage to roads and collapsed buildings, severe weather and traffic from those trying to flee. The impact in Syria is still emerging, and the affected areas are in non-government held territories, which means information very difficult to verify. The government is monitoring the situation closely, and I'll, in subsequent answers I will respond to uh, what the government is seeking to do. Thank you, do. Senator Wong. Senator Pratt, first supplementary. What do we know, please, about Australians in affected areas? Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Wong. Uh, Thank you. I know some MPs and senators have had Australians uh, contact them about family in affected areas. Uh, our diplomatic missions in Ankara, Beirut and Istanbul are working closely with local authorities to ascertain the welfare of our citizens. Ankara Post is following up on a small number of Australian citizens who may be in the affected areas, and I'm not in a position at this stage to provide any further details. Uh, Australians in need of emergency consular assistance uh, should contact our 24-hour consular emergency centre. Uh, that is uh, 612 6261 uh, and on 1300 555 the latter number if calling from within Australia. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator, uh, sorry, Senator Wong. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Thank you. What is the Australian government doing to support all those affected? Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Albanese announced uh, in the press conference held just over an hour and a half ago an initial commitment of $10 million in humanitarian aid to support the people of Turkey and Syria. $7 million will be dispersed immediately. $4 million of that will be delivered to support those affected in Turkey through the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Appeal. These funds will support the delivery of food, shelter and basic aid items. We have also allocated $3 million to North West Syria to be delivered through UNICEF to assist with immediate needs with a particular focus on women and girls. Uh, an additional $3 million will be allocated as we work to understand needs on the ground. Uh, this is obviously a, a crisis. Uh, it is a crisis uh, which is affecting so many of our fellow human beings uh, we will continue to monitor the unfolding situation on the ground. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Please leave, grant, leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. President, I thank the Senate. Uh, Senator, can I associate uh, the opposition and the coalition parties with the remarks made by Senator Wong and the government in sending our most sincere condolences to the people of Turkey and Syria following yesterday's major earthquake and the events that have unfolded since? When we go to bed at night and tuck our children into bed, none of us imagine that the homes we are living in will collapse upon us in the midst of the night. As Turkey's ambassador to Australia said to me when I spoke with him earlier today, he record, recounted stories that he is seeing of those in the zone saying they now feel ashamed to go to sleep. The difficulties that are facing the human toll, not just the immediate loss of life, the many thousands to whom we send uh, our love, prayers and best wishes, uh, who have lost loved ones, the thousands more injured, but of course the ongoing humanitarian crisis that follows from a tragedy and disaster like this. It is of course in these events we see the best of humanity, rescuers working heroically, international community responding comprehensively, disaster and aid workers coming to provide assistance, and even Ukraine fighting for its freedom, offering to provide support. We acknowledge and thank the government for the support that they have announced and provided. Uh, we stand with the government in supporting that and in supporting the Australian Turkish and Australian Syrian communities in this time of concern for all of them. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. As reported by the West Australian newspaper today, in the WA Goldfields town of Laverton, formerly a place where the cashless debit card was in operation, last week the Desert Inn Hotel, after discussions with the local police, voluntarily imposed liquor restrictions to combat alcohol-fuelled violence. What role has the withdrawal of the cashless debit card played in increasing crime, domestic violence and dysfunction in Laverton? 
Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President, and I thank uh, Senator uh, Cash uh, for uh, for her question. Um, um, <clears throat> the cashless uh, debit card was obviously a controversial uh, issue um, going into the uh, to the last election, and as a as a government. Um, well, sorry, as an opposition, uh, we took to the Australian people the proposition that uh, <coughs> we should uh, remove the cashless uh, debit card. <coughs> and of course, one of the first things that the new Minister for Social uh, Services, uh, Minister uh, <coughs> Rishworth, did uh, was to introduce legislation uh, into this place. Uh, um, Senator Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. You are president, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious the point of order is relevant. Could you at least direct your comments to the alcohol fueled violence in Laverton? Uh, thank, thank you, President. You, Senator Cash. Um, the minister is being relevant. You have asked about the CDC. He's entitled to um, put the government's uh, reasons for its abolition. Minister, please continue. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Um, so, so we we took the proposition to the Australian people, and that included um, <coughs> Senator Cash, people in Western Australia, and and well, 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 the people in Western Australia uh, voted overwhelmingly for an Anth an Anthony Albanese. Labor government. In fact, in fact, you know, Senator Cash, you know as well as I do the number of seats that your government lost in, in Western Australia. Your, your, so all, all I'm Order. saying is, all Order. I'm saying, all, Order. Senator Rustin. Um, Minister, please continue. Look, look, we we took our policy. To the last, we took our policy to the last election, and you, you would be, you would be, you would be, you would be appalled, you would be appalled if we didn't do what we said we were going to do. Uh, thank you, Minister. Your time has expired, Senator Cash. Thank you, President. The Shire of Laverton President Patrick Hill was today reported as saying, "The kids are not getting fed. The women get bashed up." and it's going back to the way it was. Minister, what are you going to do to protect the women and children in Laverton and other towns around Australia where you've withdrawn the cashless debit card? Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Um, regrettably, Senator Cash, the issues that you raise uh, as uh, significant issues in Laverton are not unique uh, to that town. Um, and the whole, the whole, Order. the whole, the whole issues. Let's Order. let's take let's take one of the issues that you're you're talking about. Let's take one of the issues that you're talking about. Um, Senator Cash, when I'm deliberately answering or doing my best to answer your questions, um, well, that may be so. That may be so. But the people of Australia. Have made a decision, and one of the reasons, one of the reasons, one of the reasons they voted for us at the last election were our policies on domestic violence. One of our, one of the reasons they voted for us, was our policies on domestic violence. Now, I, I don't say that we, I don't say that overnight, that we are going to solve all Thank of the problems. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Uh, just a moment, Senator Cash. I'll wait until there's silence on your. Side. Senator Rustin, I've just called for silence. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Minister, will you commit to restoring the cashless debit card as a matter of urgency in Laverton and in other communities being ravaged by alcohol fuelled crime, violence and dysfunction because your government abolished it last year? And will you apologise to the people of Laverton? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Farrell. Um, look, I, I can only reiterate, reiterate the comments that uh, Senator Wong made a few moments ago that politicising these sorts of issues 
in this way, in this, in this Senate, politicising these issues in this way gives does does you no credit? Does you no credit, Senator <coughs> Senator Order. Cash? It does Order. you no credit. It does you no credit to take advantage of the of the the, uh, the issues that are going on in this town and other towns and other towns um, to try and make some get some sort of political advantage uh, out Senator of Farrell, the. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. I'm going to ask for silence to allow the minister to finish the question. Please continue, Minister Farrell. Thank you, um, um, I reiterate my point. Um, it, it's, it, uh, it doesn't do you any good, Senator Cash, to be seeking to, be seeking to use the disadvantage of— Thank you, Minister. Of the time for this question has expired. Senator Waters. Very much, President. My question is to uh, Senator Wong, representing the Prime Minister. Last week's annual donations data release revealed around $2 million in donations from fossil fuel companies and lobbyists to both big parties, including 960,000 of that to the Labor Party. And in that financial year, four big donors are some of the highest polluting facilities covered by the proposed safeguard mechanism. Woodside, Blue Scope, Chevron and Inpex. Collectively, they've donated over 200,000 to the Labor Party in 2021-22. How much access to the table did that buy when Labor was designing your weak safeguard mechanism legislation? And are those dirty donations why your safeguard mechanism backs new coal and gas? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, I, I, I really reject the implication or the imputation of, of some form of corruption which is in that question. And I'm reminded when I was a minister many years ago, uh, with much less grey hair, uh, and Senator Payne, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, what was the name? Christine, Senator Milne, Senator Milne, <laughs> uh, was um, <laughs> Senator, Payne, Senator Payne did vote with Senator Milne. In fact, they voted together to, 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 to get, get the. Uh, Cashless debit card. Oh, sorry, cashless debit. I'm very tired. The CPRS um, um, uh, voted against that, and she would ask question after question to me about fossil fuel companies. And I remember saying to her at one point, "You know, it may be, it is possible that we take a different position, not because we are corrupt, as is the implication, but because we just don't agree. We don't agree with a policy proposition." Uh, and that is the case. Now, uh, I, I accept that there will be a contest over the, the safeguard mechanism. I have uh, uh, faith that uh, Mr Bowen uh, will ensure that what is presented to this parliament will, be, will have a cogent policy basis. You may not agree with it, and that is your right. Uh, but he will do so, as the Cabinet will do so, on the basis of our judgment about what is the best economic policy uh, for the nation. Uh, so I do reject. Well, I, no, I'd say, uh, it, it's very easy, isn't it? And it's a campaigning tool. But I do reject this proposition that somehow uh, Labor go a Labor government, which uh, has taken a very ambitious position on climate, uh, which has, let's be frank, paid a political price for many years as a consequence of holding the position on climate, uh, would simply uh, uh, do what you're suggesting. That is not the case. Thank we you, Senator Wong. Guided. The time for this question has expired. Country. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. I note that the fossil fuel sector re receives over $11 billion in public subsidies every year. I also note that the Mineral Resources Council donated $103,800 in donations to the Labor Party, and they recently promised to unleash an ad campaign against Labor unless it ruled out a windfall profits tax. We haven't seen a windfall profits tax, which could fund cost of living relief measures to actually help people. Has that donation brought your compliance on that issue? Thank you, Senator Waters. The time's expired, Minister. The answer is no. And I mean, you are you are talking to a party that has been honest with the Australian people for over a decade, that lost government. Let's be clear about our position on climate, about our position on climate. That is honest with people and has 
you know, in the previous term of government, obviously paid a political price for holding a very clear and consistent position on climate. We have. And we went to the Australian people with a clear position about what we would do, and we will deliver it. And we will deliver it. We had a clear position on taxation. We had a clear position on climate policy. We had a clear position about utilising the safeguards mechanism. And we were upfront with the Australian people about why we wanted to do it and what we would do. What we would do. So the implication that you want to make for political purposes in here that somehow that is all that is all because that that is all um, you know untrue is wrong. It is wrong. Thank you, and Senator it does, Wong. It does not do you. This question has expired. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Around half the donations given to political parties is dark money. It's not required to be disclosed because of inbuilt loopholes. That means cash for access meetings or donations through business forums as membership are not required to be disclosed. When will you shine a light on the masses of undisclosed money washing through this system and fix the system so that big money isn't buying access and outcomes? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister. Ah, uh, well, I make this point. We continue to lead on political donation reform. I understand Jay Skim is also looking at this issue. I also understand, and I'm told, that uh, donations were taken by the Greens political party from a professional gambler and a pastoral company, but, and a pastoral company backed by one of South Africa's richest men. But you want to lecture us? You want to Order. lecture us about this Order. and make imputations that these, Order. that the Labor Party, which went to the Australian people with a very clear policy position, implementing that policy position, you now want to say, for political purposes, that's corrupt. Well, you know what? I actually think all of the Australians who voted for climate action, all of the Australians who voted for the ambitious position that we went to the election with, deserve a Greens political party that might actually back in, back in legislation that delivers on that ambitious, rather than taking pot shots from that corner yet again. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Stewart. Order. Order. Enjoy. I have a senator on her feet waiting to ask a question. Senator Stewart. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister please update the Senate on the work the Albanese government is doing to ease the cost of living pressures for all Australians? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, President. And can I welcome Senator Stewart back uh, and, and congratulate her on beautiful Ari, who we've had the pleasure of his company uh, since her, your return. Uh, but welcome back. Um, can I can I just say uh, the Albanese government understands that cost of living uh, pressures are a major concern for all Australians. We understand that it's not easy for households uh, right now. And when I look at how uh, other countries are faring, I think Australia is positioned well to ride out these economic uh, uncertainty and some of the shocks that we've seen. As a member of the government's economic team, we are working hard every day to make sure that Australian challenges with inflation do not become worse. We are cleaning up after the wasted decade of the previous government, a record of inaction or worse failure, including more than 20 failed energy policies. We saw a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities that left Australia with falling real wages, cost of living pressures, a trillion dollars of debt without an economic dividend to show for it. We have an economic plan that is a direct and deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy right now, including cost of living. And one of the very first acts of this government was to successfully argue for minimum wage to keep pace with inflation, an outcome which has helped around 2.7 million Australians see their incomes increase. Our first budget focused on responsible cost of living relief that didn't put extra pressure on inflation, which is an important thing to be working hand in hand with the RBA as they undertake their um, tightening cycle on interest rates. We've got cheaper childcare, expanding paid parental leave, cheaper medicine since the 1st of January. We're putting um, resources into affordable housing and getting wages moving again. These are the, the concrete steps that we Thank have put in place in just the first few months. Senator uh, Stewart, first supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on the practical measures that the government has been taking to support households? Thank you, Senator Stewart. Minister. Thank you, and I thank Senator Stewart for the supplementary. 
There are some things uh, in this economic environment that we are experiencing that are, are out of the government's control, such as the ongoing war in Europe and the ripple effects of the pandemic. But there are also things that are within our control, and the government is focused on those. So, as I said in the previous answer, making medicines cheaper, um, childcare cheaper, and of course relief to householders facing those rising energy costs, which the Senate dealt with, which the Senate dealt with in December last year. And let's not forget, because we won't ever forget, that you voted against it. The money that, that will flow to households to help with their energy bills, you the voted against it. It was how this Senate order. could have stood up and no. provided order. that support to households and the opposition First tried to block it. We no. are focused on growing the economy You're the so right way so that Australians what? can benefit from good skills, get good jobs and have good Thank wages. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired as Senator Stewart's second supplementary. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on initiatives that have already started to have a direct impact? on households and easing cost of living pressures. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Wages are beginning to move again, thanks yeah. to the government putting bargaining back in the hands of workers again, which those opposite oppose. You oppose the energy price relief. Right. You also oppose sensible changes to improve the bargaining framework so that workers could get pay Senator rises. Danny. It is no surprise after a decade of wage stagnation, a deliberate design feature of their economic right. architecture, let us never forget we that, 2 per cent, suck it, 2 per cent or worse, and we're already seeing wages starting to move, nudging just above 3 per cent. But we get that households are still doing it tough. We understand that. The government's job is to look at where we can provide sensible cost of living relief without adding to inflation. That is the defining challenge as we go to put Order. this budget together. The May budget will continue a focus on cost of living, including providing that household assistance for energy bills, working with Thank the you. states and Thank territories you, Minister, your that you oppose. Expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. I have a question to the Minister representing the Minister for the, the Environment, Minister Watt. Uh, Australia is a world leader in many things that we celebrate, but one international title we have is a source of global shame, and that is our status as a world leader in species extinction. Over the past 200 years, uh, our actions have sent one in ten of our native mammals extinct. By comparison, the U.S. similar uh, landmass has lost just one species. If we don't act now, current and future. Uh, generations of Australian children may never have an opportunity to see a numbat or a region honey eater or a northern quoll. In October last year, the government committed to ending, no, ending extinctions. Will the government commit to backing up this commitment with enough investment to ensure that this actually happens? Thank you, Senator Poker. I believe Senator Wong is the correct uh, repping minister, so I've yes, given sorry. her the call. Uh, thank you to Senator uh, Pocock, and he is correct that we are uh, a country, a nation that has one of the worst uh, extinction records in the world. Uh, we have one of the worst mammal extinction records in the world. Uh, we have uh, obviously uh, seen uh, land uh, and water degradation, uh, which has an effect uh, not just on humans but on uh, uh, um, our many animal and plant species. Uh, the, I know that the Minister for the Environment uh, has been very clear about the importance of working towards zero extinctions. Uh, this has been endorsed by every state and territory. Uh, as part of that, we are investing in excess of $200 million in the Saving Native Species Program. We have put in place a new Threatened Species Action Plan, which sets ambitious targets uh, seeking to protect 30 per cent of our land and seas by 2030. Uh, and of course, critically, uh, we are looking at reform of the uh, environmental legal framework. Uh, you'd be, Senator Pocock would be familiar with the Sam Samuels review into the EPBC Act. Uh, uh, obviously, Senator, uh, uh, Ms Plibersek is uh, taking forward a process to reform those to protect, restore and manage uh, native habitats. Um, the uh, ACF, Australian Conservation Foundation, has, has welcomed the government's new threatened species objective and have made the 
uh, the very important point that extinction is a choice and, and we need to choose uh, a better path. We need to change the trajectory for the range of threatened species and their habitats and, and certainly the government and particularly Ms Plibersek is focused on doing so. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, thank you, President. Um, I welcome the government's commitment. I uh, would point out that this will require significant investment. In fact, in 2019, 13 of Australia's most eminent environmental scientists looked at the question of how much it would take to do exactly that, to halt extinctions. And the figure then was about $1.7 billion per year. Does the government accept the overwhelming scientific evidence that we need significantly more investment in this area? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Uh, I, I would make a point, if I may, about uh, funding. Uh, and one of the things that I certainly learnt as finance minister, and I'm sure Senator Gallagher is managing, uh, is that there are very few requests for spending which are not worthy. There are some. Um, we saw some under the previous government. Well, maybe a few of the sports rights might have been a bit of a problem. But anyway, uh, but uh, you know, we we have completely legitimate requests for expenditure in environment, in climate, in energy, uh, in um, social security, in uh, a whole range of areas, including uh, First Nations policies, uh, health, Medicare, uh, PBS, uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme. All of these are matters. Uh, all of the. Well, I'm making a point about. Well, I'm surprised that the Shadow Minister of Finance wouldn't like me to actually talk about opportunity costs, given that is the heart of the job you have to do. The heart of Thank the you, job Minister, you're supposed to do. Your time has expired. Policy. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, thank, thank you, Minister. My, my question really is, is about funding, though. Uh, will the government match ambition with action? And with a shortfall of some $1.6 billion at the moment, does the government have a plan for which species uh, you're going to select to not go extinct and which we, we should just let go extinct? Minister. Look, uh, I, under I understood very well what you were asking, Senator Pocock, and I was making the point that there are many uh, areas of investment, uh, particularly after 10 long years, of those opposite uh, investing in so many of the wrong things and so few of the right things. Uh, and the process of considering not just this area, uh, but the, the many areas uh, uh, that uh, demand funding, um, as well as the structural deficit that the finance minister has spoken about, obviously will be something the government will consider in the course of the budget. Uh, and you know, you would well understand. I appreciate as uh, an independent senator, you know, your job is to to do among, represent your constituents and ensure that includes pushing the government to do more. Uh, but what I would say to you is we recognise this is a very important area. We are committed to uh, uh, getting this in, into a much better shape than it was, and Ms Plibersek has done an extraordinary job in, month, in last Thank month's Thank you, Minister. To do Your so. time has expired. There was much Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. In April last year, the now Treasurer said this is a full-blown cost-of-living crisis a triple whammy of skyrocketing costs of living, falling wages and rising interest rates. Since the election, the cost of living has truly skyrocketed. Inflation is at its highest point in 30 years, real wages can't keep up, and interest rates are at their highest point in a decade. Minister, does the Treasurer acknowledge that under this Labor government there is truly a full-blown cost of living crisis? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank uh, Senator Hume for the question. And I think the government has been very clear that cost of living pressures are, and addressing them in a responsible and reasonable way is a priority for this government. In fact, from day one, when we first dealt when, when Minister Bowen started to deal with the fact that we were going to have blackouts, um, from day one, we've been dealing with the decade of delay, dysfunction and refusal to tackle the challenges that are now impacting households right across the country. Uh, so we accept that cost of living is a number one issue for probably every household in this country. As a government, 
we have to look at the ways that we can ease that cost of living pressure in a way that doesn't add to inflation. And I think the major difference, there are a couple of differences. The largest quarter of inflation was in the March quarter last year, which was actually under you when you were in government. That was the largest quarter in terms of inflation growth. The other difference is that you have a government that's actually dealing with the issues rather than putting their head in the sand and pretending that everything was just fine. That is a major difference. So in energy, in health, in childcare, in energy prices, in cost of medicines, all of these areas that we're dealing with. And that's whilst we've got a budget that's heaving with a trillion dollars of debt, while we're going through all of the terminating measures, the things that weren't funded properly. Remember all that? The zombie measures that were never going to get through the Senate that you had there bolstering your bottom line. While we're fixing all of that, we're investing in those areas where we can make a difference to households without adding to inflation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Cost of Living Committee last week heard that Woolworths charity partners have already told them that they will need increased food donations in 2024 and that there has been a 12 per cent increase in the number of Australians struggling to pay their power bills. Minister, why hasn't the government delivered the $275 price cut or other cost of living relief that it promised last year to help Australians with their energy bills? Good question. Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister. Well, that question is just wrong. Um, we are. We are doing what we said we would do in terms of implementing our cost of living measures, uh, cost of living measures that we took to the election: cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines. We have been dealing with the energy crisis that you opposed. Oh, uh, Minister, please. The goal of you are. Uh, Senator Hume, point of Thank order. You. On, on the issue of relevance, I specifically asked about energy bills. Yes, and you started off with a, uh, a couple of sentences around charity. Um, and increases. So the minister, I think, order. Senator O'Neill, a point of order is being called. I'm responding to it, and all I can hear is you. I ask all senators to be respectful and to listen and to be quiet. Uh, so I believe the minister is being relevant, but I'll continue to listen and I will direct her to the body of the question if she doesn't go there. Minister. On energy, I mean, the gall, frankly, of being asked that question when you opposed, you opposed the cost of living relief in the bill that this Senate passed in December last year, over a billion dollars to actually go to help with the cost of energy increases that occurred under your watch. That, that Minister Taylor, when he was minister, hid before the election. That's the increases people are feeling now actually occurred under your government. We are dealing with it, and you opposed, you opposed the, the, the money going in to get to households this year to help them to lower their, their energy bills by hundreds of dollars. Uh, thank you you sat there and said your no. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Sorry. I'm way ahead of myself. Senator Hume, my apologies. Second supplementary. Madam President, last week the Senate's Cost of Living Committee also heard that 800,000 Australian households are going to be coming off their fixed rate mortgages and onto variable rate mortgages throughout 2023. We heard that the cash rate rises this cycle have increased the typical Australian variable mortgage holders' repayments by around $10,000 per year. Minister. With the RBA increasing the cash rate again today, how much more will the average Australians with, vari with a variable mortgage be worse off uh, under this the Labor end government? Of, uh, time, thanks, uh, Senator Minister. Uh, thank you. Dealing with the inflation challenge is the defining economic challenge uh, facing the country. I have. Uh, we've been very clear about that. The RBA has increased. Uh, the cash rate by a further 25 basis points uh, today. They are, of course, independent and make those decisions based on the e economic data that they are seeing. And we have been saying for some time that we understand that these increases, particularly for those households where they are, have mortgages and often large mortgages, 
are significantly impacting their household budgets. There is no doubt about that. Depending on what you're, to specifically answer your question, it depends on uh, what your mortgage is and, and the terms with which. Uh, Minister, please resume your seat. As Senator Hume. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. If the minister doesn't know the answer to this question, I would be very happy order? if she took it on notice. Uh, Senator Sorry, Hume, the point of order the was relevance. Order? She clearly okay. didn't, know, no, didn't know the answer. If she doesn't Thank know, I'm you. quite happy to have it taken on uh, notice because it was a very Hume, specific please question. Please resume your seat. The minister is being directly relevant. Minister. Well, it is, and it's a very, it's very patronising of you, Senator Hume. Um, I have the an I have the answers. I have the Order. answers. It depends on how much you owe and the rates for which your mortgage is. But it is hundreds of uh, dollars, you, that we, and we your understand time has that. Expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mac uh, Madam President. My question is the Senator representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. And before I start, I actually want to thank um, I want to thank the former senator in here, Senator Griff, for the work that he done. Um, on cancer over the time he was here. In Australia, brain cancer is one of the most common and deadliest cancers in children. Approximately 120 children are diagnosed each year with brain cancer, and for 45 per cent of those children, their diagnosis is fatal. My question for the government is this. What new initiatives has the government introduced to address paediatric brain cancers? Is there anything it has introduced that is new, or are you still funding the previous programs that were introduced by the previous government? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President, and I thank Senator Lambie uh, for her advice that she would be asking a question on, on childhood cancer. Uh, and I acknowledge that the Senate also has a meeting with the Minister for Health next week to discuss a range of health issues. It is. Um, and many of us went to the um, ovarian cancer uh, breakfast this morning across the chamber. Um, cancer is something I think that has touched probably everybody's lives in this place. Um, and in terms of childhood cancer, um, a really, you know, it is uh, some of the statistics around childhood cancer and children who are diagnosed with brain cancer are very confronting. Um, as Senator Lambie said, an estimated 102 children aged up to 14 uh, were diagnosed with brain cancer and 36 children are estimated to die from this disease. Cancers in children are often different from those observed in adults in appearance, site of origin and response to treatment, and they are also often quite difficult to diagnose, which does require um, that specialisation in paediatric cancer responses. So to just run through a couple of things that are underway, um, there is uh, t over the last 10 years, 260 million for childhood cancer research through the National Health and Medical Research Council, the Medical Research Future Fund and Cancer Australia, and we've also committed 452 million to build new comprehensive cancer centres in Queensland and South Australia. We're also implementing $100 million to establish the nation's first Children's Camp Comprehensive Cancer Centre in Sydney. This initiative is being led by the Children's Cancer Institute with delivery partners, and it will play an important role in Australia's health system and the network of comprehensive cancer centres going forward, combining research, cutting-edge treatment options, clinical trials, other multidisciplinary you, resources the time for, for the children. This question has expired. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. How does federal funding for paediatric paediatric brain cancers compare with that under the previous government, and are you content to continue funding arrangements that were, that were introduced by the previous government? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I would probably take the detail of that on notice. I need to say that um, that um, $100 million to establish the nation's first comprehensive ca children's cancer centre in Sydney is new, I understand, but I will, uh, will check the record on that. Uh, in terms of health and how we fund, many of those services obviously are funded through the hospital agreement. Um, that is coming up for renegotiation with the states and territories. There is no doubt there's a lot of need, uh, not just in childhood cancer, but for hospital services in general. Um, and we will engage um, 
with the states and territories on that. We understand you know, the health system is critically important. Funding the hospitals, getting that right, is critically important, as is trying to fix um, primary care, Medicare and aged care, because it is all interconnected. Uh, but probably the detail I will come back to the senator with if there's anything I have to update. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, statistically, brain cancer kills more children than any other disease. I'm just wondering, um, should this not be a higher priority than any other childhood health initiative this government is funding at this point in time? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Um, you know, of course, um, making sure that we're doing all the research we can and provide all the treatment options possible for children suffering from cancer, including brain cancer, um, you know, is I think it's something that every parent in this country would expect. Uh, it is funded through the hospital agreement primarily. I think the research is critically important because, again, the nature of childhood cancer means you do need um, subspecialisation in it, and so that research, which feeds uh, treatment options, is part of that. Working internationally with other um, countries on their research and clinical trials and, and also those comprehensive cancer centres. We established one here in Canberra, not for paediatrics but for people with cancer, and it does make a world of difference when you pull in all those services into one centre rather than making people go around and deal with different treatments. So I think there is a lot underway. Um, if there's anything more I can update uh, the chamber, I will, will do so on notice. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Uh, could the Minister please provide an update to the Senate on the actions Australia has taken to increase pressure on the Iranian regime? Minister. Thank you, uh, to President. And can I thank Senator Ciccone uh, not only for the question, uh, but for his consistent championing of human rights issues at home and abroad, and for his um, uh, his leadership as chair of the uh, Senate Committee for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to work with him. And I know I speak for all senators, regardless of our political differences, just when, when I say we stand in solidarity with the people of Iran, uh, who have demonstrated immense bravery in the face of a brutal regime. Uh, the arrest and death of Masa Amini, whose Kurdish name was Gina, has despite months of protests and demonstrations across Iran, and I've spoken on a number of occasions previously in this chamber about this. These brave protests have been met by brutal repression. Hundreds are now dead at the hands of the Iranian regime and thousands more jailed. From the beginning of this new crackdown, Australia has worked strategically to build pressure internationally on Iran. <clears throat> this government has taken stronger action against Iran on human rights than any previous Australian government. We were at the forefront of, effort, of, efforts, forefront of efforts to remove Iran from the Commission for the Status of Women. We co-sponsored and advocated for the successful Human Rights Council resolution establishing the independent investigation into human rights violations in Iran. Last year, we imposed Magnitsky-style human rights sanctions on six individuals and two entities, including Iran's morality police, over their involvement in the Iranian regime's abhorrent, flagrant and continued human rights violation. Uh, and just last week, I announced additional Magnitsky-style sanctions against 16 Iranian ind individuals and one Iranian entity. And in addition, we have joined partners to impose targeted sanctions on multiple Iranian individuals and entities involved in supplying and producing drones to Russia that have been used in the illegal Thank and immoral you, invasion of Ukraine. This question has expired. Senator Ciccone, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. Uh, can the minister please explain what actions the government has taken to put pressure on the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, commonly known as the IRGC? And I thank you for your earlier answer to my question. Minister. Uh, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is a malignant actor and it's long been a threat to international security and to its own people. Uh, the Gillard government understood this and put in place broad-based sanctions on the IRGC uh, at last decade. The Albanese government has also recognised the threat they represent. That is why we are using the tools available to take action, including sanctioning of 12 IRGC-linked officials and seven IRGC-linked entities. 
I, have, I do understand those who are calling for the IRGC to be listed under the Criminal Code, and I understand they want the IRGC to face consequences for its actions. I would make this point that the purpose of listings under the Code is to make it easier to prosecute individuals in Australia for supporting terrorist organisations. Listing under the Criminal Code apply to non-state actors and not state actors, <coughs> and the IRGC is regrettably a fully formed part of the Iranian state. Uh, I would note Thank that you, none Minister. of our the time for answering this question has expired. Minister Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you, uh, President. And again, I thank the minister for that response to my early question. Um, uh, minister, how is the Australian government acting to prevent foreign interference here, right at home? Minister. Thank you. I appreciate Senator Ciccone asking me this question because it gives me the opportunity to yet again speak to the Iranian Australian community. The government is deeply concerned by reports of families and protesters being harassed and intimidated. It, we have put our views about foreign interference directly to the Iranian regime in no uncertain terms. The Department of Home Affairs Counter Foreign Interference Coordination Centre is working with the community to conduct targeted engagement uh, of foreign interference. I say this, Australians, Australia's foreign interference laws are unequivocal. Allegations of foreign interference are investigated and, if substantiated, will be prosecuted. I say to the Iranian community here in Australia, you have a right to protest. You have a right to fully participate in our democracy. We stand with you and we will defend our democracy and people's right to protest and express their views within Australia, just as we stand up for the rights of those who do so around the world. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, hey. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Watt. Workforce shortages are currently putting serious pressure on Australia's healthcare system, particularly in rural, regional and remote Australia. Considering this critical issue, why did your government not put 887 regional visas on the priority list, instead putting international workers who want to live and work in regional Australia to the bottom of the visa pile? Minister. Thank you, Senator Rustin, and thank you, Senator McKenzie, for recognising that I am such a friend of the regions. Uh, I'm glad you recognise this. Oh, uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Um, Senator Watt has misrepresented me uh, to Senator the Senate. Senator McKenzie, what is your point? There's no point of order. Thank you. Senator Minister, order on my right. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. And Sometimes Senator McKenzie uh, says Senator things Watt, before she Watt, thinks them through, and that Senator was. Senator Watt, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Watt, Senator Rustin's asked a serious question to which she's entitled to respond. So please direct your answers to her question. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, and Senator Rustin does ask a serious question because we know, and anyone in this chamber who spends any time in regional Australia, whether it be me, whether it be Senator Rustin, whether it be Senator McKenzie or many others, knows that for many years uh, there has been a serious problem uh, for regional Australians accessing health care. Uh, I've experienced it myself. Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, Madam. Um, thank you, President. It's on a matter of relevance. I was actually asking the minister about 887 visas and why your government has not prioritised 887 visas, which directly impact rural and regional thank Australia. You, I'd ask you to draw his attention uh, to you, my Senator question. Thank you, Senator You also talked about the crisis of health in regional and rural areas, and I believe the minister is being relevant. And if he's not, I will direct him to the question. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And as I was saying, there has been a serious shortage of uh, health care in rural and regional Australia for at least 10 years. Uh, and one of the reasons for that has been severe workforce shortages, workforce shortages that this government is working on and acting on. Now, in the short time that we've been in office, the Albanese government has increased regional visas from 11,200 to 34,000 this financial year. Uh, those who attended the Jobs and Skills Summit, which of course doesn't include any member of the Liberal Party, uh, but did include the leader of the National Party, Little, Mr Littleproud, would have seen uh, that this government committed to increase the regional migration intake uh, to 34,000 
uh, just for this financial year. And it is our full intention to deliver these visas, which will go some way to assisting with the regional workforce shortages that Senator Rustin asks about, but indeed the, the regional workforce shortages that we see across every industry in regional Australia, yet another legacy of the poor planning and mismanagement of the former government. Uh, if there's one example in this space that really exemplifies those failures, let's not forget that the former government left a visa backlog of one million visas. One million people waiting for visas to be processed. We've got it down to 600,000 and we're going to go further. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, in my electorate, a local GP living and working in the community is currently waiting for his 887 regional visa to be processed, but like other applicants of this visa, he's been knocked down to the bottom of the pile by your government. The constituent is providing essential primary care and his wife is a nurse and is equally providing critical care in our community. Why has your government neglected my regional community and others across Australia in their need to have doctors and nurses in their local area? Order. 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 I have the minister on his feet. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Rustin, the answer to your question is very simple, and it's a seven-digit number. One million. One million visas. That was the backlog that we inherited from your government in visa applications. One million people who had applied for visas to work in healthcare and a range of other industries. Oh, sorry, Senator Rustin. Order. Thank you, Thank you President. Um, the minister is obviously choosing is a, not to order, answer my question. Order. Order. Order on my right and left. Uh, Senator Rustin, I believe it's a point of order. It's a point of order on relevance. This is a very serious issue for regional communities. I'm talking yes. about 887 visas and why your government has chosen not to prioritise them. Choice. Thank you, um, Minister Rustin. I believe the minister has been answering your question. I'll continue to listen closely. Minister. Uh, thank you, Minister. And, and I do know Senator uh, Rustin's electorate. In fact, I had the pleasure of joining you uh, to meet with people who would experienced the floods in the Renmark region just before Christmas. Uh, and I'm not surprised that Renmark uh, and that wider region uh, is, um, is suffering Minister from extreme Watt, workforce shortages in the health Minister area. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you, President. Um, your gratuitous response is not um, very what, becoming. What, uh, but on relevance, it, I asked you specifically Rustin, about 887 Senator visas. Rustin, Do you know Senator what an 887 Rustin, visa is? Your seat. When I give you the call, don't be disrespectful. If you're calling a point of order, stand and make that clear. Not just launch into uh, an attack on a minister because you don't like the answer to his question. Minister, please continue. I'm, I'm very familiar with the, with the issue, and it was obviously in the various newspapers today. And the point I'm making is that, unlike the former government, this government is actually dealing with the situation of extreme visa uh, processing backlogs that we inherited. As I say, in the short time we've been in office, we have got the backlog of visa applications down to 600,000 from the one million that we inherited. And how did we do that? By actually putting more staff in the system to process those visas. Staff to support the visa system decreased by 20 per cent from 2015-16 until we came to government. And that's the answer to the question. Minister, uh, Senator Rustin, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, will you please um, advise this chamber whether your government will commit to adding 887 visas to the priority list for processing, as you currently have done for the same workforce in city areas? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Um, thank you, President. Well, I'm, I'm absolutely happy to commit to the, uh, the statement uh, that our government will always run our migration program in the national interest. And of course it's in the national interest um, to ensure Senator that regional White, rural people Senator can White, get health care. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Senator, uh, uh, thank you, uh, President. On a point of order in relevance, I was very tight in my question. I just asked the minister whether he would commit mm -hmm. to the adding of the 887 yep. visas to the priority list in the same thank way you. as they have in the city. Thank you, Senator that Rustin. I'll direct the minister to the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And again, this government will always run our migration program in the national interest, and part of that, obviously, is about ensuring that rural and regional Australians have access to the health care they deserve and the health care that they did not get for the 10 years of the Liberal National Party government. It's the Albanese government that is in the process of rebuilding our Order. health system, whether it be in the cities or our regions. I, I have been out there in Order. regional Australia door-knocking people who couldn't get 
uh, G GP appointments uh, Minister, for three or four weeks. This is... Minister Wong? Oh, he hasn't finished. I was calling order. <laughs> Thank you. But we got there, so, Minister. Sadly, for rural and regional Australians, uh, the difficulties in accessing health care is not a new problem. Order. This is something that Minister, goes back. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Yeah, um, point of order. One last time. No, we're still in time. One last attempt at asking the minister whether he'll confirm um, whether that he, whether 887 visas will be included. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. The minister is being relevant. Um, minister. Uh, thank you, President. Again. The evidence is already in that this government is taking action to clear the backlog of visas that we were left by the former government. That will benefit rural and regional Australians for health care and it will benefit employers right across Thank rural you, and regional Your Australia. Time has expired. Senator Watt. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of questions asked by Senator Hume and Cash. Thank you. And not answered. Well, it's almost like, you know, Voldemort, the number that cannot be named. Two hundred and seventy five dollars. Remember that amount that was going to be, you know, coming off everyone's energy bill, those cost of living pressures that were going to be so just easy street for all Australians under the Albanese government. We did warn them. We did warn Australians it won't be easy under Albanese. Well, let me tell you, it's getting tougher and tougher every day. Tougher today with another 0.25 basis point. Remember when you told us that there was going to be a reduction in interest rates under Labor? Instead, they're going in the other direction, putting more and more stress on everyday Australians and their families. Remember, 97 times $275 was mentioned as going to be saved off energy bills. We now know, and it's being acknowledged through gritted teeth, that energy bills are going to continue to rise this year by over 50 per cent in some instances. And what are those opposite looking to do? Now they're in government, they actually don't know what to do because they are pulling switches and rolling out policies that is making a bad situation worse. A bad situation is constantly being made worse by those opposites and their inability to make a policy decision that will actually benefit Australians, will reduce cost of living pressures on family household budgets. Instead, those opposite are so fixated on policies that are actually creating more and more problems for Australian households. We know that a raft of projects in our resources sector are being shelved. The market intervention that is being done by those opposite has ensured that investment in the resource sector is going elsewhere. And now they want to talk about a safety mechanism, and we know what's going to happen there. We're going to see more and more pressures on everyday Australians in their household budget as the cost of everything goes up. Cost of everything goes up. But what they don't understand as they put these pressures onto Australian businesses, who will then have to pass those on to Australian consumers, adding to the inflationary pressure. For those of you that need an Economics 101 book, just let me know. I'll pop up to the library for you and send it over. But when you've got these inflationary pressures being added to, and then you start charging a carbon tax, because we know you're completely wedded to that, let me tell you what's going to happen to a whole lot of industries and what's already happening in a number of industries as they look at this government and know they have no clue what they're doing, that they're going to impost more and more costs onto business. So investment's going elsewhere. Companies and manufacturing in particular is starting to go offshore. So under your guise of this is better for emissions, we're going to lower emissions, all you're doing is sending them overseas to countries who have less regulation. You're killing off Australian jobs and all the while 
putting increased inflationary pressures on Australian families who are currently struggling under the weight of mortgages, 800,000 of which are about to move, from variable rate, move to the new variable rate, which is going to see so much pressure go onto these households. But don't worry, we'll just listen to Mr Albanese and he talk about the voice, or we'll spend or waste an afternoon reading 6,000 words from Mr Chalmers, the Treasurer, who is looking to take Australia back to a form of socialism that is just unbelievable. I mean, I thought he was in the Labor right. I didn't know you guys let them in when they were full-blown communists. But here we are reading something in the monthly, because you know, let's speak to Northcote and Newtown, I think uh, Jo Hildebrand referred to this morning, who read the monthly. A faux intellectual episode, rather than being focused on how to help Australian families, the Treasurer spent his summer penning an essay to go into the monthly, which is, quite frankly, an absolute waste of an academic exercise and has just proven that Charmonomics are going to take this country backwards. It's going to destroy manufacturing. The fact that you want more government intervention, we know that, but this is now getting to the point of the ridiculous. This is absolutely unbelievable. 6,000 words. 6,000 words. Pity he didn't write 6,000 words on what he was going to do to help everyday Australians. Senator Walsh. President, uh, and uh, I thank uh, the opposition uh, senators for their questions, uh, because their questions uh, enable me uh, to talk about the approach that the Albanese government uh, is taking uh, on addressing the number one uh, challenge that Australians face today, uh, and that, of course, uh, is the inflation challenge, uh, which is our top priority. Uh, and if I get time, uh, Senator Cash's uh, question will also uh, enable me to talk a little bit um, about the Albanese government's approach to First Nations issues uh, and particularly to the question of family violence, uh, which is a, a question uh, that is of huge significance to us as a government uh, and one uh, for which we have already put considerable plans in place, uh, including, of course, uh, legislating for 10 days uh, paid domestic family violence leave, which has already started and will benefit millions of Australians. Um, but on uh, the questions raised about inflation uh, and the cost of living, uh, these are the questions that we came into government uh, to address. These are the questions that we are working to solve for the Australian people, uh, because our guiding principle as a government uh, as you all know in this place, uh, is that we want to ensure that no one uh, is left behind uh, and no one is held back. Uh, and we know that Australians are doing it tough right now uh, with the rising cost of living. Uh, and of course, um, there are a number of things that we can do and that we are doing uh, to put practical solutions in place to help Australians. Uh, with the challenges that they're facing. Um, we need to strengthen Medicare uh, and we need to make medicines cheaper, uh, and that is exactly what we have done by cutting the maximum co-payment under the PBS uh, by up to $12.50. And I'm proud to say that that has already started this year, uh, and for an average person who's relying on PBS medications, uh, that person could save hundreds of dollars a year um, because we have taken this cost of living uh, measure. We're deliver delivering uh, cheaper childcare to 1.26 million families. Uh, and of course, under the watch of the previous government, uh, childcare prices, which are such a huge impost on the family budget, uh, rose by 41 per cent. Uh, 41 per cent. Uh, so we are committed to delivering cheaper childcare. Uh, and uh, that will start uh, in July, uh, and we're very proud to be able to bring down that cost for Australian yeah, families yeah, yeah. while also providing quality early childhood education. Um, we're building more affordable housing, uh, and we'll have legislation come to this place, which we hope 
uh, the opposition will uh, agree with, uh, given uh, the concerns that they've raised about the cost of living crisis that Australians face today. Uh, we will build more affordable housing. We will increase supply. Uh, and we will do that in a way that brings uh, people together to make sure that we have solutions for Australian people. Uh, now, the opposition raised questions about energy prices, uh, and it is uh, quite an extraordinary thing for them to come into this place uh, and talk to us about the challenges of bringing down power bills. Uh, that is a challenge that we uh, take absolutely uh, seriously. Uh, but it, of course, uh, is a challenge that is borne by Australian households um, because of a decade of absolute denial and delay uh, when it comes to the energy transition from those opposite. Uh, the legacy of those opposite uh, is an energy disaster um, that has really left the country ill-prepared uh, for the challenges that we face today. Does anybody remember uh, how many different energy policies the opposition had when they were in government was it was it 22 oh, senator o'neill i think it was i think it was 22, 22. Uh, and they couldn't land be the they couldn't land one of them uh, all they did was let uh, capacity exit the energy system they didn't uh, invest in renewable energy because they don't believe in it they didn't invest in new transmission uh, because they didn't want renewables in the grid they failed to set a net zero target they knew energy prices would go up in July, and they lied to the Australian people about that by so, omission. By omission. Uh, so we won't be taking advice from you, you about Walsh. energy prices. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, I too rise to take note on on these two very important issues: cost of living uh, and the impact of the repeal of the cashless debit card on my home state of WA. And Sadly, what we see in this government, and we have just seen it again, is that this is a government that at every opportunity puts symbolism over substance. Symbolism over substance. We saw it late last year when Parliament was recalled in an emergency session to pass emergency legislation uh, in terms of uh, gas prices and flow-on impacts to state regimes regarding coal. And we've seen a complete failure of that policy because the government only cares about symbolism. And that's also what we saw with the cashless debit card. We saw a, a hasty and unseemly hasty repeal of the cashless debit card with nothing to put in its place. And what has been the impact on the communities in my home state of WA? We saw as was uh, uh, shown by the question from Senator Cash to Minister Farrell, the huge negative impact of this decision from the government to scrap the cashless debit card uh, on a community like Laverton. Now, Laverton uh, is a community that's probably not forefront of most people's minds. It's a long way off the beaten track, as it were. Uh, now, I know. Uh, Patrick Hill well, and he has spoken. I know how much he loves his community. I know how much he has put into his community the advocacy on behalf of the Outback Way, the advocacy on behalf of enabling his community to get ahead, to thrive, to get um, people who are at risk of social harm back as part of that community. And now we are see all that hard work, all that hard work that has gone in to the last few years thrown away with nothing to replace it. So the local, uh, the local Desert Inn Hotel has been forced to close the doors on its liquor store on Thursday because of the public unrest and introduced a one item per customer rule on Friday. Now this is subsequent to the repeal of the cashless debit card, which was making a very real difference in that local community. And Patrick Hill, the president of the Shire, said, they're drinking bottles of spirits. That brings violence, he said. The kids are not getting fed. The women get bashed up. 
It's just going back to the way it was. The way it was. The way it was. The cashless debit card made a real impact on that community. It wasn't a silver bullet. I've got up and said this in government, and, and I say it again in opposition, and, and nobody on this side pretended it was a silver bullet. But it enabled some people to take greater control of their lives. It enabled some people to break the cycle of dependency and violence that had been present in those communities. And this government, when it came into power, scrapped it with nothing to put in its place. And we've seen the problems in Alice Springs as well. We're also seeing problems in places like Carnarvon, in my home state of WA, where the people of Carnarvon were desperate, desperate to, after the Prime Minister went to visit Alice Springs and then came to Western Australia, desperate to have him come to Carnarvon to see the problems they face in their local community. Uh, of course, their pleas were ignored, but we have a situation where local communities just aren't being listened to. They're not being listened to because this government is just obsessed by the symbolism of the changes they make and not the practical outcomes on the ground, not the substance of what the changes they make mean to people's lives. And so we see in a small community like Laverton, a community off the beaten track, a community that's not in the forefront of most people's minds, occasionally around a, a boardroom table when you're talking about a new mineral deposit that's been discovered out that way. Uh, sadly, in the paper, when we see some of the social dysfunction that is currently uh, running rife in that community. Uh, so it's a very you, sad Brockman. day for that community. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, I really enjoy uh, hearing a sense of urgency from the other, other side. They never acted with in the 10 years that they were actually in government and could do something about some of the challenges that are experienced by First Nations communities, especially in remote and regional areas in our country. I'm really interested to know where Senator Brockman was, where Senator Cash was, in 2017 when there was $245 million cut from Indigenous housing. $245 million cut from Indigenous housing despite chronic overcrowding, despite chronic overcrowding in your home state that you're, sit, you're standing over there right now claiming to care so much about. And don't even get me started about the almost $1 billion of cuts that happened under the former government's watch when they first came to power, almost $1 billion. And they have got the cheek to sit over the other side of the chamber now and try to lecture us about what we are doing in First Nations communities. Can you imagine what that $1 billion worth of investment could have done in First Nations communities if it was actually sustained till today? Can you imagine what that $1 billion might have done? Instead, you chose to cut it. You chose to cut it. So it's a bit rich for you to sit over there and lecture us about the work that's happening in First Nations communities. And particularly rich hearing it as someone who's worked on the front line with lots of Aboriginal children and families, in out-of-home care, in child protection, doing the clinical work in the room with families. I've seen the impact of the challenges that you talk about looking in the eyes of families. So I absolutely understand how critically important it is that we get these things right. But one of the things that we know wasn't right, and it's interesting you talk about the cashless debit card, because it's, I find it interesting that you can talk about the difficulties experienced since the um, abolishing of the CDC, but actually nobody can find any evidence that it was working in the first place. It's, it's actually really incredible. But this, is, this was in briefs to your minister, who, who, who apparently said, it's interesting. Like, what did she say? How disappointing it was that there was no evidence that it worked. She wrote that on her briefs. She wrote that on her briefs. But you wasted more than $170 million in that anyway, even though it didn't work. Billion dollars of cuts, or well, more than a billion dollars of cuts, 
spending money on things that don't actually work. But sure, um, let's blame us for everything when we've been in power for eight months. What we do know represents the very best opportunity for change is supporting a voice to parliament. Because the very communities that you claim to care about will have a direct voice into this place. What a difference that might make to the communities that you sit over there and claim to care about. We know, and certainly I've seen from the work that I've done, what can happen to the lives of Aboriginal children and families and people when they are given a seat at the table to be part of the decisions and the conversations that affect their lives. I've, spoken with, I've, I've worked in Aboriginal organisations in Victoria. I've spoken with many uh, workers on the ground and, and, and CEOs of Aboriginal organisations who can, who can give me many examples of where they have been put in the driver's seat and they're getting real outcomes for their families on the ground. The Voice is an opportunity to ampli amplify that across the country, across the nation. Why would you not want to do that when you sit over there and pretend to care about First Nations communities? Why would you not support a Voice to Parliament? Because your voice for the last decade certainly hasn't worked for them. So aside from the real and practical changes that it would deliver for First Nations people on the ground, it also is a like an incredible opportunity to unify our country. An incredible opportunity to unify our country that talks to the special place that First Nations people should and do have in our nation's history. Thank you. Senator Antic. <coughs> yes, uh, thank you, um, Mr uh, Deputy President. I, um, I, I sat listening to the contributions before, I'd, all the way through uh, question time, actually, and I, I I'm reminded by the, uh, the suggestion that it's very simple to just simply say everything that's happening now is as a result of what happened five years ago, one year ago, ten years ago. But unfortunately, the reality of the situation is, is much, much more stark for the government. And uh, uh, while I was sitting there, I, I was minded to, uh, uh, to uh, look up a definition. Uh, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, of the term buyer's remorse. Now, if you'll just indulge me for a minute. Buyer's remorse is defined as a feeling of regret or anxiety after making a purchase, also known as buyer's regret uh, or buyer's disappointment. And it stems from the feeling that the, purchaser, the purchaser's decision was the wrong one, either because it was the wrong one or because there was a better one to be made. The Australian people are right in the early stages of buyer's remorse with this government. And this is the kind of buyer's remorse that uh, you'd get if you went onto Apple Music and downloaded a, a Venga Boys album. Uh, you would hear it and you would feel it. And it's real. It's real. I'm telling you right now, thank you to Senator Waters for that chuckle that we've noted. Hopefully Hansard picked it up. But uh, the, the reality here is this is a cost of living crisis and people are not interested. The Australian people are not interested in the diversionary tactics um, of this government, things like the voice, um, things like uh, you know the, the, the constant attempts by the prime minister to simply uh, turn up at a sporting event, uh, appear to be relatable by downing free beers, uh, and uh, and fly off again, or flying off to Kiev in order to uh, to mingle with uh, you know the global glitterati, the, the, the bloke in the green t-shirt that's uh, gracing our screens at every possible opportunity. It's the president, uh, President Zelensky, I think we're talking about. But these sort of opportunities, this bread and circuses approach to politics, is simply not cutting it with the Australian people. They're not, they're not that silly. And just this afternoon, we've seen yet another rise uh, in, in the base po basis points of the, uh, of the RBA, I think eight in a row now. Uh, and we're now seeing the highest interest rates we've seen in this country in 10 years, which is absolutely no laughing matter at all. And no amount of diversion, no amount of trying to divide Australians uh, by uh, initiatives like The Voice no amount of, as Senator Brockman quite rightly pointed out uh, earlier on, uh, removing the cashless debit card, which has had a completely counter effect, is going to cover up from the fact that Australians aren't buying what they're selling. Um, in fact, we're actually seeing now a government that is uh, actively um, falling back on promises. There was a, a promise to, I think, cut the 3.2 uh, 
$1.5 billion in, uh, in spending on consultants, and the government's already won $1.2 billion down the tube after, after nine months. So the, the spending bill is real, and the cost of living issue is the, the real one, the one that Australians are focused on. Uh, and yet we've got a, a treasurer who, who uh, graced us with 6,000 words of uh, intolerable diatribe, which I started reading. It was like a murder mystery. It was like an Agatha, Agatha Christie novel. Uh, and I'll give you the spoiler alert. It, who done it? It was the treasurer with the checkbook in the finance department. Uh, it's, it, this is not a position that's come as a result of a government of, of Christmas past. This is coming because of decisions that are being made by this government today. Uh, and you know, for all he wants to do, the treasurer, Jim, you will own nothing and be happy, Chalmers, uh, wants to tell us it's, it's something otherwise. Uh, it is not the case. Uh, in fact, these are you, particularly uniquely Australian uh, issues, economic challenges this year. Uh, we haven't covered off on high inflation. We're seeing the highest inflation we've seen in decades. Uh, and something in the order of 800,000 Australians uh, mortgage holders who are this year going to switch uh, from uh, fixed term to variable term interest rates. Uh, now with the news today that those interest rates are going up, we're looking at something in the order of $1,800 extra per month for many, many mortgage holders in this country. So let's not beat around the bush. Let's not try and blame this on things done by uh, what should we say now? Done, done by the, uh, the Fraser government in 19, you know, 1980. These are things that are happening as a result of policy levers that are being pulled by this government. And don't take my word for it. In the past week, the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council of Australia, and the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industries pre-budget submissions have all echoed the opposition, the coalition opposition's calls since the October budget to restore fiscal guardrails and to rein in spending and to drive productivity reforms to support businesses invest and Thank to you. grow our Thank economy. You, Senator Antique. I put the question. Those questions say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Waters. Very much, Deputy President. Well, just once a year we get to see who is donating to political parties, and every year it's a wash with big corporates and big polluters donating big money to the big parties and usually getting big access and big influence over policy making. Uh, last week we got the donations disclosure data for 2021 to 22, and tragically, coal and gas projects, energy companies, and mineral and resources industry bodies all featured heavily with around $2 million gifted to both of the big parties by the fossil fuel companies and their cheerleaders, it's little wonder that no matter who is in government, the fossil fuel sector continues to get almost $11 billion in public subsidies every year in things like cheap fuel and accelerated depreciation, plus direct grants to open up new polluting projects. Now, these industries are not donating millions of dollars because they believe in the institution of a strong democracy. They are donating because it gets results for them. The coal and gas donors' fingerprints are tragically all over Labor's safeguard legislation. Labor is taking money from the coal and gas corporations causing the climate crisis and then proposing laws that allow new coal and gas projects to go ahead. Four big donors represent five of the highest polluting facilities covered by the safeguard mechanism, Woodside, Blue Scope, Chevron and Inpex. And collectively, they've donated $200,000 to the Labor Party just in that last financial year. You have to wonder how much access to the table that bought them. Um, when Labor was designing its weak safeguard mechanism, which allows new coal and gas. Now, Woodside and Santos donated more to the ALP than to the Liberals and Nationals combined. And of course, they now have free reign to open new projects and trash the climate. Projects which damage land and water, which turbocharge the climate crisis, and which do not respect and in fact ignore the wishes of First Nations communities. Inpex gave $157,300 to the Liberals, the Nationals and the Labor Party. Now, they're a major polluter that is covered by the safeguard mechanism, and they're currently seeking support for a carbon capture and storage project that will benefit from the publicly funded Middle Arm Hub. Now, I wonder what legislative concessions and public support their donation will get for them. The Mineral Resources Council, who recently threatened to unleash an ad campaign against Labor unless it rules out a windfall profits tax, declared neither, nearly a quarter of a million dollars in donations to the big parties in 2021-22. 
and still there is no windfall profits tax on the horizon. Santos, which is pushing to frack the Beedaloo Basin and the Narrabri gas fields, received $16 million in public money for its Moomba carbon capture and storage project. It gave $154,000 to the major parties. It's a pretty solid return on investment for Santos there. Tamboran donated $200,000 to the big political parties, the first time they've declared a donation. They also received $7.5 million of public money from the coalition for a natural gas exploration in the Beedaloo Basin. Now, the Greens attempted to disallow that grant in the Senate, but the Labor Party decided to support the grant of that money. No idea what could have influenced that decision. And these, of course, are only the donations that Australians are told about. More than a third of all donations either fall below the disclosure threshold or they rely on weak categorisation and loopholes to stay hidden from public view. That is why the Greens want real reform to get the influence of big money out of politics. My private member's bill to end dirty donations would cap political donations at $1,000 a year no matter who you are and ban donations from industries with a track record of seeking to buy policy outcomes, including the fossil fuel sector. We want to close that loophole that allows exorbitant membership fees and cash-for-access uh, events to the big parties to completely ignore the disclosure obligations. And we want real-time disclosure of all donations over $1,000 so that when voters go to the ballot box, they know who's pulling the strings of the people that they're voting for. The Greens have been campaigning for years to clean up democracy, and we are hopeful, we are eternal optimists, that we might now have a chance for the government of the day to come to the table and work with us to ensure that politicians, all of us, work in the public interest and not in the interests of donor polluters. Senator Waters moved a motion to take note of the question that she asked. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Chisholm. I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the Migration Amendment Aggregate Sentences Bill 2023, allowing it to be considered during this period of sittings. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for this bill to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, Senator White. Uh, President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion number two, three and four for one sitting day after today, proposing the disallowance of the Australian Capital Territory National Land Lakes Ordinance 2022, uh, the Competition and Consumer Industries Codes, Franchising Amendment, Franchise Disclosure Register, Regulations 2022, and the Competition and Consumer Amendment, Consumer Data Right, Regulations 2021. Thank you, Senator White. Uh, I believe there's some um, leave, so I'll go to Senator. Oh, Senator Chisholm, is it further rearranging? No. no? So I'm with Senator. Yeah, placing. Thank you. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the routine of business on Wednesday 8 February 2023. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, I move that on Wednesday 8 February 2023 at 9am a minister may move a motion relating to the draft behaviour standards and codes as presented in the final report of the Joint Select Committee of Parliamentary Standards and b after the motion referred to in paragraph a has been determined Senators may make statements of not more than five minutes each relating to the implementation of the set, set the standard report for up to one hour. So the question is, the motion as moved by Senator Sheldon, uh, Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the routine of business for today. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that Government Business Notice of Motion No. 3 be called on after formal motions today and debated for not more than 60 minutes, after which the question be put. 
So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So finished with placing. Yes, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of abs absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons. Senator Brown for the 6th of February 2023 and Senator Stirl from the 6th to the 8th of February 2023. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those without opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Askew. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Brockman for the 6th of February for personal reasons and Senator Nampajimpa Price for the 8th and 9th of February for personal reasons. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I seek leave to move a motion relating to um, a leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Hanson. I move motion that um, that leave of absence be granted to Malcolm Roberts from the 6th to the 9th of February for personal reasons. Thank you, Senator Hanson. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So that deals with. Leave of absence. Yes. Okay. Um, we're moving to postponement. So I call the clerk. Our president, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of business at the Senate. Notice of motion number one uh, for today postponed to the 8th of February. Business of the Senate. Notice of motion number two for today postponed to the 6th of March. General business notices numbers one two four and one two five postponed to the 6th of March. And business of the Senate, notice of motion number seven for the 8th of February, postponed till the 8th of March 2023. Our committees have also lodged extension notifications as shown at item 10 of today's order of business. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll go to uh, business of Senate number two, standing in the name of Senator Colbeck and others. That's I oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, it is two. No, I should listen more, Senator Russell. <laughs> so I think now, so government business one with postponed, and two, no. Oh, right. Okay. So we are now dealing with um, general business. Number number one, Senator Chisholm. Yep. Government business. Sorry, I've well and truly confused myself up here, and sadly confused some of you. So my apologies. But that's what we're dealing with. Government business number one, Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks. I ask that government business notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this, this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion and table a statement in relation to the works. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So, yeah. So uh, I'm now moving to government business number two, standing in the name of Senator Watt, Minister. Thank you, President. I ask that government government business num notice of motion number two be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call the minister. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 to provide for the treatment of aggregate sentences and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill uh, that this bill may proceed without for, uh, sorry, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, so the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against, I believe, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 to provide for the treatment of aggregate sentences and for related purposes. Minister. Uh, I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. So the question is the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And in accordance with standing order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 6th of March 2023. Yep. So we just moved government business number three, and it will be debated after formal business. So we'll move to general business notice of motion number 109, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie. Senator McKenzie. <laughs> Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion 109 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKenzie. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 109, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 110, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie. I ask that general business notice of motion number 110 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKenzie. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 110, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 122, standing in the name of Senator Barbara Pocock. Senator Pocock. I ask that general business notice of motion number 122 proposing an extension of time for the Select Committee on Work and Care to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Pocock. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 122 standing in the name of Senator Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 124, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Is that has been postponed. Thank you very much. And 125, the same. Uh, we will now move to general business, notice of motion number 123, standing in the name of Senator Hume, Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business, notice of motion number 123, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question asks uh, Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, Labor will be opposing this motion. We have commenced the 23-24 budget process, and it is the budget process operational rules that govern the consideration of policies that are being brought forward. Given these are cabinet deliberations, it would be inappropriate for these to be released at this time. I note that we released the previous budget process operational rules after the budget process was completed in the interests of transparency and accountability. Once the 23-24 budget is delivered, we will consider further requests for these rules, given the obvious interest in them. Thank you, uh, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that General business notice of motion number 123, standing in the name of Senator Hume, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The ayes have it. No, Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 123 standing in the name of Senator Hume be agreed to. The ayes shall go to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 46 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And I advise senators there may be further divisions. We'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 120, standing in the name of Senator Orman Payne. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number, two, number 120 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Orman Payne. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 120, standing in the name of Senator Orman Payne, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 120, standing in the name of Senator Orman Payne, be agreed to. The ayes should move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 45 ayes and 23 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 127, standing in the name of Senator Steele, John. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, President. I ask the general uh, business uh, notice of motion at number 127 <coughs> and 128, relating to an order of production of documents on the deployment of the ADF in Iraq be taken as a formal motion. I advise senators that we're dealing with general business notice of motion number 127 and 128 standing in the name of Senator Steele, John, and may be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, I call Senator Steele, John. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Yes, Senator. The government will not be supporting this motion. It is the long-standing practice of governments not to disclose advice 
that has been provided to the Governor General out of respect for that office. Furthermore, the disclosure of advice of this nature would be contrary to Australia's national interests, not least of all because it may prejudice our international relations. A parliamentary committee is currently reviewing how Australia makes decisions to send service personnel into international Order. armed conflict, with the terms of reference referred by the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence, the Hon. Richard Miles. The Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade will soon be reporting on its inquiry into international armed conflict decision making. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motions number 127 and 128, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion No. 127 and 128, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Nick McKim for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. <laughs>
order, there being 13 ayes and 49 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now, now go to general business notice of motion number 126, standing in the name of Senator Hume. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business notice of motion number 126 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 126, standing in the name of Senator Hume, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Now move to general business notice of motion number 129, standing in the name of Senator, Pocock, Senator David Pocock. Senator Pocock. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 129 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Pocock. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 129, standing in the name of Senator Pocock, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I now move to general business notice of motion number 131, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. I ask that general business notice of motion number 131 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 131, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 132, standing in the name of Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 132, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read for the first time. So the question is the motion is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I move that this bill, the Migration Amendment Evacuation to Safety Bill, now be read for a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I table an explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator McKim. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 133 to 135, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Smith. Thank you, President. I ask that general <coughs> business notice of motion number 133 to number 135 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to these motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move the motions. So the question is that general business notice of motions number 133 to 135, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 136, standing in the name of Senator Nampajinka Price. Hear, hear. Thank you, Madam President. I ask that general business notice motion number 136, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to reduce alcohol-related harm to vulnerable communities in the Northern Territory and for related purposes. Yeah. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Nampajinka Price. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Nampajinka Price. Be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. 
A bill for an act to reduce alcohol-related harm to vulnerable communities in the Northern Territory and for related purposes. Senator Nampajinka Price. Thank you, Madam President. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to table an explanatory mem memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Nampajinka Price. Uh, I table an. Ex a a Explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Thank you Senator Nampajinka Price. I now move to general business notice for motion number 137, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number 137 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew in the name of Senator Cash be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. And pursuant to the notice that we agreed to earlier, we will now uh, proceed to do government business. Uh, number three, I call the clerk. A government business notice of motion number three, standing in the name of the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher, in relation to a designation under the Migration Act 1958. Am I calling you, uh, Minister Watt? Uh, thanks, President. I move the motion. And now I can. So the question is, are you going to speak to it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, President. At the last election, the Prime Minister spoke of the need to be strong on borders without being weak on humanity. Regional processing is about both. Strong on borders because we know that regional processing breaks the business model of people smugglers who seek, it to, seek to market an outcome. In doing so, it ultimately saves the lives of vulnerable persons who would otherwise be exploited onto leaky, leaky boats to attempt a dangerous voyage at sea. That's something which also risks the lives of defence and border force of officers who have to deal with the often tragic consequences of those ventures. I appreciate that some in this place may think differently about this issue, but regional processing has been settled policy by both sides of politics for over a decade for precisely the reasons I've described. Regional processing was recommended in a report led by the former Chief of the Defence Force, Sir, uh, Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston, along with Professor Michael Lestrange, the then Director of the National Security College at ANU and refugee expert Paris Aristotle. The panel was charged with making recommendations on how best to prevent asylum seekers from travelling to Australia by boat. Its principal recommendation was the introduction of legislation to, quote, support the transfer of people to regional processing arrangements as a matter of urgency, uh, including Nauru. In discussing the declaration of Nauru under the Migration Act in 2012, my colleague, the then minister, Chris Bowen, said at the time, we are determined to expose the people smugglers business model for what it is, a ruthless con. There is no visa awaiting boat arrivals, no speedy outcome and no special treatment. Those words were true then and they are true now. The government has been transparent in its position on regional processing. We implemented it when in government previously, we remained committed to it in opposition and we went to the election on it. And that's because, fundamentally, regional processing breaks the operating model for people smugglers. It takes away the product they are trying to sell. And, it, and in doing so, it stops vulnerable people risking their lives on dangerous voyages on leaky boats. It stops deaths at sea. It's simple as that. It is tough. It sends a message that persons will not settle in Australia. It is part of a wider framework in Operation Sovereign Borders that means persons trying to enter Australia without a valid visa will be returned to their port, country of origin or another country where they have a right of entry. And every person who has attempted to enter Australia this way from mid-2014 onwards has been either returned or turned back. The government has been both determined and focused in its conduct and support of Operation Sovereign Borders. We have not politicised this issue or allowed others to do so. 
We have viewed it as an important undertaking to be pursued with the seriousness that the issue demands. And that is the approach that we are taking today by seeking the parliament's support for, re for a resolution to redesignate Nauru. In doing so, it is important to note the legal framework under which this declaration is made, and I'll take a few minutes to set that out. The power conferred on me by sub subsection 198 capital AB subsection 1 to designate that a country is a regional processing country is contained in part 2 division 8 subdivision B of the Act. And of course, that power is conferred on the minister uh, rather than on me personally. Uh, subsection 198 capital A capital B subsection 2 provides that the only condition for the exercise of the power conferred on the minister by section 198 capital A B 1 uh, is that I think it is in the national interest to designate the country to be a regional processing country. Subsection 198 capital A capital B 3 provides that, in considering the national interest for the purposes of section 198 capital A B 2, I must have the minister must have regard to whether or not the country has given Australia any assurances to the effect that the country would not return a person to another country where they would be at risk and that the regional processing country allows assessment of that person to be a refugee. There are three key documents that have facilitated the minister's consideration regarding Nauru as a regional processing country. These are, one, the memorandum of understanding between the Republic of Nauru and Australia on the enduring regional processing capability in the Republic of Nauru, signed by the former minister on the 24th of September 2021. Secondly, a statement of arrangements that are in place or are to be put in place for the management of persons. And thirdly, advice received from the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, which has been consulted regarding the des designation. In determining that it is in the national interest that Nauru be redesignated as a regional processing country, the minister has considered the following factors. One, the ongoing operation of regional processing arrangements will deter people smugglers from exploiting and encouraging vulnerable persons to risk their lives at sea. I note the need to prevent loss of life at sea was a primary object of the subdivision at section 198, capital A, capital A. Uh, as I've stated above, regional processing breaks the people, public, people smuggling model. Two, regional processing also supports the broader objectives of Operation Sovereign Borders, which further deters such ventures by ensuring that persons will not settle permanently in Australia. I note that another primary objective of the subdivision is that persons should be able to ta be taken to any country where their claims can be properly assessed. Three, that regional cooperation is the only manner in which the challenges of irregular migration can be addressed. And I note the work through the Bali process that continues to acknowledge uh, the tra transnational challenges of people smuggling and irregular movement. Four, that Nauru has been designated as a regional processing country for a decade and has, for a number of years, accepted transfers under the sovereign borders framework with significant infrastructure and administrative processes in place. I note in the past, however, that there have been real issues and concerns with the provision of services on Nauru, but that there have also been uplift in these services, particularly those relating to the health and wellbeing of persons on Nauru. In particular, the efforts that this parliament has made to ensure medical evacuation, clinical service provision and as appropriate escalation arrangements mean that service provision is very different now than in the past. In addition, it is also important that persons on Nauru are not in detention. Where there have been individual circumstances requiring examination and assistance, the minister has also made it clear that uh, we have the highest expectations of care uh, and that there are appropriate channels for advocates and others to engage them if there are concerns. Finally, uh, fifthly and finally, the permanent resettlement of many persons from Nauru to the United States, Canada and New Zealand demonstrates the ability of regional processing arrangements to ensure durable, permanent pathways for resettlement 
while ensuring that people smugglers are denied their objective of marketing Australia as an outcome of their evil trade. And I might say uh, that this government has made good progress in resettling those persons who remain on Nauru, uh, and we intend to keep doing that. These considerations are in addition to the requirement under subsection 198 capital AB3 that Nauru has provided assurances that it will not return people to a country where their life or freedom are at risk and an additional assurance in the Memorandum of Understanding with Nauru. Uh, in conclusion, uh, Acting Deputy President, when the Prime Minister spoke of the need to be strong on borders without being weak on humanity, he also spoke of the need to respond pragmatically to policy that works. This issue, like so many issues uh, of the past two decades, has been subject to ruthless politicisation. These issues are not best dealt with in an environment of partisanship and posturing. They are serious issues that require difficult choices, and their solutions are ones that carry immense responsibility and gravity. But ultimately, there is a higher purpose in them in stopping people dying at sea. The preservation of life, while ensuring persons are resettled appropriately, is at the very core of regional processing and Operation Sovereign Borders. I'm determined every day to pursue that objective where required. Uh, sorry, the minister is determined every day to pursue that objective, as is the rest of the government, where required in turning back boats and returning persons. The continuance of regional processing is essential to fighting the people smuggling trade, and its deterrence value means that we don't enable people smugglers to exploit persons from undertaking dangerous ventures. We need to separate the politics of the past of this issue from clouding our mind to what needs to be done to prevent the reoccurrence of these issues. Saving lives through difficult choices may be tough, but it is also humane, and it has been shown to work. Uh, I hope that this resolution proceeds without the rancour that has been associated with these debates in the past. I acknowledge there may be some who disagree, and to them I say consider the alternative, an alternative this country knows only too well, measured in the lives of those lost forever at sea. Uh, for that reason alone, I commend the resolution to the House. Uh, uh, and that is my contribution. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I listen very, very carefully to the minister, and I know the minister, through his professional background, is a person who has an eye for detail uh, and would not have missed this point, which I am about to speak to. And that is, if you can believe this, and it was never discussed in the minister's comments, which you just heard, the legislative instrument which made Nauru a regional processing centre actually lapsed on 1 October 2022. It lapsed on 1 October 2022. I didn't hear you refer to that through you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I didn't hear the minister refer to that. Did you hear that, that date, that it actually lapsed? That the relevant minister had their eye off the ball? Can you believe such a thing? 14,000 people in the Department of Home Affairs, and they missed that. So if you went into the Register of Legislation, and looked up the instrument making Nauru a regional processing centre, if you looked into that register this morning, yesterday, it would have said, not in effect. Not in effect. Why? Because it lapsed. Why? Because the relevant minister, not his representative here in this chamber, but the relevant minister dropped the ball. Dropped the ball. From May 2021, from May 2021, the government had been uh, given the information that this instrument needed to be renewed from May 2021. It would no doubt have been in the incoming minister's brief after the last election, and they dropped the ball. They dropped the ball. That instrument ceased to be in effect in October 2022. And here we are now, February 2023, and the Minister for Agriculture has to come in here and do the tidy up. Tidy up for the other minister in the other place who dropped the ball. Appalling, absolutely appalling. And, minister, and I say through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, you could at least, at least provide that transparency to this chamber. You could at least provide that transparency to this chamber instead of giving me the political opportunity, to be frank, to come up 
and surprise everyone listening with that fact that you didn't choose to tell this chamber. If you, if you stuff up, someone very, very bright early in my business career told me, if you, if you eat crow, better to do it fresh. If you're going to eat crow, eat it fresh. Eat it fresh. But we didn't get that from the minister today. He had absolutely no reference to the fact that that instrument ceased to have effect in October 2022. And the concern that raises in my mind is what exposure did that lead to to the relevant officers, members of the department, who are diligently undertaking their du duties, discharging their duties under the Migration Act? Did it expose any of them to political, to legal claims, to liability? Did they have all the protections they should have had after that instrument lapsed? Absolutely appalling. Absolutely appalling. It's not as if we've got a hundred regional processing centres. There's Nauru. And they couldn't even get their homework right in that regard. What is the minister doing? What is the minister doing? How many times was the minister reminded? How many times did the minister fail to act? If the minister's missing something this obvious, what else is the minister missing? How can we have any confidence in the minister? Yeah. This is appalling. It's absolutely extraordinary. Who's advising the minister? Who picked it up? Who said, Minister, we've got to fix this quickly? This is expiring in October. Remember, the election was in May, right? The election was in May. It wasn't as if this was happening in the next week. The election was in May. And if you go into that register of legislation in relation to this instrument, you go on the Federal Register of Legislation, it was there for everyone to see. Obviously, the minister doesn't visit the, the Register of Legislation and check out his own instruments and legislation. It said, no longer in effect. No longer in effect. And that contribution we just heard from the minister made absolutely no reference to it. No reference to it. If you, those in the gallery listening to this debate, those listening through broadcasting, they would have had no idea, no idea that they'd actually dropped the ball on this. They dropped the ball on this. You would have had no idea because they weren't transparent and upfront about this terrible, terrible error. And I don't know what it means. I'm a lawyer by profession. I don't really know what it means in terms of the liability and the rights and obligations of people that we had this gap in the law between October, between October and today. I don't know the ramifications. I don't know the ramifications. What I do know is there are going to be all sorts of people looking at this very carefully now and looking at what it means in terms of people they represent, in terms of their various stakeholders, and we don't know the answers. We don't know the answers that the minister didn't even refer to it. It's as if it doesn't exist. Did they really think they were going to get away with that? Did they really think they were going to get away with that, that we wouldn't pick that up? Absolutely extraordinary. Mr Acting Deputy President, absolutely extraordinary. There were elements of the minister's speech I absolutely agree with in terms of the need for regional processing. Absolutely, I support that. Um, but I must say, Mr Acting Deputy President, it always strikes me as, as, as somewhat ingenuous when those on the other side get up and they say anyone who criticises their policy is, is engaging in rank politicisation. But they never engage in rank politicisation. It's only when they're criticised that it amounts to rank politicisation. So there will be members, senators in this chamber who get up and they'll make contributions to this debate and they'll speak from the heart. And I respect, I respect their views in this regard. And I do not, I will not say that they're engaging in rank politicisation. They're simply saying what they believe. And they have every single right to do that. But in the context of this debate, how could you come into this place and miss out the fundamental issue that this instrument had been on the red, had, had failed to be in effect since October 2022? Didn't even mention it, let alone the ramifications of that. Absolutely extraordinary what we've seen from the minister. And I realise it's not his portfolio. He has the, the job, and it's a very, very hard job. Very, very hard job to represent the minister in the other from the other place in this place. Very difficult job. I wouldn't wish it on my own worst enemy. But he's got the job, so I guess he's, he's diligently fulfilled his task. But maybe you should go back to the people who wrote the speech and say, you know what, you know what, I would have preferred, and I think it reflects his character, to be frank, 
Why didn't you go back to them and say, you know, I would have preferred if we'd owned up to the mistake, if we'd been transparent, open and honest with everyone? That's the way I roll. That's the way I roll. And it's a shame. It's a shame that the major issue in terms of what this motion is dealing with wasn't canvassed by the minister in introducing this. A real shame. And uh, I, I suggest to all of my colleagues in this place that we should seriously reflect on that state of affairs. Um, I've often in this place spoken about the importance of delegated legislation, instruments, their uh, impact on the powers and liberties of people, uh, and it's something I take incredibly serious, uh, seriously. So if you're going to come into this place and present a motion, give us all the facts. Give us all the facts. Give us all the context. And let's have a reasonable debate about it. Don't try and hide that which can't be hidden. Don't even try to hide that which can't be hidden, because it's there for everyone to see on the register of federal legislation. Thank you. Senator McKim. Well, uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and I have to say, the more things change, the more they stay the same sometimes in this place. And it is beyond doubt that many people in the recent election uh, voted for the Australian Labor Party in the hope that they would be more compassionate towards refugees. Well, here we are, less than a year after the election, and what are we getting? The same rubbish in a different bin. We're getting the same old lame excuses, the same old spin, the same old toxic politics that we got for year after year after year from Mr Morrison and Mr Dutton, and we're getting it now from the Australian Labor Party. That speech could have been given. That speech from Senator Watt could have been given by Mr Morrison or Mr Dutton. Yes, the tone is different, but the words, the excuses, the spin is identical, identical to what we heard for years from Mr Morrison and from Mr Dutton. And here's a tip for Mr Morrison, Mr Dutton and for Senator Watt. There are no excuses for torture. There are no excuses for torturing innocent people. There never have been and there never will be. And you can roll out all the excuses you like for deliberately harming innocent people in order to send a message to other desperate people that they should not try to come to Australia to seek asylum by boat. You can roll out all the excuses you like, but that's all they will ever be. Excuses for torture. And you can never, ever excuse torture, and you never, ever should try to excuse torture. And it's not just the Greens that say this is torture. Amnesty International conducted a rigorous assessment of Australia's offshore detention regime, and they, have, they found categorically it is akin to torture. And let me explain why that is. On Senator Watt's own account today, on the excuses given by Mr Dutton and Mr Morrison, offshore detention is designed to send a message to other people that they should not attempt to enter Australia. It is designed to coerce people into taking an action or not taking an action by the infliction of harm. That is categorically, comfortably within the definition of torture. The people who were caught up in Australia's offshore detention regime, and it's been going, let us not forget, for nearly 10 long years now, they are like the corpses that used to get impaled on the walls of medieval cities to dissuade other desperate folk from attempting to enter those cities. 
We have learned nothing in this country since the days of Port Arthur, where deliberate harm, including psychological harm, was inflicted on people as a punishment. And in offshore detention in Australia for 10 years, we've seen murder, we've seen rape, we've seen deliberate medical neglect, we've seen child abuse, we've seen child sex abuse, we've seen mass armed assault, we've seen death, we've seen disease, we've seen lives destroyed. And you know why we've seen those things in offshore detention in the last 10 years in Australia? Because that system was designed deliberately to brutalise and dehumanise people. It was designed deliberately to make people's lives so unbearable that they would prefer to return to the dangers and persecutions that caused them to flee their homelands in the first place than to stay in the prison camps on Manus Island and Nauru. That is why those things happened. Those deaths, those murders, those, that brutality, that dehumanisation, they weren't bugs of the system. They were features of the system. It was a system designed either intentionally to cause those things to happen or in the knowledge that those things would be likely to happen if the system was designed in that way. That's what offshore detention is in Australia. And right now, there are somewhere around 150 people who are about to clock up a decade in offshore detention. What's Senator Watt been doing for the last decade? A lot of great things with his life. I hope he has. What's Mr Dutton and Mr Morrison been doing for the last decade? I hope they've had some good things in their life too. I've had some great things in my life happen in the last decade. But there's a group of people who've lived a decade now in those systems designed to deliberately dehumanise them, designed to brutalise them, and they've lived without hope for nearly a decade, 10 long years. And what does the Labor Party do when it comes into government? It stitches up a $420 million contract for three years to look after well under 100 people, or purportedly look after, but to provide services to well under 100 people on Nauru with a company that stands accused of human rights abuses, bu abuses in the US prison system. A company that's under investigation by government in the US for fraud and human rights abuses. And somehow the Labor Party thinks that this is a company that is worthy of having responsibility for people who've been in the offshore detention system for nearly a decade now in Australia. It is a disgrace that the Labor Party has stitched a deal up with MTC. They are a disgrace of a company. They should not be given responsibility for even one person's lives let alone the lives of people who are about to clock up a decade in offshore prisons in Nauru. Now, I was on Manus Island in 2017 when the Australian government ordered that the food, the drinking water, the electricity and the medical support be cut off from hundreds of men. I was there, I was in that prison, the Lombrum prison camp, inside the Lombrum naval base on Papua New Guinea. I saw the desperation in the eyes of those men, but I also saw their bravery. And I want to contrast their bravery, that reclam reclamation of agency that they engaged in there when they actually said, no, we're, not, we're no longer going to do as we're told and as we're ordered to do. We're going to actually stand up and reclaim our lives 
which is exactly what they did. I want to contrast that bravery with the cowardice that we are going to see in this chamber today when the overwhelming majority of this chamber is going to vote for this uh, obnoxious instrument that is currently before us. That contrast is immense and it does no favours to the majority of senators who are, uh, are about to vote for this instrument. But no matter how, th how bad things um, seem, uh, there is always hope. And I want the chamber to know that today Berus Bachani came into this parliament, into this building that we stand in as we debate this motion today, and he made a speech, effectively a speech to the Australian parliament. And one of the things he said in that speech was to urge the Labor Party to actually finally do something for the relatively very small number of people who are still stranded in Papua New Guinea and Nauru, less than 150 people who are, as I've said, about to clock up a decade in offshore detention. And he asked the Labor Party a question in his speech, and this is what he said, what are you scared of? What are you scared of? And I think that's a question the Labor Party needs to answer. What is the Labor Party scared of? Any moral person is going to look at the last 10 years of the lives of the less than 150 people still in exile in either Papua New Guinea or Nauru, and they are going to say enough is enough. They are going to say at least bring them to Australia temporarily while you find a third country to take them. There is just simply no benefit and no need for them to stay in offshore detention. Ten years. Ten years they've been there. There is no benefit to them staying there except for the lame old excuses, the lame old spin that we get rolled out by the Labor and Liberal parties to try to justify torture. Because that is, what we are going, that is what is going on in this chamber today. That's what we've heard in this chamber and the other place in this parliament for the last decade. Excuses for torture. Well, enough is enough. There is never an excuse for torture. So the Greens have got a bill, been tabled today. And that bill, bill, if it's successful, would compel the government to offer a transfer to everyone still uh, in Papua New Guinea or Nauru who was exiled there um, because they made the mistake of stretching out a hand to our country, asking for our help, and they arrived here by boat to claim asylum. So that bill should be passed. There is no doubt that that bill should be passed. I remind the Labor Party of this. The Labor Party supported the Greens' Medivac amendment when the Labor Party was in opposition. They supported that and they told Australia that they were supporting it because it was the right thing to do, because we had a moral obligation to the people who were in offshore detention to make sure they got the medical treatment they needed. That's why the Labor Party said they supported the Medivac legislation. Well, the Greens legislation is absolutely in the spirit of the Medivac legislation that Labor previously supported. So this is the test for the Labor Party. Here's the test. They support our legislation and they show that the reasons they gave to the Australian people for supporting the Greens Medivac amendment were actually real and fair dinkum. But if Labor doesn't support the Greens evacuate to safety legislation, it will make one thing abundantly clear, and that is that their support for the Medivac amendment when they were in opposition was just rank politics. It didn't know anything to doing the right thing. It didn't know anything to the concept of respect 
to the concept of human rights, to the concept of human dignity. So that's the test for the Labor Party, and I urge them to support our bill and finally help us to write an end to one of the darkest, bloodiest and foulest chapters in Australia's story, the chapter of offshore detention. And finally, if I could just say this, we need a royal commission in this country into immigration detention. A royal commission into offshore immigration detention and a royal commission into onshore immigration detention, into the corruption, into the human rights abuses, into a system that is the extension of the carceral state um, that actually was one of the founding elements of European settlement into Australia. And there are some things that we just have never, never learned. It's time to bring an end to this dark chapter and write a new beginning. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy Speaker, uh, President. Um, I rise to make a contribution on the debate here in the chamber about this very important matter. The resolution that's before us deserves the support of the chamber. I want to acknowledge before I move to my prepared remarks, uh, Senator McKim's authentic care that's embedded in the speech that he made, but I also want to note some alarmist language. This is the problem I often find as a member of the Labor Party, which finds itself happily in government. It's a contrast with the rhetoric of the Greens Party, who seem to fight against the way the world is and seek to describe it in a way that they would seek it to be. When you're in government, you have to make tough decisions with compassion, with humanity. And protecting our borders is a core task for any government that is worthy of governing for the nation of Australia. Senator McKim speaks very passionately and uses the words human rights, human dignity. But we also have a protection of human life. There's little dignity. There's, there's little human rights for people who founded in a vessel off the coast of Western Australia at Christmas Island. And for those of us who were here in Parliament at the time, and Australians right around this country who saw those images, that was the moment that meant things had to change. So while I acknowledge uh, Senator McKim's contribution, I think it's fanciful to believe that without the policy that has been implemented and maintained for 10 years, there would not have been incredible loss of life. I also want to speak to the contribution made uh, by my uh, good colleague in this place, Senator Paul Scar, uh, with whom I enjoy sharing the work of uh, working on committees in the interests of Australia, particularly in the area of financial services. But Senator Scar today has made a number of assertions about attempts to hide the facts about what's happening here and why this resolution is before us. Indeed, he said in somewhat of an accusatory tone, which harks back to the division that we don't need uh, along political lines on this issue, he, he declared that the minister would no doubt have had all this information in the incoming brief. Well, for the record, let's be clear that that was not the case. So Senator Scar's arguments cannot stand. I would have hoped that we might have had this debate without harking back to the divisions of previous uh, debates on this particular issue. In fact, I am of the belief that we need to separate the politics of the past on this issue from clouding our minds to what needs to be done to prevent a recurrence of the very issues that ended up in leading Australia to establish this policy. The reality is that while what we're debating today is a routine designation, there's nothing routine about four different ministers failing to get this matter right in the last government. Or perhaps 
That is actually the reveal of what they used to do. There was so much that they got wrong so often. <coughs> and sadly, this was an issue that they failed to deal with in government before they left. So this is the sequence that I just want to put on the record. And I'm sure Senator Scar will review this, and I'm sure he'll be interested in the facts. Uh, Minister Dutton was the, uh, at the time Minister for Home Affairs in January 2021 when his department was first warned about the lapsing instrument. So that was the first signal. The second flare that went up was then Minister Andrews was the Minister for Home Affairs under the Liberal National Party as the Government of Australia in May 2021. Her department was warned a second time about the lapsing instrument with which we're dealing today. There was a third occasion when then Attorney General Senator Cash tabled a report in Parliament herself in May of 2021 warning the instrument had lapsed. But what did any of those three ministers, the now leader of the opposition, Minister Dutton, Minister Andrews, and the former Attorney General, what did any of them do to sort out this issue about which they now pretend to be so outraged? Well, they did nothing. They did nothing. But there was a fourth minister who was involved in this. Well, it was a bit of a secret minister, and that was the self-appointed Minister for Home Affairs, who was also the Prime Minister, Minister Scott Morrison. So the reason we are here and in this position is really the consequence of failed governance by the former government. I want to make it clear to all Australians that regional processing is settled policy. And it was initially recommended, as I said, in the moment after Australians witnessed that incredible loss of life. And things had to change. Now, three people were gathered together to deliver a report to guide the development of a policy to prevent the loss of life at sea and to protect Australia's borders. Now, the first one of those was not only somebody I'm sure that Mr Senator McKim would know, but somebody who is very celebrated by the refugee community, and that is um, the refugee expert Mr Paris Aristotle. His voice was very, very important. His perspective, his advocacy was very important in designing the program. He was also uh, working in concert with Professor Michael Lestrange, and of course, uh, who was then the um, Director of National Security, which is a vital consideration for such a complex and important policy for national security and the protection of life. And they were working alongside the Chief of the Defence Force at the time, Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston. So those three inputs were vital to the development of the policy. And I want to put on the record, so it's clear for people who are just picking up the threads of this now, who weren't paying attention at that time, who might have been 10, but are now 20. That panel was charged with responsibility by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd to make those recommendations about how to best to prevent asylum seekers from travelling to Australia by boat. That was who set this plan in train as a response to our national security and to the international call to protect life. Now, the principal recommendation was the introduction of legislation to support the transfer of people to regional processing arrangements as a matter of urgency, including Nauru. Now, in discussing the declaration of Nauru under the Migration Act in 2012, uh, Minister Chris Bowen uh, at the time said these words. And I think they still ring true for Australians today. He said, we are determined to expose the people smugglers business model for what it is, a ruthless con. <coughs> there is no visa awaiting boat arrivals, no speedy outcome and no special treatment. Now it was reported and widely known, it was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald, and that date was the 3rd of October 2012. Now, that was the establishment of regional processing, and it is the bedrock of Australia's fight against people smuggling and unauthorised arrivals. 
This is a policy that's above all about protecting human lives and ending the business model of cynical criminals. Now, the last thing any Australian wants to see is masses of people drown at sea just to sate the greed of people smugglers. Now, the policy of regional processing is about effective and sensible processing in safe locations in allied countries. And not everyone will agree with that perspective. And it's right that in a democracy a range of voices speak on this issue. But we on the government benches have a duty and responsibility to govern wisely and carefully in ways that do not endanger lives. Now, our policy in 2023 remains unchanged. We supported regional processing in opposition under Prime Minister Abbott. It's a matter of fact. We also reported regional processing in opposition under Prime Minister Turnbull. Labor in opposition supported regional processing under Prime Minister Morrison. And I stand to affirm that we continue to support regional processing while we are in government for the reasons that I have outlined. We support it because it breaks the back of the people smuggling operation. We support it because it ensures orderly and efficient processing of persons arriving by sea. And we support it because fundamentally it stops criminals putting vulnerable people on dangerous boats and it saves those lives. We support regional processing because it stops deaths at sea. I'm not saying it's not a tough policy, but it is a fair policy. And that's why Australians endorse this policy. Under Operation Sovereign Borders, those who've attempt to, who attempt to enter Australia in a dangerous manner will be turned back. The government's been both determined and focused on its conduct and support of Operation Borders because no country, no country, should allow those without a valid visa into their borders without valid processing. And I think this speaks to Australians' sense of fairness that uh, we are a nation of immigrants and that many people are drawn to our shores for the opportunities that we have here in the rich democracy that we get to participate in. And they will welcome more people to come. But the reality is they want that to be done in a very orderly way. I want to be clear about the instrument uh, to which my colleague Minister Watt spoke in some detail uh, about what it does and the considerations that the minister undertook in her uh, production of this resolution and its, and its arrival here before the Senate. Uh, the current designation of Nauru as a regional processing country lapsing, to be clear, has had no impact on the resolution of actions under Operation Sovereign Borders. How did it occur? Well, the lapse occurred due to multiple failures in the Department of Home Affairs, many of which occurred prior to this government taking office. I have outlined four interactions with four former heads of department, uh, ministers, under the previous government. The reality is that the Secretary of the Department of Home Affairs has written to the minister confirming that the department had been asked by this incoming government to confirm that all legal authorities and permissions were in place to underpin Operation Sovereign Borders and that the department, um, and that the department incorrectly, incorrectly assured the minister that all legal authorities and permissions were in place. <coughs> now, the reality is the government, uh, despite that failure from the department, was able to continue operations relating to Nauru using other powers, including the Maritime Powers Act. And in the event of a transfer of a person being required to Nauru and for ongoing funding arrangements under other powers. These facts are vital to make it clear that the contribution of Senator Scar was in fact in error. And I want to conclude my contribution 
uh, this afternoon or this evening by indicating that offshore processing in Nauru ensures that those who make the dangerous and illegal journey to Australia are free in the community and they have access to health care and other essential services. If the health care in Nauru is insufficient to deal with the complex needs of the patient, then we will support evacuation off Nauru for required treatment. People in Nauru are not in detention. They're free to walk about in the community until they're resettled in third, in third countries. And 1,150 individuals have so far taken up that opportunity and have resettled in countries as far away as the US, Canada and New Zealand, among other nations. Labor in government is very committed to continuing a sensible and non-partisan approach. And of course, today we seek the Senate's support by resolution to redesignate re Nauru. As a nation, we have a settled policy. It's working, and it has been working for 10 years to dissuade those who would ply an evil trade in people smuggling. As the, peop as the Prime Minister said clearly in the course of the last election, we need to be strong on borders, but we can do it without being weak on humanity. I urge senators to support this resolution. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak in support of this motion. I have been speaking about the illegal refugees coming to Australia borders since the late 1990s, since my first time in parliament. So I'm not new to this topic at all, and I've been speaking very strongly about it. It's absolutely critical that criminal people smugglers and their customers are sent a very strong message. If you attempt to break our laws and breach our borders, you will never be allowed to settle in Australia. This message can only be backed by maintaining offshore processing of those who do the wrong thing and engage in criminal people smugglers to get them to Australia in a leaky boat. While One Nation strongly supports this motion, we know that Labor's terrible record in deterring people smugglers means it cannot be trusted to keep our borders secure. 50,000 people on more than 800 boats during the Rudd-Gillard governments stand as an appalling testament to this fact. So do the attempts at breaching our borders which occurred last year after Labor won the election. So does the fact that Labor did not move to address this matter in October last year. And to listen to um, Senator O'Neill make reference to the previous government and their three ministers making their comments in this parliament that it was their fault. Well, I'm sorry, didn't Labor win the election in May? This was uh, pointed out in October. It expired in October. This is now January, this is now February 2023, and you've had what? How many months to deal with this? And this is why you are actually scrambling to get this through today because you knew that you over you lost sight of it, and that's the problem with all this. You haven't owned up to it. You're tempted now to still blame the coalition for something that you have failed to do. So I totally agree with what Senator Scar has said. So the fact that this was a matter in October last year, leaving Australia without a clear legal avenue to send people smuggled victims offshore. That was the whole point. So if the boats had come here, people had arrived on our shores, you would have had no place to send them legally, and I'm not a lawyer, but I don't believe you would have had a right to send them to the detention centre in Nauru. You would have had to take them into Australia, which would cause more legal problems. Only by committing to offshore processing in places like Nauru can we arrest the tide of smuggled peoples that would overwhelm our borders. This requires unwavering commitment and, unfortunately, a great deal of Australian taxpayers' money. According to the Australian National Audit Office in 2016, four years' worth of garrison and welfare support in Nauru and Manus Island cost more than $3 billion. So you see, it is in our interest to stop the people smugglers sending out the people here as refugees not genuine refugees, but as economic refugees, because it costs us that amount of money. More than $2.5 billion of this alone went to Transfield Services Australia. 
This was originally an Australian and New Zealand company, however it was taken over by a Spanish company. It is important that we do not use foreign companies to provide these services and ensure Australian taxpayers are only paying local companies for these services. Now, to listen to Senator McKim and his, and his comments about compassionate towards refugees, well, I think it is being compassionate to give a clear message that there is a detention centre. If you get on the boat and you want to come to Australia, well, I'm sorry, you will go into a detention centre because those 1,200 people lost their lives, didn't expect to, to um, die on the waters coming out here. So that is being compassionate to stop people, um, unfortunately, that could possibly lose their lives. Senator Kim also said about the torture on the island and the lack of attention and hospital. The hospitals that has been brought to my attention by security people that work on the island, security guards and others that have worked there, said the hospitals on Nauru are actually a lot better than our own hospitals in Australia. The services they provide is number one. The amount of money that's poured into that country um, has been unbelievable what it's cost the Australian taxpayers. And he talks about what's happened over there. He talks about child abuse, sex abuse, murder, plus many other issues. That is the exact reason why we don't want these people here. Why would we want sex offenders, murderers, child abuse? And a lot of this has been self-inflicted. You see, we had briefings on this, and we're told that these people, in their desperation to get to Australia, because it's all about welfare to settle here, and uh, economic country, economic means, why they want to come here. So they actually harmed their own children, pouring boiling water over them. They ate pebbles and rocks and to actually get over here in Australia for the services required. They actually was rape, and um, <laughs> this is the type of people they were. We couldn't find out their backgrounds. They destroyed their identification. That tells you something about their character, who they are. If they were up front, if they were genuine refugees, they would have told us. These people have had the opportunity to be taken off Nauru, to give them other countries to move to. Guess what? They don't want to go. So they have been given choices. Their choice is they want to stay in Nauru. So for the Greens to actually jump up and down about torture and these poor people and all the rest of it, I wish they would say the same about the people here in Australia. The people that are homeless, the people living on the streets, the people living in their cars with their children, the people that are couch serving on friends wherever they can find a place to sleep that night. I don't hear any of that from the Greens. And they are supposed to be representatives of the Australian people. All they're worried about is refugees that have passed many countries on the way to get out here to Australia. They could have found safe haven wherever they wanted to. But it's all a fact, you know, bleeding bloody hearts, which I'm sick and tired of hearing. Tell me about the real um, people out there in Australia who are struggling and doing it hard. Tell me about the poverty of the children in, this own, in our own country. That's what we need to be talking about. Nauru sends a clear message to these people smugglers and everyone else. Don't think because we're going to shut it down that you can get on your boats and come out here as illegal refugees in this country. And they are illegal. There are ways you actually come here, like the many migrants that have now come here to call this place home and proud of it. You put in an application in other countries and you make your way through the legal channels. Don't think that by paying people smugglers thousands of dollars to come out here is the way to do it and gain the sympathy of some bleeding hearts in this place, because that's not the way and that's not what the people of Australia want. And those people who have been genuine refugees that came out here to Australia and who actually have migrated here back me up in what I say, because they can see They've had to go through the hard channels to get here. They hate these people who want to come out through the back door, and they can't stand members in this place who, who can't see that. It is, um, as I said, um, even though it has lapsed, the fact is that Labor is trying to do something about it and keep it open. 
The cost is horrendous, but I think it would be more cost to Australia if we don't keep it open. What I would like to see is downsizing, ensure that the money is well spent. $240 million is a hell of a lot of money, as far as I'm concerned. It just needs to be ticking over to ensure that we send a clear message out there. If you want to come out here illegally, you'll end up in a detention centre offshore, and it doesn't mean to say you're going to get citizenship in Australia or permanent residency. Thank you very much, Senator Hanson. Senator Pocock. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, is it 90 seconds and then we move on? Uh, Just... It is very, very short indeed, yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Uh, for me, you know, the, the things we've heard from uh, colleagues in here, I think, really just show how polarising this debate is. It's, it's very hard to have a nuanced debate about something like this, which is clearly such an important issue for Australia. It touches on so many things, as we heard, human rights, national security, what we, how we are a good neighbour, uh, a good part of the international community. And the thing that I'm hearing from Canberrans and other people I talk to is that they, they want us to be able to have that debate. If you say that you want a kinder refugee policy, people say, oh, you just want to open the floodgates and let everyone in. Uh, we have to move past that. And you know, we are a resourceful, uh, smart country. We have to look at ways to ensure that we are dealing with refugees in a way that's going to ensure that people aren't dying on boats trying to get here, but that we're also looking after people and, and, and affording them some dignity, people who are desperate and seeking a better life, given what they're facing in their, in their home countries. I think the, the other thing which really makes this debate so important is if we look at uh, the future with climate change, there's clearly going to be a lot more refugees uh, around the world. And Australia is going to have to deal with that. So I really welcome debate about our refugee policy, Thank and I really you, hope we can Pocock. move I'm to a more humane the time policy. For debate has now expired. The question, the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Watt in relation to the designation of the Republic of Nauru be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
The question is that the motion moved by Senator Watt in relation to the designation of the Republic of Nauru be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Pratt teller for the ayes and Senator McKim teller for the noes. There being 39 ayes and 12 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Thank you very much. Senators, Senator Namajimba Price has submitted a proposal understanding order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Is. Is the proposal. Thank you very much. The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Namajima Price. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move the motion. Uh, my motion today is to highlight the ineffective actions of our Prime Minister. My community, my hometown of Alice Springs, has been experiencing a crisis, not just of recent, but for some months now. Senators, excuse me, Senator Namajinda Price. Senators who are not participating in the debate and are intending to leave the chamber, please do so quickly. And those who are staying in the chamber, please keep your comments a little bit quieter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. My hometown has been suffering. The rates of crime have skyrocketed through the roof. My co the community members in my hometown find it difficult to sleep at night with the threat of home invasions. They can't even walk down their street to go shopping on a daily basis because of the threat that looms before them. There are children on the streets of my community all night until the, until the early morning. But this isn't an issue that has come up in recent times. This is an issue that I have been talking about in these chambers since the very day I gave my first speech. And these are issues that not only I've been bringing up in these chambers, but certainly the member for Lingiari in the lower house has been bringing up ever since her first speech as well. Isn't it ironic? Here I am, an Indigenous voice in parliament, and yet what I've been trying to say has fallen on deaf ears when it comes to our Prime Minister. I'd like to remind these chambers, I'd like to remind everyone, Mr President, in this parliament of a tweet from the Prime Minister stating before he was Prime Minister, if I'm Prime Minister, I won't go missing when the going gets tough or pose for photos and then disappear when there's a job to be done. I'll show up, I'll step up and I'll work every day to bring our country together. What an absolute shame on the Prime Minister, given the fact that he turned up in my hometown after the calls, after the calls for months and spent less than four hours on the ground in my home community. He didn't even stay the night to see what was going on in my community. He didn't even stay to see the children on our streets late at night, the children who have largely been neglected and, and not taken care of by their own families, the children that are supposed to be under the care of territory families who have been victims of child sexual abuse, who have been victims of violence and abuse and alcohol-driven abuse within their homes, within the town camps of my community. Mr President, the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton, in October visited my home community because he understood there were serious issues that needed to be understood on the ground. He came. He listened to community members. He listened to vulnerable women and children in my community, which then spurred him to reach out to the Prime Minister to offer a bipartisan approach to, to effectively manage the problems on the ground. He also called for a royal commission into the sexual abuse of Indigenous children. What have we heard from our Prime Minister on this issue? Nothing. Even after his four-hour fly-in, fly-out trip to my hometown of Alice Springs, where the residents are still reeling beside themselves over the fact that they still feel neglected by our Prime Minister. They are furious that he came in, since spent such a short amount of time on the ground did not speak to a community member, did not speak to vulnerable people from town camps, but to those he handpicked himself. It might as well have been a, a, a video conference over teams between the Labor Territory government and the Prime Minister. This is not good enough. This is not good enough. In the Northern Territory, of course, we have 30 per cent of our community is Indigenous. This proposed voice to parliament is not going to represent those voices because our votes in the Territory don't even count in this referendum anyway. How ironic is that? Here I am, a voice in parliament. I suggest I would ask 
that our Prime Minister work better to listen to and grow some ears so that he may actually take action and listen to those voices on the ground who called out for him for so long for help within the Northern Territory. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Thank you. What we are seeing in Alice Springs is absolutely devastatingly heartbreaking. I don't think anybody is suggesting otherwise. And the impact that uh, it will have on you know, some of those people's lives for the longer term will be um, significant. Significant. And sadly, the challenges faced by communities in Central Australia are not, are not new challenges. And more needs to be done to improve community safety and support community members to thrive. What we do know is that when you work with and listen to local communities, you achieve better outcomes. And I am you know, interested to hear Senator Nappinchipper Price talk about listening because I feel like some of the pleas of the communities for the last 10 years have fallen on deaf ears. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced a quarter of a billion dollars in a plan for a better, safer future for Central Australia. This is in addition to the $48 million investment in community safety announced on the 24th of January this year. Next week, the Northern Territory Government will be introducing urgent le legislation to strengthen alcohol restrictions so that town camps and communities will revert to dry zones. These responses will improve community safety invest in health services, invest in families, tackle alcohol-related harm, focus on culture and on-country learning, and provide more opportunities for young people. Critically, this work will be delivered in partnership and by listening to these communities, and not by grandstanding in this place. Listening is absolutely critical. We can agree on that. President, Senator Nappinjipa Price's motion is redundant. She's been talking about it for months. And those on the opposite side would do well to stop playing politics with people's lives. She should be rallying around the Australian and Northern Territory government's package and, and backing it in. She should be working to ensure this package helps the community in the best way possible. There is an obligation on both sides of government to make it work to support the community now and into the future. I'm hearing nothing from the opposite side, nothing about the good work that is being done from First Nations leaders, community members and advocates in Central Australia. I'm hearing nothing from the Senator regarding the resilience of, Australian communities, of Central Australian communities and people. We are still here despite the statistics. The Closing the Gap report continues to publish statistics which show the current policies and initiatives are not leading to successful outcomes for First Nations communities. They're not leading to improvements in areas like social welfare, education, health, social justice and more. And that's just putting it politely. I'm proud to be part of a government who are fully committed to delivering a successful referendum on a voice to parliament in 2023. The voice to parliament is about giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples a say in matters that affect their communities. It's about creating practical and lasting change that will lead to better policies and improve the lives of First Nations people in areas like health, education and housing. As Annie Pat Anderson from the Referendum Committee has said, every day First Nations people don't have the megaphone of politicians. And so we need to give all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities a voice. Whilst the opposition have sought to distract attention from the core purpose of the voice, the Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Minister Linda Burney continue to share information about what the voice is about. Recognition and consultation. Polling shows that the vast majority of First Nations people support the government's proposed voice referendum. An estimated 80 per cent. A voice is what we want and what we need to begin to move forward as a nation to address the gaps for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across our nation. 
First Nations communities across Australia have been working towards the establishment for a voice for very many years. The referendum taking place later on this year is an invitation from First Nations people to each and every Australian. This invitation has been long-standing and directly from First Nations leaders across the country to you, the Australian people, not to politicians. Let's create a better future for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Stewart. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. There is no doubt that what is happening and has been happening for some time in Mapant Way, Alice Springs, is a crisis. It's a crisis that stems from a lack of access to basic human rights, housing, employment, education, health care, land and self-determination. It's a crisis that will not be solved by an intervention 2.0 approach a top-down approach that ignores the dispossession at the heart of the crisis and perpetuates colonial oppression. The solutions must be holistic, self-determined and community-led. First Nations communities know what is needed. The government just hasn't been listening. Communities need funding for housing to address homelessness and overcrowding. Community-led health services are best placed to deliver effective prevention and health promotion programs, mental health services and healing places. Communities need a significant investment in growing the First Nations health and wellbeing workforce that will build capacity within communities for effective prevention and health promotion programs, mental health services and healing places. Communities need access to culturally appropriate childcare, education and employment opportunities. Governments must address the human rights crisis of imprisoning children in this country by raising the age of criminal responsibility. Labor must implement the outstanding recommendations of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody and the Bringing Them Home reports, recommendations that have shamefully sat on the shelf for decades. We welcome the funding commitment to the Tungajira Women's Council for Education Work, but communities need long-term, ample funding for frontline women's safety services and urgent progress on a standalone First Nations plan to end violence against women and children that is designed and implemented by First Nations women. And of course, we must progress truth-telling and treaty to start to heal this country and a voice to ensure that First Nations people are driving the solutions. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Little. Thank you. Thank you. I rise to speak to the emergency motion by Senator Nampajibba Price. I speak on this from the following informed context. I was born and raised in Alice Springs and many immediate family members still live in and around the township and both my parents are traditional owners of Central Australia. As a South Australian senator for Anangu Pijinjara Yungajara people who live remotely on the APY lands, which is in South Australia. Alice Springs is the closest major regional town. Visiting Alice Springs affects them. As a member of the Joint Standing Committee late last year, I heard the harrowing evidence given in Darwin and Alice Springs. I have directly been responsible for successfully transitioning more than 1,000 Indigenous people into the private sector for work, many directly from welfare. You can't get a job, run a business, function with any confidence amongst that chaos, and the chaos has been piled on in the last seven months. So it's from that perspective I highlight the failure of the Prime Minister to address the serious alcohol-related crime across the Northern Territory and outline the real devastating and life-changing impact of allowing the Stronger Futures legislation to lapse, and failing to act earlier when the disaster unfolding became even clearer. When the sad images, the evidence and the voices became impossible to ignore because the national media turned its attention to Alice Springs, the Prime Minister had already wasted seven months blaming and waiting for others to act when he could have acted. The mistake of ending Stronger Futures did this. He could have used his powers under the Constitution, and we know it's not shy about fast-tracking legislation when it wants to. The Northern Territory government refused to act, and this government didn't want to until the tide of evidence and the public opinion was against them. There was a 54 per cent jump in alcohol-related assault in the past year in Alice Springs and a 34 per cent rise in the same period in Catherine. In Alice Springs, 
House break-ins rose 22.56 per cent, commercial break-ins were up 55 per cent, motor vehicle theft up 31 per cent, property damage jumped by 59 per cent, there was a road toll spike of 50 per cent in the year across the Northern Territory. At a time when this Labor government tells us the cost of living is the most important issue for Australians, they continually failed to act as Central Australians repaired broken windows and smashed property over and over and over again. Now let's talk about the smashed lives. As this escalated, insurance premiums skyrocketed. They rose 50 per cent over that same time. Businesses closed, long-term locals left, and tourists stopped coming, and businesses closed their doors. All this while grappling with the cost of living. Although his, the Prime Minister took his own plane for that four-hour trip, the commercial flights to the nation centre have many, many cheap and empty seats. Go and have a look. There's a massive economic toll as a consequence of inaction. So there's people affected because they have alcohol addiction and binge issues. There are those whose lives are tragically shattered and disrupted by antisocial and unlawful actions. And there are those that are impacted by alcohol. They're not all Aboriginal people. But those that drink to excess commonly have blood alcohol levels of 0.4. And in fact, the doctor at the local hospital told us that in his entire life, he has never seen a hospital where the police drop off more people than the ambulance. Innocent people, women, children and the elderly who bear the brunt of such antisocial behaviour, violence and intimidation are affected the most, and you had plenty of warning. The immediate and cumulative individual, family and community impact is devastating. So this week we hear there's a reset so that a proper transition plan can be put in place to allow communities an order orderly decision-making process to determine if they remain dry communities or not. You were told that. There's $250 million allocated now for programs. But as I said in my first speech in this chamber in July this year, money is not the only answer. The pretenders, controllers and rescuers need to be nowhere near this new money, and the public servants need to be more accountable for the programs they deliver, and politicians, all of us, need to be more accountable for the money that's spent. This is not about voice. This is about listening to those voices that told you this Thank was going to happen. Thank you, Senator Little. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. A few hours in Alice Springs, just enough time for a photo op and a hastily arranged press conference. But a few days at the tennis, though, plenty of time to watch the men's semi-final, then the women's final, and don't forget the men's final after that. Now tell me again how committed the Prime Minister is to helping Indigenous Australians. Probably not that much. A crime wave in Alice Springs. Whatever. Children roaming the streets at 2 a.m. because they're too scared to go home. Whatever. But how good was Novak Djokovic, though Prime Minister? How good was he? Now a few hours in Alice Springs, but a few days at the tennis. That tells you everything you need to know about how committed this Labor government is to helping Indigenous Australians. Give us a wave, the Melbourne Park crowd yelled as the Prime Minister happily obliged. He waved to the crowd, laughed all around, a bit of a hoot. Now that's all that this Prime Minister is good for, a wave. Give us a solution to the crime wave in Alice Springs. How's about that, Mr Albanese? Give us a solution to the wave of suffering, Mr Albanese. Give us a solution to the wave of school truancy in Indigenous communities, Mr Albanese. Nothing. Nil. Nada. Signalling to the crowd is where the Prime Minister excel. He's good for a wave, a gesture, a sleight of hand, but with no substance behind it. He ignores the voices of Indigenous leaders like Senator Jacinta Price, all the while claiming that we need to listen to Indigenous people. A few hours in Alice Springs, a few days at the tennis. Now, Indigenous people in this country, they deserve much, much better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babbitt. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I thank the Senator for bringing on the matter uh, for urgency in regards to Alice Springs uh, and in regards to Central Australia. 
this is certainly a, an issue that does hit at the heart uh, very personally, and I do understand deeply uh, the concerns of the senators opposite. But I'm also more concerned as well in regards to the families uh, in Central Australia and the businesses uh, in regards to Alice Springs. Uh, there is no doubt uh, there has been deep trauma and continues to be, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, in terms of what people see as their future and what kind of future they can have uh, in Alice Springs and in Central Australia. Now, there is no doubt uh, there is a lot of anger and there is a lot of hurt, but we have moved to ensure that there is a circuit breaker and that there is change. And this is really critical. It's critical because people cannot take it if we do not do more. And that is why working with Congress, with Tungandjira, with SNAKE, with the hospital, with the police, with the Families and Children's Services, with the Northern Territory Government, and yes, there is no doubt that there are decisions that they needed to rethink and redo. But we are enormously pleased that those bans in terms of the communities across the Northern Territory and in terms of Alice Springs itself will be back in force as of Wednesday next week, once the Northern Territory Assembly does sit and pass the amendments that is required under the Northern Territory legislation. But it is people like Marion Scringer, the member for Lingiari, and of course Senator Nampajimpa Price, who raised it in their opening speeches here. We know in the Northern Territory from the intervention in 2007 that there is also a concern with Aboriginal communities right across the Territory and not just Central Australia. And this has been something that I've also struggled deeply with and continue to do so, but will no doubt ensure with the $250 million that we've said must go into the areas, not just alcohol, but the areas that hit at the deep cause of what is the problem. The health system, looking at fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, the hospital system that requires the assistance to protect our women and children. And we know that through the youth and the programs that we put together uh, through the funding has to work, Mr Acting Deputy President. And as for those businesses in Alice Springs, there is no doubt that the pain you have suffered and continue to in terms of your own economic future has resonated greatly, not just here across the parliament but across the country. But this is the turning point, and I say this to the residents and the families of Alice Springs and Central Australia, this is the turning point of this parliament. We're no more. No more do we want to see the pain and suffering that we have witnessed to extreme levels in the past month, but even more personally amongst those families in the town camps around Alice Springs. No more. Enough. We do accept that we have the responsibility here to make things better, and we take that responsibility on board very seriously. I'm enormously grateful to be able to stand beside Marion Scrimger, Linda Burney, Patrick Dodson, and know that we are doing everything we possibly can in terms of the federal jurisdiction not to intervene as they did in 2007, but to ensure the accountability and governance that should occur by a Territory Parliament to do what it needs to do. And I look forward to the Northern Territory Parliament doing that next week. But in the meantime, we are going to ensure that those families on the ground, Mr Acting Deputy President, do feel safe and do feel that we care and that things will turn around for the better and that instead of despair and instead of trauma, that they have hope for the future. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I support Senator Nampajimpa Price's motion before the Senate today and 
Note that if this had been a natural disaster, the Prime Minister would have been on the first VIP plane out of Canberra to get his feet on the ground to assess the damage and offer comfort and solution and a big bucket of cash to affected communities. But because it was a national shame, a national disgrace, a crisis occurring far away from uh, capital cities, far away from the tennis and cricket, far away from his summer break, he had to be shamed. Shamed by the senators I'm proud to stand with, and I acknowledge both of the strong female voices here from Central Australia. Senator Nampajimpa Price, a former deputy um, mayor of Alice Springs, and Senator Karen Little, whose country uh, and family roots go back to Central Australia and Alice Springs in particular, to tell their lived experience and the lived experience of their families and their communities. And they've been doing it from the day they both got here. And let's count that back. In excess of eight months you've heard this and you did nothing and you knew the Stronger Futures legislation was lapsing and you knew the NT government had nothing in place because you guys, like your decisions on the cashless debit card, think they were racist policies. That's why you did nothing and you're actually shamed into doing it. I think it is an absolute indictment uh, on this Labor government that purports to support Indigenous uh, Australians. I'm very proud to have been the minister responsible. One of the best things that happened in my career was to be appointed uh, regional development minister under Malcolm Turnbull and to have negotiated the Barclay Regional Deal with then Chief Minister Gunner and the Barclay Regional Council. A two-year-old's rape in Tennant Creek made our government say, you know what? The, fund, the record funding into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs in this country at a state, territory, federal, community level is not working when we live in a country like ours and there are children getting raped every night. It was one of my proudest days, $78.4 million across 28 separate measures, um, cultural uh, and social and economic. And one of the great indictments, I guess, and again, it is the NT Territory Labor government's failure. When I spoke to my department and people, stakeholders on the ground, what was actually going to be the game changer? Is it another skate park? Is it this? You know, no. It was actually going to be to map the services from different levels of government and the private sector and charities going into that community and find the gaps, so the kids stop falling through the, those gaps. And I'm standing here with the report card of the Barclay Regional Deal Implementation Plan. And of the 28 measures, most of them are implemented. In fact, all of them are implemented except the government investment and service system reform, where we actually work in partnership between federal and territory government, so we focus on the actual people. Five years later, we haven't got it together and that lays at the feet of the Gunner government. I would call on the Labor Party to support an election commitment we made in Alice at the Yipurinya Aboriginal School. Fantastic young principal, Gavin Morris, proud Indigenous man, great NRL guy, uh, teacher sport. They all love him. This is a school that teaches in language, four local languages, including Walpuri and Arunda. We promise $8.3 million to build a student accommodation facility there, because these kids come in from town camps. It's a two-way, one-way trip, one trip, and even back then, this principal was telling us he needed to provide secure accommodation for his kids so that they could stay safely and continue to learn during the learning week, if they so chose to. Labor Party didn't support that uh, election commitment. We knew what was going on. We knew you knew and you did nothing about it, and you had been shamed into making the NT government come to the table. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Namajimba Price be agreed to.
Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator McKim, which is also shown at item 12 in today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the, clock, the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Hanson Young. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak in favour of the motion we have before us. The Australian government has taken a big step to agree, alongside other nations, to halt extinction right around the world, to protect our environment and to look after our oceans. At the end of last year, at the Montreal COP Biodiversity Framework COP15 meeting, Australia participated in goodwill alongside all the other nations. Australia signed up to these agreements. We had diplomats there. People spent time debating proposals and clauses line after line after line. The detail, the meticulous detail and effort that was put into these agreements was extraordinary. I'd like to say thank you all to all those public servants who put in so much effort. But none of this will mean dot, Mr Acting Deputy President, until we start actually protecting the environment we have back here in Australia. You can't say one thing in Montreal and come home and do another thing here in Australia. If we really genuinely are serious about halting the crisis that faces biodiversity globally and here in Australia, we have to stop destroying our forests, we have to stop destroying our critical habitat, and we have to start protecting those very precious places that makes our country one of the most beautiful places on earth. It is madness, Mr Acting Deputy President, that we live in a country in, two, in 2023 that allows the destruction of our ancient native forests. It's not just madness, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's criminal that it is subsidised by the taxes of Australian taxpayers. It is heartbreaking to see these ancient forests destroyed simply because year after year after year, election after election after election, no government has been willing to stand up and say no. Our forests need to be protected. Our ancient forests need to be protected. And when we're facing this huge crisis of global warming and biodiversity, we actually need to protect the little that we have left. The commitments that Australia signed at this COP15, the biodiversity, the world's largest global pact on protecting nature, was that we would protect 30 per cent of land and 30 per cent of ocean, and that we would make sure there was no more extinctions past 2030. I mean, frankly, I think we should be able to say there should be no more extinctions of species from today. We have already lost too many of our native animals. We've already lost too many of our native species here in Australia, and we should be doing everything we can to protect them. I mean, it is just shameful that we are facing a situation where our iconic koala is about to become extinct because we continue to destroy their homes. The Tassie devil, the lead peter's possum, the Australian sea lion in my home state in South Australia. These animals need protection. And you can only stop their extinction if you stop destroying their homes. And you know it costs money to destroy their homes. Australian taxpayers are forking out 
the money to allow the logging to continue in our native forests. It is shameful. It's economically reckless and it is environmentally criminal. It would save the Australian taxpayer money if we banned native forest logging today. Save them money. And while the government talks about environmental reforms and changes to environmental laws down the track coming soon, there is one key thing missing, Mr Acting Deputy President, and that is a ban on native forest logging in this country. And that is shameful. Thank you, Senator Hans and Young. Can I ask that you move your motion? It's not necessary to make your speech again, but I would like I would like to I would like to move the motion, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I look forward to other members in this place supporting it. Thank you very much, Senator Hans and Young. Sen Senator Rennick, I meant that in good nature. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm so pleased to be given this opportunity today to rise to speak to this motion. Because if there is one thing that I am incredibly passionate about, it is the environment and biodiversity. And I just don't talk the talk, I walk the walk. When I was a young lad, I quit my job when 23. I got on a plane and I went overseas. I had six months in Africa. I went to see the gorillas in the mist. I climbed Kilimanjaro. I went to see the Serengeti. Uh, likewise, I spent another seven years overseas where I got and climbed you know, Mount Blanc, Annapurna, those places. Uh, and saw lots of wildlife across the world. So I'm very, very passionate about protecting our biodiversity, especially here in Australia, where we do have a lot of marginal country. And I grew up on a property in Western Queensland, where, ironically enough, I have actually seen the mulga wipe out the Mitchell grass. And I know what feral pests do to this country. I know what uh, you can have. Um, brain snap here. Uh, you can have too many um, wild cats. For example, and pigs. And you know, when I was a young lad, I don't have a gun license anymore. But we used to go and shoot the pigs because they used to create wallows. The cats were there's you know feral cats are a real problem in this country. Um, but I can assure you that it is very difficult to keep control of that if you let the mulga run wild out in Western Queensland. And you know, there's photos of our property back in the early uh, 50s and 60s where it was all open grassland. And today, because we're not allowed to push. Uh, that the mulga has taken off. And one of these days they'll drop a match in there and the place will just burn. And if you're worried about protecting koalas and things like that, you don't want bushfires going on out there. It won't take off like the uh, gum trees and eucalypts will because it's kasha, but you know, fires have happened out there in the past. But I'm glad Sarah Hans uh, Senator uh, Hanson Young uh, raised the issue of koalas because to sit here and talk about the impact that coal mines and logging will have and not talk about the destruction of renewables uh, is completely uh, one-sided and hypocritical because our koalas will be under threat from the construction of up to 28,000 kilometres of transmission lines that have to be built to connect the power from all of these isolated remote renewable, renewable um, energy projects. And I should say that that property in Western Queensland, we had solar panels out there in the late 80s. So I'm not anti you know, using solar panels or whatever at the end of the grid, uh, but it'll never work on an industrial scale, I can assure you of that. And then we should talk about the sea lines, because we've just seen the case in New Jersey where they're doing seis seismic testing in the ocean off New Jersey, and we've got a lot of beach whales as a result of that seismic testing. Now, you know, only the Greens and Labor could come up with some sort of uh, mechanical energy instrument that will kill above the water bats and birds, okay, B especially bats, which are one of our key pollinators, and then be a threat to our sea life underneath the water. And it's not just the actual wind turbines that are going to cause problem. These wind turbines are coated in bisphenol A. Now, one litre of that will pollute up to 50 million litres of water. Right? So we don't know what the impact of this stuff is going to be. They're going to have to make sure there's proper regulations when they put these wind turbines out in the ocean that this bisphenol doesn't melt or decay away uh, and end up polluting our oceans. So, so you know, in terms of the renewables, they are a serious threat to our biodiversity. And then, of course, we come back to the batteries. Okay? These are built from rare earth metals. Now, technically speaking, they're not that rare in the earth's crust, 
but they are very, very um, fine in the sense that you've got to actually mine so many tonnes of ore just to get one tonne of metal. So with lithium, for example, on average, that, that grades between one to two per cent of ore. So you've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore just to get one or two tonnes of lithium. And then on top of that, you've then got the stripping ratio where you've got to go round and round and round to get to the ore. You don't just drive those big trucks down at a very steep angle. So that, the, the, the footprint of solar panels and rare earth mining on our biodiversity is going to have a massive impact uh, on, on the potential um, you know, animals going forward, not, not to men mention the actual CO2 emissions that are going to be used in actually getting this stuff out of the ground. So uh, I think that before we uh, start turning off our coal-powered uh, coal fire stations, which, by the way, you know, the CO2 that comes from that actually is plant food. I mean, what better way to recycle energy than through the natural process of photosynthesis, something that I would have thought most of you would have understood because it was taught in grade eight science. Uh, so I Thank say, you. let's you, back Senator coal. Rennick. It's been Thank you, good. Senator Rennick. Senator Gr Grogan. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, that was quite a fascinating contribution. Um, I'm not sure where to start with it. So, um, I rise to address the urgency motion put forward by Senator McKim um, regarding the need to end native forest logging. I am proud to be part of a Labor government uh, that's committed to, a stro to strong action on the climate to actually addressing some of the degradation that we've seen over the last decade and more, and to working towards Australia being the country that shows the rest of the world how to build a balanced energy system to protect the environment and to actually plan for the future, a future that is a net zero future. Now, we have um, in December 2022, as was referenced by Senator Hanson Young, um, agreed to some targets uh, at the Biodiversity uh, COP15. And we also have a very significant agenda to protect the environment, known as the Nature Positive Plan, which will halt environmental decline and repair the damage that has already been done by the former government over the last long, painful 10 years. If you remember the damning 2020 State of the Environment report, it was hidden, probably on top of the fire hose and underneath the pile of ministerial uh, appointments. The, it, the way that the environment has been ignored the way that the emissions challenge we have in front of us has been just swept to the side is awful. But in eight short months, this Labor government, this Albanese Labor government, has made significant inroads into trying to turn that around. We have seen so many changes that really are going to get us on the track to put ourselves in a position to be the renewable energy country of the future, which is what we want to be. And we must protect our environment along the way. And we must put it as a priority, which is what we believe that we have done here. So after that wasted decade, what we are doing in terms of the environment includes our plan for rewiring the nation so that renewable energy is able to be appropriately dispatched across the grid. We will have cheaper and cleaner power. We are looking at a nature positive plan to rewrite our, nature, our national environmental laws, which many of us are well aware have been broken for so long. We have a plan for zero new extinctions for this continent. We have a new nature repair market. We are legislating to protect the ozone layer, doubling the number of indigenous rangers, protecting indigenous cultural heritage in true partnership with First Nations groups, reducing waste, building a more circular economy, campaigning on the world stage to protect our oceans, support biodiversity and fight for a plastic-free ocean. 
We've already, in those eight months, passed legislation targeting 43 per cent emissions cuts by 2030, and we're, committing to reach, we're committed to reaching 82 per cent renewables by 2030. We've had the Chubb review that found that land clearing accounted for a significant share of our national emissions and recommended no new project registrations to be allocated under that avoided deforestation method. And it also recommended that we look at developing new methods that actually incentivise the maintenance of native vegetation that has the potential to be a forest and maintain those existing forests. We've accepted this. We've accepted this recommendation. And our safeguard mechanism will reduce emissions of our largest emitters. New projects will need to meet specific requirements, including rigorous environmental checks and adherence to the reforms that we've made to the safeguard mechanism that we're in the process of making. These reforms are important to limit Australia's carbon emissions. The reforms have received significant support from business, from industry, from environmental groups. This is going to make a fundamental difference. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. At COP15 last year, we saw on the global stage the urgent need to halt and reverse environmental decline. It was made clear at the conference, it was agreed to, and we saw the government reaffirm their commitment to halting extinction. What we need now is action. We, we don't need more plans to make plans. The thing that we have to get on with is to stop destroying areas of the environment with the highest biological value. Continuing to log native forests doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make environmental sense, and it certainly doesn't make economic sense. Vic Forests lost $54 million last year, and that's on top of a loss over many of the past years, and it's just taken out a loan from Victorian taxpayers payers for $80 million. The East Gippsland Forest Management Area, the largest in Victoria, is uneconomic for logging and has been classified as non-commercial for more than a decade. But taxpayers are still subsidising logging in these areas, areas that contain these threatened and endangered species that we're supposedly trying to save. So let's, let's act. We've had scientists tell us for decades what we need to do. When you're in a hole, you stop digging. And that's, that's the first step. We have to stop native forest logging in this country. It's no longer good for our communities or for our future. Yes, the timber industry is needed to provide the materials we need for buildings, but that can and should come from plantation forestry. In southeast New South Wales, Frontier economics analysis shows that the plantation industry is worth 160 times the native forest sector and employs far more people. The economic benefit from native forests is now in other industries. We have to start to move on. We have to have more imagination for these, these communities that have been logging towns for many years. You know, to go to the, the central highlands, the value of water and tourism to regional GDP is 25.5 times and 20 times the value of the timber and wood chips. The best way to meet and go beyond the 43% by 2030 and net zero by 2050 is to stop cutting down one of the best carbon storage technologies we have. We need to stop cutting down native forests. We can have better outcomes for jobs, income generation, and avoidance of loss making that's eventually paid by the tax, taxpayer by exiting native forest logging as soon as possible. We can invest in logging towns to set them up for the future. It's possible. It's been dealt, done elsewhere. The longer we go down this, this road, the worse it is for these towns who could potentially be entering into the carbon market, tourism, 
the worse it is for all these threatened species that are not just threatened from loss of habitat, things like lead beaters, possum, greater gliders, but we know as we move into a warming climate, many of them are very heat sensitive and we need to ensure that there are as big areas of land as possible for them to move and to, to be able to deal with the change in climate. So I really implore the government. I thank them for their commitment, but it has to be backed up. It has to be backed up with investment. We know that this is going to cost money, but it's worth it. We're investing in nature. We're investing in our future, and we're part of nature. If nature goes down, we, we go down with it. Um, there's, no, uh, you know, there's, there's no standing out, out, outside of it. So I really implore the government with the upcoming budget, invest in nature, make good on your promise, because Australians and future generations of Australians are relying on you. And when it comes to native forest logging, have the courage and have the imagination to bring forward the exit from native forest logging. Bring forward the exit to a new economy, good jobs in other industries for these towns in regional areas. Senator Green. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the contributions to this motion. Um, I, I appreciate everyone comes uh, to this debate with a, a love for our beautiful country and our beautiful environment. And um, I am certainly one of those people, not only because I live in one of the most beautiful parts of our country, but because I'm very privileged to be the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef and, and get to experience all of the really important work that's going on there uh, in the water, but also in the catchments. And um, I just wanted to touch on a few of the issues that have been raised, and particularly around uh, commitments that have been made um, to the international community uh, and through COP15 particularly. Uh, I, I think I... Um, uh, share sentiments of many people in the public that are just incredibly proud of the work that our government and our ministers have been doing on the international stage to return this country to the negotiating table. Um, we certainly were uh, at a position where our reputation under the former government had been um, destroyed uh, and our credibility on climate and on the environment um, had been completely um, uh, was in complete tatters, and what our ministers um, have been able to do in various um, conferences of the parties um, across the last few months is to restore Australia's reputation, and we did that by making sure that Australia was leading from the front, campaigning for strong targets and clear measurements of progress, and by doing so, we've managed to ensure that for the first time ever. We have a global agreement to protect 30 per cent of the world's land and 30 per cent of the world's oceans by 2030. And that is an incredible achievement and something that I think, particularly our Minister for the Environment, should be incredibly proud of. To go and to restore Australia in such a short amount of time to that level of respect and ambition. Uh, now these um, these targets um, are something for us to strive for, and we are doing the work to make sure that we have policies to achieve a nature-positive planet. We have ensured that our um, nature-positive plan to rewrite our national environmental laws is front and centre of our environmental policy in this early part of our government. I know that after 10 years, people in this sector and people who care about the environment are really eager to get on with the job. I know, as many people in this chamber understand, that the Samuel Review under the former government sat there gathering dust. And so I know there is an urgency felt by many people in this place. But can I assure you that this work is happening? It is happening and we are moving forward to make sure that we have national environment laws that protect our forests, protect our threatened species, protect our Great Barrier Reef and protect the jobs that rely on many of these places. We are delivering a plan for zero new extinctions on this continent. We are legislating to protect the ozone layer. We are delivering a commitment to protecting 30 per cent of Australia's land and oceans by 2030. 
And we're also backing this up by funding. There's $1.2 billion for the reef in the last budget alone. We are funding to save native species, to employ land care rangers, to expand Indigenous protected areas and to protect in, um, against invasive species. Um, to say that we are not funding this important work um, couldn't be further from the truth. But this obviously gives me an opportunity to talk about um, where we've come from and what we're up against in this country. And we know that there is a clear difference between this government and what we're doing on climate and what we're doing on the environment compared to those on the other side of the chamber. Because it is very important that people in this place understand that the um, Liberal National Government, when it came to energy on climate, destroyed and delayed 22 failed energy policies. They didn't land a single one. They vetoed renewable energy projects that would have created regional jobs. They hid energy prices until after the election. They joked about Pacific Island neighbours going underwater and they sat on the Samuel Review. And they haven't changed. Now they're in opposition. In opposition, our friends on the other side of the chamber, the LNP, have uh, voted against emissions reductions targets, voted against the electric vehicle legislation, voted against cost of living relief for working families on energy, and they, have vote, they will vote against safeguard mechanisms. They continue to ignore the science. It is 2023 out there, but when it comes to the opposition, it's still 20, 2003. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I really welcome Minister Plibersek's commitment at the Biodiversity COP15 to zero extinctions by 2030. But the government now needs to act to make this commitment real. And critically, the government needs to act to end native forest logging immediately. I've only got five minutes, so I'm just going to focus on one species that we must protect from going extinct, and that's the Leadbeater's possum, or Wallert. Wallert live in the tall mountain ash forests in Victoria, just east of Melbourne. They are critically endangered. And the mountain ash ecosystem they live in is critically endangered. And they are the most carbon dense forests in the world. The threats to Wallert and mountain ash are logging, fires, and increased fires due to climate change. I want to quote the experts in this speech, the scientists who know these Leadbeater's possums, who have been studying them for over 30 years, and that's the scientists from the Fenner School of Environment at the Australian National University. They did a review of Leadbeater's possum in 2017, which summarised that the retention and recruitment of hollow-bearing trees is the single most important issue for managing Leadbeater's possum and many other threatened species, and that the key habitat resource for Leadbeater's possums, populations of higher bearing trees are in rapid decline, and with them Leadbeater's possum is also declining. I mean, Wallet had a recovery plan which would lay out what the actions that needed to, hap needed to happen to stop them from going extinct. It had a recovery plan between 1998 and 2002. It hasn't had one since. And why? because of pressure from the logging industry to keep logging the forests that they live in. Every estimate that I, since I've been in the Senate, and that's now eight and a half years, I've been asking about when are we going to see a recovery plan for Leadbeater's possums. There was a draft recovery plan which was released in 2017. It has yet to be finalised. At estimates last October, I asked again, I got the same lame response. Oh, the Leadbeater's possum remains a priority species. Minister Plibersek has asked the department to give it urgent focus, and we are looking to finalise the recovery plan as soon as possible. Um, Minister Plibersek, if you are listening, if you are serious about zero extinctions, there is one action that needs to be taken, which basically is what the recovery plan should summarise, and that that is that we need to end the native forest logging. We need to end the logging of their habitat. We need to end that logging immediately. The ANU review that was done six years ago noted that um, the current prescriptions are insufficient for the long-term conservation of species. The majority of hollow-bearing trees are not covered by these prescriptions, and that current logging and regeneration prescriptions do not provide adequate protection for existing hollow-bearing trees. 
and they note how, for the first time, the recovery of a, protected, of a threatened species, because we don't have a recovery plan, because what's happening is being guided by Vic Forests in the, and the Victorian government, they noted for the first time the recovery of a threatened species was tied directly to the maintenance of an extractive industry. And the recommendations pursue, um, pursue, advise pursuing a range of um, actions based on unproven recovery measures, while prescriptions likely to be effective in protecting hollow-bearing trees were ignored. They noted that the majority of science conducted by state government departments and on Leadbeater's Possum and the resulting reports generally lack peer review. And yet here we've got mountain ash forests who have just got so much to offer in terms of tourism, abundant clean water, carbon storage, recreational activities, biodiversity, but the logging is ongoing. Except, however, over the last summer, because, because of successful court action by community groups showing that Vic Forest has been logging illegally, the logging has stopped. And the logging, which has been driven by the Maryvale Pulp and Paper Mill for the production of paper pulp, has stopped. And in fact, it looks like it might stop forever, where uh, media reports in the last days have said that state government and union sources expect um, Nip and Paper Group to permanently discontinue production of office paper. So the time is now. The time is now to be protecting our native forest, to shift our timber industry to 100 per cent um, plantations rather than the existing 90 per cent, and to be protecting our precious native forests for everyone. Thank you, Senator Rice. I intend to put the question. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. A division required? Division is required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the, the chair is that the question the question before the chair is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. Noes to the left of the chair. I appoint a teller for the ayes, Senator McKim. And teller for the noes, Senator Askew. Senators, there being 13 ayes and 27 noes, it's passed in the negative. Senator Still John, uh, you seek the call? Yes, I, I do seek the call, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, to do a couple of things. First, I seek leave to take note um, of item number seven on page five. Uh, I was, uh, I was referring. I'll, I'll call on documents. I was, I was on the understanding uh, that you might wish to do something uh, else. Tabling a non-conforming petition. Indeed, I am. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, in de Deputy President, yes. Uh, yes. So I would seek leave to table a non-conforming petition in relation to uh, the circumstances of Majid Kajimi. Uh, under execution in Iran. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I table the petition. Thank you. <laughs> We've now come. I, now sh I, I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on pages five to nine of today's order of business. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, I uh, seek leave to take note of item number uh, seven on page five, document number ten, on expansion of telehealth services, uh, the performance audit, and to uh, continue my remarks. Thank you. Senator McAllister. I wish to speak to document 27, but I'm conscious that this is a, sometimes a period in the chamber when we uh, well, Minister, perhaps I'll give you the call. I'd like to hear from the whips about first, which, which ones that are going to be Deputy effectively President. leave to continue remarks. I'll go for Senator Askew first. So I just seek to take note of item number 45 on the Productivity Commission report number 99 and seek leave to continue our remarks. That's leave all. granted. Leave is granted. Uh, Senator McAllister. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, I, I rise to take note of document 27, uh, which is the annual climate change statement 2022. Um, well, this morning, uh, as we always do, we acknowledged the traditional owners of the land on which this parliament meets, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. First Nations people have lived on and cared for this country for over 60,000 years. Their knowledge and leadership will play an important role in our nation's response to climate change. In May last year, Labor was elected by the Australian people 
to lead this country, and in September we passed the Climate Change Bill through the Parliament. In December, the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen, delivered our government's first annual climate change statement to Parliament. And let there be no doubt. This government is committed to taking action on climate change, and in the last nine months, this government has done more than those opposite did in their wasted decade of denial and delay. And despite what some in this chamber might believe and advocate, climate change is no longer an issue for debate or discussion. The science is settled, and increasingly communities are living it. Last year, the floods across New South Wales and Victoria and the recent flood in Western Australia had an ongoing and sobering reminder of climate change and the impact that it can have and that it is likely to have on community. The 2022 State of the Climate report showed an increase in extreme heat events, increases in intense heavy rainfall, longer fire seasons and sea level rise. And yet, in the face of clear evidence, the former government refused and failed to act for a decade. During the black summer bushfires, as Australians were fleeing their homes, the former Prime Minister made his position clear with the now infamous words, I don't hold a hose. Well, that lack of accountability saw communities across the nation speak out. Emergency service leaders raised the alarm for an urgent government response. Student leaders took to the streets. The communities at the front of this crisis told their stories. And Labor consistently stood up for those that were worst impacted so that they had a choice when it came to selecting the members in this parliament. And last May, after 10 long years of climate chaos, Australians took to the ballot box and said that this is enough. And they gave our government a mandate to make significant change. After a decade of inaction, we know that this change must be clear and strong and directional. And as Minister Bowen said in his speech, not acting would be an unforgivable act of intergenerational negligence. All Australians care about preserving our planet for future generations. They want to play their part in, clean, in creating a cleaner and more sustainable world. Our government wants to make it accessible and affordable for Australians to reduce their emissions. We don't want to give them the certainty to invest in a greener future, and it's why we're building a national electric vehicle charging network and cutting taxes on electric vehicles so that you can buy an electric vehicle and now you'll have a place to charge it. We've committed $224.3 million for community batteries so that up to 100,000 Australian households can access clean, reliable energy when they need it. And you shouldn't need to own a house to make use of solar panels, so we've committed to community solar banks for 25,000 Australians living in apartments, rentals and low-income households. We want families, small businesses to have a choice, to have a choice when it comes to the ways that they reduce their power bills. And energy performance will be key to this. We want to empower community members and businesses to consider their use of energy through our national energy performance strategy. Deputy President, this is an important issue. It's one I know that this chamber will have the opportunity to debate through legislation, through debates, through questions throughout the rest of this year. But I want to say this very clearly to people listening. The climate wars were very, very bad for Australians, their businesses, their communities. We cannot afford to go back to a situation where some people seek to make perfect the enemy of the good and others seek no action whatsoever. It is time for us to take a step forward, confidently understanding the opportunities that will arise for Australian communities and for Australians themselves as we move into a lower carbon economy. It's time to cut our emissions. It's time to embrace the opportunities of the future, and this government is determined to do so. So, do you seek leave to continue your remarks at all? I do, Deputy President. Thank you. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Of the last asking, does anyone wish to speak on any documents presented by the President, Auditor General's reports, documents in response to orders for production of documents, government documents? and documents pursuant to continuing orders. If no one wishes to speak, I will then move to reports and government responses. Senator Askew. 
Could I just take note and seek leave to continue remarks in relation to number 58 on autism? Select committee. Thank you. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Shikani. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Um, I'd like to present additional information re received by the Education Employment Legislation Committee as listed at item 14 on today's order of business. Um, further to that, Deputy President, um, on behalf of the Chair of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, uh, Nita Green, I present the report of the Committee on the 2022-23 Budget Estimates. Deputy President, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Treaties, I present the Committee's 203rd report. Thank you for that, Government Whip. We're now in uh, reports and Government responses. Senator Stilljohn, I think, wants to call, and then I'll come to you, Senator Chan. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to take note of item 67 on page 10, the FADT uh, Committee's Human Rights Implication of the Violence in Iran report. I'm speaking to the report uh, from the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee um, about the human rights implication in the violence, uh, of the violence occurring in Iran, uh, both uh, with a heavy heart in the full knowledge that this violent continue, violence continues, uh, and also uh, filled with pride, having heard uh, so convincingly and in such great numbers uh, from the many community members of the Iranian diaspora and many other communities who gave evidence uh, to the committee. The Greens support all recommendations of the report. However, we do think that the report did not speak loudly enough about the incredibly slow response uh, of the Australian government, particularly in regards to sanctions. I am uh, here this evening as the proud uh, political sponsor of one Majid Kazimi. Uh, Majid uh, will continue his call uh, for freedom uh, and for justice for all of the peoples of Iran, and he does so alongside many other members of the community who are right now imprisoned by the regime uh, because they dared to speak out. Now, every day we wake up to more news uh, that Iranian freedom protesters have been sentenced, sentenced to death or wrongly jailed after unfair trials. And I want to make it really clear uh, to the Senate this evening. Majid and so many other of his fellow protesters are facing death at the hands of a regime which is imprisoning its community members en masse because they are daring to speak out and to push back. This must end. The international community must keep building the pressure upon Iranian authorities to free those innocent civilians who are subject to fatal penalties because they are crying out uh, for freedom in their country. The Greens have been campaigning for Magnitsky-style sanctions uh, to be used against Iran, along with the community, for a very long time. It was a welcome piece of news to hear the Foreign Minister expand these sanctions last week. Targeted sanctions are exactly uh, what the Magnitsky Act was put in place to do. Now, in giving this statement on the report, I must acknowledge uh, the role uh, of women in boldly and courageously raising their voices against the regime so desperate to silence them and in Iran and in taking the lead in giving evidence uh, to the Senate committee. They have been the drivers of activism, lobbying and of protest despite uh, the, the Iranian regime acting egregiously to minimise their impact. The system of law and order which the Iranian regime implements is one of authoritarianism. Violence, terror, fear and the silencing of the community. This is so intensely felt 
by women and by minority groups, particularly those who can identify uh, themselves as members of the Kurdish Iranian community, such as Jinnah Amini. The Greens have been advocating uh, for direct actions against the regime since the week of Jinnah Amini's death. We have done this because the community has been active in providing us with the key demands and requests that they have of their Australian government. And we know that their understanding of the Iranian regime, its tactics and practices, is strong. They need the Australian government to listen to them, and they need swift and appropriate response. Jena Amini died on the 16th of September 2022. And to place the Australian response into context, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced Canada's intention to sanction Iranian officials just 10 days later. In comparison, Australia um, waited more than three months to apply narrow sanctions. Narrow sanctions, it must be clearly understood uh, by the Senate, because they were limited in scope and in no way uh, went as far as was needed uh, in an attempt to defer and deter the regime. The delayed nature of this response was and remains an unacceptable failure on the part of the Australian Government and of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Further, the European Parliament has called on its Council to list the, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organisation. The United States and Canada have made this designation, and yet we are yet to see this uh, from the Australian Government. Now, yesterday began speculation uh, that the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, would, give would give pardon to thousands of political prisoners who were involved in protest. This must happen and must include all those who have already been given death sentences and are awaiting execution. The Greens will continue to work with the Iranian diaspora community uh, to call on the Australian government to extend its targeted uh, sanctions list and to put heavier financial sanctions and travel restrictions upon the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, in concluding my contribution, I want to offer my profound thanks and acknowledgement on behalf of the Australian Greens to the Iranian diaspora communities and to all individuals who took the time and demonstrated the courage in giving evidence to the committee and its inquiry. I acknowledge that to do so for many was to risk harm to themselves and their family members, to say nothing of the emotional burden they felt themselves. I appreciate as a committee member and our movement appreciates collectively the effort that they demonstrated and commit ourselves to solidarity with them in their struggle for women, for life and for freedom. Thank you. Senator Chandler. Uh, I also rise to speak on item 67 on page 10. As Chair of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, I welcome the opportunity to speak on that committee's report into the human rights implications of recent violence in Iran. And I'd like to start with some words from an Iranian Australian that I've been asked to read out to the Senate explaining why it is so important to that community to have the support of our parliament and our government. For over 44 years, this person says, Iranians have suffered this criminality through systematic oppression and a continuing degradation of their human rights. Soon after the 1979 revolution, I had my first taste of it as I witnessed the execution of four of my classmates by the IRGC for aligning with the wrong party in the revolution. Today's uprising is not the first attempt of Iranians to free themselves from the oppressive regime of the Islamic Republic. Just as today, nations around the world watched on quietly as the paramilitary IRGC successfully defended the dictatorship against unarmed citizens 
killing children and adults, men and women. We cannot allow today to become like the previous times. The horror of the IRI's actions detailed in these words and experienced by so many is why it is so important to our diaspora community that Australia's government takes decisive action. I'd like to thank all of the witnesses who gave evidence to the committee and the more than 1,000 people and organisations who provided submissions to the inquiry. We've all read the reports and seen the vision of the brutal and violent way the Islamic Republic regime responds to critics within its own borders. But what became apparent during the course of the inquiry was that the IRI regime goes to significant lengths to also ensure that its critics around the world are intimidated, threatened and, in some cases, subjected to violence. Just as it is incredibly brave of the people of Iran to be protesting against the regime, knowing that they face violence, arrest and torture, so too is it incredibly courageous of Iranian Australians to turn up to give evidence to a Senate committee when they know that the IRI regime is watching, monitoring and targeting those who do. While Iran is a long way from Australia, human rights abuses, the oppression of women and girls, state-sponsored terrorism and cybercrime are matters that Australia can and should take a strong stance on. If nations like Australia don't use the tools at our disposal to take a stand when another country is responsible for such behaviour, then the message is sent to that regime that they can get away with it. Other authoritarian regimes will also be watching and realising that they too can commit major human rights violations without facing consequences from the international community. But the committee's inquiry revealed that a strong response to hold the IRI accountable is not only a question of sending the right message and acting in accordance with our principles. The Iranian regime has been identified consistently as being state sponsors of terrorism. Overseas intelligence services have confirmed the Iranian regime's attempts to kill or kidnap residents of those countries. We know from recent questions I asked of the Australian Signals Directorate that operatives affiliated with the IRI are responsible for malicious cyber and ransomware attacks against Australia. Two key themes constantly emerge during this inquiry. The first is that there is significant fear of the regime here in Australia. Iranian Australians do not feel safe and protected from the IRI and the IRGC, even in this country, and that is a huge concern. The second is that there is an overwhelming feeling of frustration at Australia lagging behind other Western nations in taking action. Many of us in the Senate were raising this concern from the community back in September and October last year. It is very disappointing that, having had four months to take action, the community still feels so let down. It was evident in the final 24 hours before the release of the report that the government recognised that it is lagging behind when it should be in, where it should be in terms of taking action. We had the announcement of some additional Iranians sanctioned by the government made overnight on the eve of the report tabling in what was widely seen by the community and media as an attempt to head off criticism about how far Australia was behind other nations like the United States, Canada and the United Kingdom in applying sanctions. And I note that despite the addition of this second round of sanctions, we are still a long way behind our allies. Most of these nations were applying their second round of sanctions in October last year. Our government just announced its second round of sanctions a handful of hours before our committee report was tabled on 31 January last week. And even stranger was the sudden arrival of a late submission from the Attorney General's Department in relation to listing the IRGC as a terror organisation on the afternoon of 31 January, again just hours before the committee's report was due to be tabled. This inquiry has been running since 27 October last year. The listing of the IRGC as a terrorist organisation has been a subject of major global discussion throughout that entire period. At the, government, at the public hearing rather, on 21 December last year, committee members asked government agencies a number of times whether terrorist listing was being considered, but the government refused to engage on this question. In a written answer to a question on notice received in mid-January, we were told that the government does not and would not comment on those considerations. But then 12 hours before the report was due to be tabled, the government suddenly had the advice that it can't be done. Which begs the question one which convenient, the conveniently late submission didn't answer, of how long the government has had this advice and what have they done to prepare legislative options to correct the situation since becoming aware of it. 
On the issue of listing the IRGC as a terrorist organisation and many other issues, the community wanted and expected more answers from the government than they were willing or able to provide. And that's why the committee has made a number of recommendations calling for greater transparency from the government and for responsible ministers to provide updates on its assessment of the intimidation and foreign interference tactics of the IRI in Australia. The community members who are actually most concerned and at risk of intimidation tactics by the IRI are feeling left out of the loop when it comes to being informed by the government about its assessment of the threat and what the government is doing to counter it. I want to acknowledge and thank all senators who supported this inquiry, and particularly all of the members of the committee for their work on the inquiry. We saw how important it was to the many community groups who gave evidence to have the opportunity to be able to present to the committee and have their voices heard. I really appreciate the willingness of all committee members to be available to hold those public hearings and to make sure all of our witnesses have that opportunity. I'd like to acknowledge as well that we received well over a thousand submissions and we could have filled the programs for our public hearings many times over. But I know that the community understands the importance of the committee acting with urgency to hear the evidence and produce a report and recommendations because it is an emergency situation and a humanitarian crisis which is occurring. In that light, I will conclude by urging the government to act on the recommendations as swiftly as possible. By doing so, Australia can take a leadership role on this important global issue and ensure that Australians are protected from a dangerous regime. I commend the report to the Senate and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, can I ask you not to, uh, the Senator Shikoni would like to make some comments on this matter. No, 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 no apologies. Uh, no, you won't seek leave. I'll, I'll give you the call. I alert the chamber that if no one wants to further speak on that matter, uh, I would give him the call to Senator Wish Wilson for another matter. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, and I also too rise uh, today in the Senate to speak on the report uh, of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee, uh, the inquiry into the human rights implication of recent violence in Iran, uh, which I was certainly pleased to participate in uh, as the Deputy Chair. Uh, I, I certainly echo the report and indeed the government's um, condemnation of uh, violent measures that have been employed by the Iranian government against those who have been protesting uh, its oppression of its own citizens, particularly against uh, women and children. Uh, the Iranian security forces have been brutal in their attempted uh, suppression of these protests. Hundreds upon hundreds have lost their lives and some have been executed without any access to a fair trial. I acknowledge the extraordinary courage of those in Iran and abroad who continue to express their fierce opposition to the oppressive practices of the Iranian government, often at great risk not just to themselves but to their families, uh, whether over in Iran or elsewhere around the world. And I particularly thank those who made submissions and gave evidence to the inquiry, many choosing to do so on a confidential basis. Indeed, it's credit to the Senate's committee processes that these witnesses felt comfortable enough to be able to contribute to this inquiry, safe in the knowledge that their identity would not be made public. Of course, most of all, credit is owed to these witnesses who, whose uh, deep knowledge, lived experience and their courage to speak out contributed so much to the inquiry's work. Uh, since the death of Masa Amini, uh, whose Kurdish name is Gina, in September of last year, the Australian government, along with many other like-minded states, have led international uh, efforts to hold the Iranian government to account for its use of violence to deny those human rights, basic human rights, to their very own citizens. Uh, things that we actually treat, uh, that I obviously take for granted every single day, uh, being able to protest, being able to, to, to speak your mind freely without uh, actions of a government. But Australia has co-sponsored and advocated for uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council resolution to establish an independent fact-finding mission to investigate human rights uh, violations in Iran. Australian officials also engaged in the campaign uh, to remove Iran as a member of the United Nations Commission for the Status of Women. 
Uh, I do note with regret that this appointment was made at all, and um, it occurred in, back in April of 2021 um, with the endorsement of the Asia-Pacific grouping that Australia was part of. Uh, the Australian government um, has imposed Magnitsky-style sanctions on individuals and entities in Iran, uh, that being connected to the violence perpetrated by the Iran government against its citizens, and also individuals and entities involved in the production and supply of drones to the Russian Federation. Of course, the Australian government has also put its condemnation of actions of the Iranian government directly to Iran's diplomatic representatives, both to the, Iran, uh, sorry, the Iranian embassy here in Canberra and through Australia's ambassador in Iran. Now, with all these actions in mind, um, the political narrative that is at times pervasive throughout the committee's report is somewhat disappointing. Um, all members of the committee, and indeed I would think all members of this chamber, are of the same view in their condemnation of the Iranian government and its recent behaviour. Um, the past practice of the committee, that being the Foreign Affairs, Defence uh, and Trade uh, Committee, has been to ensure that as much as possible reports of such matters have been agreeable to members of both the government and the opposition. This is because Australians expect that wherever possible foreign policy is developed uh, and executed in a bipartisan manner. Um, as members of the Senate would see, government senators did provide an, uh, additional comments. And it is with regret that the practice uh, that has been followed in the past uh, was not uh, followed in this case with respect to this report. But the hope is that in the future that the committee members and, and the business of the committee when dealing with such matters will be conducted in a similar fashion from previous committees. Now, with that in mind, I'll turn back to the matter that has been, and rightly so, uh, been the focus of this place, and as was the case earlier today in question time, around the concerning conduct of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. With specific regard to the recommendation from the report to list the IRGC as a terrorist organisation. And I just want to make a few comments. The actions of the IRGC are unacceptable. They must be held to account, and so I understand why people, rightly, are seeking out that every possible option be taken to take action against the IRGC. But within the context of Australian law, the purpose of listings under the Criminal Code is to make it easier to prosecute individuals in Australia for supporting terrorist organisation. Australian law does not regard listing as a foreign policy tool to increase pressure on foreign governments. That being said, the Australian government is focused, very much focused, on taking meaningful steps to increase pressure on the IRGC and to hold them to account. That is why the government has sanctioned 29 Iranians and eight entities under the Magnitsky-style and autonomous sanction regimes. These include designations on nine IRGC officials and five IRGC-linked entities. Federal Labor's concern about the conduct of the IRGC predate the ongoing protests, which is why the former Labor government sanctioned the IRGC as a whole in 2012. So let me be very clear that the only party so far in government that has put sanctions on the IRGC has been Federal Labor. But unlike the previous government, who spent a whole decade talking about action, Federal Labor is the one who actually has taken the decisive action whilst being in government in the last six months. Those opposite did sit on their hands for a decade, but unfortunately it was this government that had to come in and clean up that mess and to correct the wrong. But we are very much keen to see further meaningful action in the future against these type of organisations. But again, I do want to um, share and echo the remarks by the chair um, from her um, uh, uh, statement earlier about thanking those individuals and organisations who did make a contribution to the inquiry. It is something that can be quite uh, confronting. Uh, it does take a lot of courage, especially when you do travel to Canberra and making uh, very emotional um, you know, public statements on the record. And we did see quite a number of witnesses who did uh, find the whole process somewhat uh, overpowering. Uh, but it was really good to see. And if they do you know, watch over or even read our remarks tonight, I do want to say thank you to each and one of them 
for making the time to come to Canberra to make a contribution because every part of your story has actually made a difference. It's made a difference in terms of how we've presented our report and how we've drafted the report, but also the attention that this issue is, uh, is deserved warrantly over not just the Australian media, but across the international media cycle. Because the more focus and the more pressure that we do place on the Iranian government, there will be outcomes that will be much more satisfactory uh, for both individuals and their families. So I want to place my solidarity um, with the Iranian people on the record here in the Senate. Your cause is just and your persistence is certainly one that we are all very much um, supportive of. And the face of these violent oppression you know, is a disgrace, but you know, remain focused on the cause because together we will be able to deliver good outcomes. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Do you seek leave to continue your remarks? Yes, thank you for reminding me. I do seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to take note of items uh, 69. There's two there, but one, the one relating to the fisheries quota system report dated 22 December 2022. Um, I'm very proud of this report that's uh, before the Senate today. Um, it's the first federal parliamentary inquiry into fisheries management in this country. The first federal parliamentary inquiry, and only one of two inquiries in this whole country, including state governments, who have um, ITQ or uh, individual tradable quota systems in place for 40 years. So quite mind-boggling when we think that uh, the Commonwealth manages fisheries right around this country. Uh, you know, through an ITQ-based system and a number of other overlays like harvest strategies, and yet the parliament hasn't reviewed this before. Uh, and so I'm very proud of I'm very proud of this report. Um, we felt the Greens felt very strongly that this uh, inquiry was long overdue and certainly very timely, given the economic uh, and social evolution of uh, fisheries management in Australia. Uh, over recent decades, and given recent recognised environmental and ecological changes to the habitat of Australian fisheries, in short, because of changes we've seen in our oceans in recent decades, changes caused by uh, the warming of our oceans, from the burning of fossil fuels, from pollution in our oceans, from overfishing, uh, from plastic microplastic pollution in our oceans from a whole range of cumulative pressures and sources. Now, uh, I, was, I initiated this inquiry uh, following consultation with commercial fishers uh, in Tasmania, in my home state of Tasmania, who felt the government needed to tackle significant market concentration problems and issues around foreign ownership of Australian fisheries quota in uh, their respective fisheries. Uh, I then talked to a number of experts, uh, scientists, academics, uh, fishers themselves, commercial fishers, uh, and realised there was a whole range of other problems uh, that needed to be addressed. And I'm pleased to say I believe they have been addressed uh, through this inquiry, especially through the main body of this report and through many of the additional comments uh, made by the Australian Greens uh, at the end of that report. Now, I do uh, apologise to stakeholders that the inquiry took so long. Uh, it went on for nearly two and a half years. Um, that was primarily due to COVID and the restrictions of senators uh, not being available for a number of hearings. And of course, uh, we had a change of parliament uh, and a change of government. Now, there was a good and a bad to that. The good bit was that uh, over that time period, two significant developments occurred in Australian fisheries management that were able to be captured by the inquiry. Uh, the first one was that the ANAO, the Australian National Audit Office, did an audit, uh, the first in many years, of the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. Uh, and uh, to quote uh, their answer to my question in the inquiry, if you gave them 
uh, an A to an E, like a, uh, a kid's scorecard, what would you have given AFMA? And they said, maybe a D, Senator, maybe a D. In fact, um, they only found them to be partially compliant on most of the key measures they were measured against. And of course, that gave us an opportunity to examine the ANAO's recommendations and what that meant for fisheries management. The second thing that occurred was uh, in the last term of the last parliament, in the last budget, we found a $23 million uh, rescue package for the most significant fishery in Australia, in terms, certainly in terms of size, the South East Trawl. That stretches down to southern New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, when I inquired during estimates at AFMA what was this $23 million that the Liberal government uh, was planning to spend on fisheries, they said, Senator, it's a buyout for fisheries capacity uh, in this key fishery. Uh, and I said, well, why are you buying it out? And they said, because of climate change. Uh, now, a couple of things on that. This was the first time ever that the Australian Fisheries Management Authority had labelled climate change or named up climate change as having had a significant impact, essentially on the collapse of a major fishery. But the more we investigated and interrogated that, Absolutely, climate change was an issue, but it was also that the fishery wasn't being managed for climate change. So there were fisheries management issues. So by delaying this inquiry, we actually got a case study of a collapse in a major fishery here in Australia. And interestingly, one of the uh, approaches that AFMA have taken to trying to rebuild this fishery is they have put in place significant spatial closures. They've essentially shut off entire areas in this fishery in perpetuity. In other words, they're not letting fishing boats in there. So by all, for all intents and purposes, they've created marine protected areas within a fishery, although of course no one's calling them that. But that's essentially what they've done. And that is also a precedent in Australian fisheries management. So if I had any doubts about initiating this inquiry and getting support to make sure the hearings were attended by senators and that this was taken seriously, that dispelled any doubts that I might have had. So, um, when we look at uh, this inquiry, something else unique happened. The CSIRO did an academic research paper on the Senate inquiry. They actually wrote a research paper that they then submitted to the Senate inquiry on our Senate inquiry. Now, I've never seen that before, but what they wanted to do was quantify the differences uh, in the submissions across all of Australia's managed fisheries. And what they discovered was something I already knew. Um, there were significant differences of opinion between fishers right across our fisheries as to where the fisheries management is working for them. And they found that the big majority of submitters did not feel Australia's fisheries management was working for them. Now, of course, there's a lot of reasons for that, and these are all, uh, are all detailed in this report. But it certainly suggested that this report was timely and that we need to tweak, at a minimum, we need to tweak how fisheries are management in the Commonwealth uh, of Australia. Um, I would like to thank uh, all the hundreds of submitters, including many, uh, many uh, fishers, in my home state of Tasmania have been doing it really tough. We've heard harrowing stories about fishers taking their own lives, uh, the disruption that has occurred to their livelihoods over many years now, uh, mostly because of things out of their control. Uh, but they've been very concerned that they haven't been able to access quota in this and buy that quota. And that the, the quota, which is essentially, if you're a quota holder in Australia's commercial fisheries, or in many state fisheries, you're like a landlord of the sea. You own access to those fisheries and you can trade it, you can sell it, and like a house, you can lease it out. And of course, a lot of these fishers with rising diesel prices uh, and a collapse in markets like we saw with Rock Lobster and China were literally getting squeezed so that they were not only not making any money, they were losing money and going to the wall. Uh, and they appreciated the Senate looking into this. Um, I would like to kind of finish my contribution by saying um, there is 10 recommendations in the Greens' additional comments, and we didn't, sorry, uh, yeah, additional comments. We didn't put a dissenting report in because there's some very good recommendations in the main committee report. 
Um, the disadvantage, of course, of having extended the inquiry into a new government was that um, LNP senators got to write the majority report uh, in the inquiry. And while I acknowledge that there's some good recommendations in here, uh, unfortunately the final chapter, the conclusions, I don't believe uh, re reflect the, the big uh, body of data and knowledge in this report because uh, Senator Colbeck essentially got to write the report. And guess what? He used to be fisheries minister for a number of the last 10 years and got to reflect on his own fisheries performance. So I made sure I believe that was a conflict of interest and I put that in this report. However, I do thank uh, LNP senators who uh, did put some key recommendations in here around the ACCC investigating competition issues, around improving transparency issues in the fishery uh, and a couple of other key recommendations. But the Greens uh, give our promise to fishers around this country uh, that this is just the beginning for us. At both the state and federal level, we will continue to build on this inquiry. I will be asking AFMA and FRDC and CSIRO and other key federal stakeholders questions at every estimates. Uh, we will not be backing off on trying to get reform in the Australian fisheries management system. And it's simply because of this. It is not delivering economic and social benefits like it should be to fishing communities and to the Australian people that own this resource. And it is failing us on an ecological, biological and environmental level. Our oceans are under a lot of pressure and we have to do a lot better. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, if there are no further contributions in relation to committee reports, Thank you, Clark. Senator Wish Wilson, did you want to seek leave to continue your remarks? Or? Yes, I did, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. I, I seek leave to uh, continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? Uh, President, I table uh, documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Bracknell Community Hall Grant Award. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I'll move on to committee memberships. Uh, I believe this is me, subject to what the clerk is about to tell me, Minister. <laughs> yes. Um, the President has received a letter nominating senators to be members of a committee. Oh, now I call the Minister. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion to appoint senators to a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that Senator Lambie be appointed as a member of the Select Committee on Australia's Disaster Resilience and Senator Tyrrell be appointed as a participating member. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is, uh, as moved by the minister. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment modernising business communications and other measures bill 2023 for concurrence. I call the minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the uh, question uh, is, as moved by the minister, those of that opinion say aye. Those, of that, uh, those against say no. Summer brain. Um, uh, the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to corporations, consumer credit and other matters in the Treasury portfolio to make miscellaneous and technical amendments of the law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. The Minister. That's good. I was looking forward to reading that. I, <laughs> I, uh, I move that the debate be now adjourned.
Uh, the question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, the President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills, Fair Work Legislation Amendment Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill 2022 and Financial Sector Reform Bill 2022. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Ms Lawrence and Ms Stanley to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 30 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, higher education support amendment 2022 measures number one, bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate and the amendment moved by Senator Faruqi. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to speak on this bill today because this bill provides the legislative effect to a policy that was a key issue for the Nationals before the last election. I particularly refer to the part of the bill that gives effect to the Higher Education Loan Program or HELP for rural doctors and nurse practitioners measure that was announced by the Coalition in the 2021-22 MyEFO. This measure provides a partial or full help desk depth reduction for rural doctors and nurse practitioners who reside and practice in regional, rural or remote Australia. It was a key pillar of the Nationals in the last government to try to take constructive and practical measures to address our regional health workforce shortages for the long term. We all understand that it's not a silver bullet and it will not flood the regions with doctors and nurses tomorrow, but certainly over the long term it will attract more health graduates to the regions and uh, hopefully, as I have, once you move to the region you know how wonderful it is to live in the regions and you stay in the region. This measure was previously included in the Education Legislation Amendment Bill 2022, but unfortunately the bills lapsed with the dissolution of parliament. We supported, the Nationals supported the introduction of this to encourage the relocation and retention of eligible doctors and nurse practitioners by reducing their outstanding help or hex debts. It allowed for the waiver of indexation on outstanding help desks for eligible doc doctors and nurse practitioners while they're residing and completing eligible work in our rural, remote or very remote areas. These debts for doctors can be up to the value of $100,000. It's no wonder, um, with a debt like that hanging over your head, that our graduates we're seeking um, quantity over quality in terms of how many patients they could see and how much um, reimbursement they could get. This measure is backdated under this bill to the time of the previous government's announcement in the 21-22 MyEFO, and I do thank the government for doing that. I, I truly welcome that because. Um, it provides the certainty that some graduates who were really considering this measure needed. This program is expected to encourage up to 850 eligible doctors or nurses to relocate to a rural, regional or remote area each year. And those of us who live in rural Australia know only too well the difficulties we have in finding and keeping good doctors. Difficulty is exacerbated by the fact that at the moment 
We read today that skilled migrants in nursing, pharmacy and health care are waiting more than two years for visas. As was highlighted by my colleague Senator Anne Rustin today in question time, this is despite those people being in occupations designated for priority processing by the federal government. And yet, for some reason, subclass 887 skilled regional visas does not fall into a priority area. So this means migrants in the same occupations who apply for different types of skill shortages, including those who want to work in the cities, are getting fast-tracked with applications processed in as little as 25 days, but we've got doctors and nurses waiting two years or more. This stark difference has been fuelled by a ministerial direction issued by Immigration Minister Andrew Giles in November to prioritise some teacher and healthcare worker applications over and above other occupations, including applicants in regional areas. We know in the regions that there are never enough doctors or nurses, and sometimes this is because of an overload of work or we lose them, or other times it's changes to government policy such as another key initiative that was implemented to attract overseas trained doctors and bonded graduates to rural areas, the distribution priority area classification system. Now, yes, admittedly, in government, we extended the DPA classification system to include regional centres such as Dubbo, Shepparton and the like. But when they got into government, the new government expanded the classifications to identify peri-urban areas. How is that helping our regional health workforce shortage? The current DPA classification system and changes brought in by this government have seen the shift of overseas trained doctors from areas like Maitland to Newcastle, as I said before, where they can get quantity of patient numbers, but at the expense of the quality of our health workforce in regional areas. This government, as part of their 2022 election commitments to ease city health pressures, included fringe suburbs across Australia like Fairfield, Hornsby, Penrith, Warringah, Rouse Hill, Richmond and Windsor, and that's just in New South Wales. So they are now eligible under the DPA classification system. So when you're looking at overseas trained doctors who are looking for a cohort. Of course they're going to look at where there's quantity. It has seen, this one change has seen serious shortages starting to develop in country towns. It's a short-sighted policy, no doubt to appease some Labor seats, but it's having devastating impacts in the regions. We see on a daily basis, the overcrowding in city hospitals and the enormous pressure on emergency departments, and yet Penrith gets DPA doctors. Our regional areas they get crowding in emergency departments because it's the only place you can go to see a doctor, because our clinics, our GP clinics are crying out. We have cases where local governments are footing up to $700,000 in one example in South Australia to try and attract a GP to their region because they can't entice anyone and they're now competing against the peri-urban areas of Adelaide to attract an overseas trained doctor. I know 
because I live in the regions. The lifestyle and the well-being benefits of living outside the big cities. I know the benefits my children have had being able to live in a smaller community where they're free to walk to work, go swimming in the rivers and ride their bikes without fear. But those wonderful rural settings need services. And they will only attract services if they've got the infrastructure and, and the health services to support them. I've written an op-ed that was published in The Land earlier this year about the need to attract a, work, a health workforce to the regions. It is a vicious cycle. If you don't have a doctor, you can't attract the other professionals you want into regional areas, but you will not attract a doctor to a regional area unless you've got those other important services and professional um, people living in the region. So why this government would bring in policies or make policy changes that effectively undermined the ability of regions to attract doctors is inconceivable. But that's why today's bill is so important that we all get behind it and we all pass it. Because waiving these debts to attract graduates into our regions will attract them for the long term. It will get them into our regions to live there, to hopefully start families there, to encourage them to help support and nurture the next generation of medical professionals in our regions. So I do acknowledge and I thank the government for bringing forward uh, this bill today. The Nationals absolutely support it because it was our policy and I congratulate the government for picking up good policy when they see it. I commend the bill to the House. Chamber. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I thank senators for their contributions to this debate. The bill will support students through fairer grandfathering provisions and the Job Ready Graduate Scheme and support our rural, remote and very remote communities by encouraging our doctors and nurse practitioners to provide services in those areas. Uh, the bill also puts in place a scheme for eligible doctors and nurse practitioners to have their help debts uh, reduced or wiped if they live and work in remote, uh, rural, remote and very remote areas of Australia. This is a policy which we have continued from the former government. We want to make sure in rural and remote communities uh, their access, they have access to health services and it makes sense to continue this important measure. Uh, we expect to support around 850 medical practitioners a year in those areas. Again, I thank senators for their contribution and I commend this bill to the chamber. Uh, thank you, Senator Chisholm. I'm just consulting with the clerk about the time. Uh, the question before the chamber is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Faruqi uh, be agreed. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, those against say no. I no. think the noes have it. Chair, um, because yep. um, we can't have a division at this time, yep. uh, maybe if you could note um, the position of the Greens um, you know, supporting this um, amendment. Uh, Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a um, good suggestion. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. That will be notice, uh, noted in the Hansard. Uh, and now, it being 7.30, I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Uh, and I call... Senator Payne. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, 
On 14 February 2018, Senator Jim Molan made his first speech in this place. It's far too soon, only five years almost to the week, that we have honoured him in the valedictory motion on Monday. As the service of Major General Jim Molan in the Australian Army was of distinction and merit, so too was the service of Senator Jim Molan in this place. I know he was rightly proud of both, and I know that pride was keenly shared by his wife Anne, his children Sarah, Felicity, Erin and Michael, his grandchildren and his siblings. Those of us who were honoured to attend his moving funeral service at Anzac Memorial Chapel of St Paul's at Duntroon were also honoured to see that pride and love writ large. To the lovely Anne and to Jim's whole beautiful family, I extend my sincere condolences. As well as being a valued New South Wales colleague, I had known Jim long before his arrival here. I recall well our first introduction in Dili in Timor-Leste in 1999 at the time of the holding of the popular consultation for autonomy or independence for East Timor. Then Brigadier Molan was with Australia's distinguished ambassador to Jakarta, John McCarthy, supporting Australia's presence in Dili for the ballot. I was a member of the Australian parliamentary delegation, led by former Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher, which included another senator, Democrat Vicky Bourne. Vicky wanted me to convey her sympathies to Jim's family. She recalls Jim from that delegation fondly too. Jim was head of Australia's defence staff in Jakarta at that time, a critical period in Australia-Indonesian relations, a critical time for the newly independent, fledgling nation of Timor-Leste. Jim's skills, military, diplomatic, linguistic, were all brought to bear in that tumultuous period before the arrival of Interfet. Through parliamentary committee work, including on Ramsey, I saw quite a bit of Jim as a senior officer over the ensuing years. Much has been written, and much said in this chamber and in the other place, of his distinguished military service. His record and his honours speak volumes, and Australia is a better place for Senator Molan's long army service. In my role as Defence Minister, Jim always ensured that I was in no doubt about both his passionate commitment to Australia's national security and his priorities in that regard. Every colour he nailed to the mast on those issues in that first speech five years ago, he prosecuted the case for in his strong policy advocacy. Similarly, in his own writings, that commitment and passion is clear. I was not surprised at his funeral service speaking to both serving and former members of the ADF about their shared service with Jim at multiple levels of the respect and gratitude many of them described. He honoured them in his first speech in dedicating his Senate service to those same people. Across New South Wales in recent years, Senator Mullen and I had a great working relationship, culminating in sharing positions on the 2022 Coalition Senate ticket. He strongly represented regional New South Wales, and I particularly enjoyed being on the ground with him across regional New South Wales and working with his excellent and professional team, led by Jackie Cummins. To Jackie and to Jim's team, I also convey my sympathies. I know this is a very difficult time. Madam Acting Deputy President, I was unable to participate in the condolence motion on Monday because of another funeral of my dear friend and my sometime horticultural adviser, Danny Mallard, in Sydney. And I apologise to the Molan family and to the Senate chamber for that. Too many funerals right now. Madam Acting Deputy President, I salute Jim Molan, a leader, a thinker, an author, a wonderful husband, father, grandfather and brother, a friend and a colleague and an absolute gentleman. I add my grateful thanks for his lifetime of service. Thank you, Senator Payne. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Last month, I joined the fearless and staunch Gomorrah people in Coonabarabran for the ongoing fight against Santos's Pelega Narabrai gas project. The Gomorrah people had gathered alongside activists, farmers, locals, and the community on the 14th of January in response to the National Native Title Tribunal's decision to green light this destructive project. Every time I travel to Gomoroi country in central west New South Wales, 
I am in awe of the strength of the community in defiantly resisting the ruthless, predatory fossil fuel giants. Santos' Pelega Narabra project fails on every single count. It is a giant climate bomb waiting to detonate. The project will open up floodgates of decades of climate damage and terrifying disasters like the fires and floods that we have seen in recent years. This project will extend the lifespan of a greedy, dying industry that has lost its social license. It will have disastrous and irreversible impacts on the forest, threatened species, farmland, and groundwater. There will be mass deforestation of the mighty Pelega and the destruction of cultural and spiritual places of First Nations people. Mining and burning coal and gas is the leading cause of the climate crisis. To avoid climate collapse, we must keep coal and gas in the ground. Right now, there are 118 coal and gas projects in the pipeline, and 27 of these are in New South Wales. The Pilega Narabrai project alone will produce 120 million tons of climate pollution across its lifetime, pushing us ever closer to critical climate tipping points. This toxic project will further delay the shift to renewables. There is no justification for this unconscionable and widely opposed project. The traditional owners have made it clear that they don't want the project. They have clearly said that gamel means no. Yet, despite these risks and rejections, despite the clear evidence the destruction this project will cause, state and federal governments, and now the National Native Title Tribunal, have only seen dollar signs and given the tick of approval. It is because of the tenacity of the mighty Gomoroi people, joined by so many others in the community, that this dirty project has been kept at bay so far. They have bravely stood their ground for more than a decade for country they have cared for for centuries. All of us, as well as the future generations, owe a great deal to the Gomoroi people for their resistance. The gathering I joined on the 14th of January issued the Kunabarabran Statement, which amongst other matters called on Attorney General Mark Dreyfus and Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek to immediately declare the Gomorrah native title determination invalid and cancel the licenses of the Pelaga Narabrai gas project. And I urge the government to listen to the community. Unfortunately, though, while we have a new government, we still have the same old fight with a government whose pockets get filled with dirty donations by the same old fossil fuel industry. The Albanese government loves to make a big song and dance about caring about climate, but has not taken the strong actions needed for change. They have refused to rule out an end to new coal and gas. Resources Minister Madeleine King voiced approval of the Pelega Narabra gas project just a month after the election. Worryingly, the New South Wales Premier, Dominic Perrottet, has recently committed to this gas project being up and running in his next term of government, should New South Wales um, you know, suffer this blow of yet another term of the scandal-ridden and corrupt Liberals. Disgracefully, the Perote government has signed off to start survey work on the Hunter gas project, gas pipeline. That pipeline threatens the rich black soils of the Liverpool Plains, as well as several of the most significant koala habitats in New South Wales. The people of New South Wales have an opportunity on the 25th of March this year to kick out the Liberals and to put the Greens in the balance of power so that this fossil fuel project, fossil fueled project, can be rejected and coal and gas phased out once and for all. Santos has no business in the Pelaga or in the Liverpool Plains. The National Native Title Tribunal's decision was a setback, a significant setback. But people will keep fighting. The Gomorrah people have lodged an appeal against the decision, and we are with them. We will not back down until justice is done. And let's not forget, there can be no environmental justice without First Nations justice. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution in the chamber on the life of the wonderful Nessa Delaney, who tragically passed away on the 30th of October 2022, aged 58, in Ireland. I want to acknowledge in the gallery with us this evening the presence of His Excellency the Irish Ambassador Tim Moore and his charming wife Patricia, 
Uh, I know in Ireland there are people who will be watching this, uh, including the Australian Ambassador Gary Gray and Nessa's family and friends. Nessa was introduced to me as the wife of the Irish Ambassador to Australia, His Excellency Noel White. Irish born herself, she charmed me immediately and I knew at once that I had met a remarkable Irish woman. Nessa soon made herself known to everyone, everywhere in Canberra, and she was very, very active in our local community, active in culture, in charity and the arts. She was everywhere, from sausage sizzles at schools to more formal settings such as the Governor-General's residence and, of course, everything in between. Wherever she was, she was a welcome presence, a wonderful addition to everything that was happening. I certainly enjoyed her wonderful generosity as a hostess on many occasions. She was a truly remarkable ambassador for Ireland and for great women who serve their nation with distinction. In 2013, uh, working here in Canberra with the National Film and Sound Archive, Nessa Delaney conceived and delivered Canberra's participation in a worldwide reading of Ulysses. She delighted visiting groups with her guided tours of the embassy during the annual Heritage Days in Canberra. I want to acknowledge the leadership of the Parliamentary Friendship Group of Ireland, led at that time by the Honourable Brendan O'Connor and uh, one of our great colleagues here in the Senate, John Wacker Williams, who was very, very proud of his long distant Irish heritage. Um, Nessa Delaney and His Excellency Noel White presided over a vibrant and thriving embassy and home, one that stretched out warm hands of welcome to all who wish to share in the light and joy of Ireland and its steady stream of Irish representatives. Many senators and members and Australian thought leaders enjoyed a meal at the table at the Irish Embassy. Nessa was an enormously impressive person, an accomplished writer, polyglot, and she had her own, in her own right, a brilliant career serving as a senior official in the Department of Foreign Affairs. Indeed, Nessa Delaney served in Dublin, Paris and Ottawa and in senior capacity at the EU Council of Foreign Ministers in Brussels. Nessa's light touched hearts across the globe and her funeral in Carlo was attended by friends and admirers from as far away as the US and Australia. At that funeral, her husband, Noel, said of Nessa, and I quote, she was a courageous, determined, ambitious, intelligent, fiercely intelligent, kind, gentle, engaging, warm, witty, funny human being. All these epithets and more, elegance, empathy and grace are justified, he said. They are scattered liberally throughout the tributes that have poured in from around the world. Nessa was a wonderful mother and she absolutely adored her boys. Uh, as, uh, as, as Noel said and as was reported uh, in the Carlo newspaper, uh, the most important thing, the one that trumped all else was her boys, Daniel, Joseph and Patrick. She adored them, supported them, backed them unconditionally. She lived a responsibility to deliver them to the world as upstanding, decent young men and good citizens. Her gift to the world, she would have been proud of them today, as I am. Uh, to, to, be, uh, to be leaving this world at the age of 58, so clearly talented with much, so much more to give and clearly very loved is a great loss. She was a great um, participant in the international democracy in which we participate. Uh, the relationships that we form with uh, the ambassadors from across the globe are vital to not only our, our edification as human beings but to our trade relationships and our contact with one another. And Nessa brought all of the accomplishments necessary to that role uh, and she was a fine support to Noel. Survived by Noel, sons Daniel, Joseph and Patrick and her four sisters Catherine, Jean, Pat and Jennifer, I pass my deepest condolences to her wonderful family and pray that her memory remains a blessing and that the light that she brought into all our worlds remains with us. Rest in peace, Nessa Delaney. Senator Raston. Thank you very much. Um, well, today I rise to speak about Ovarian Cancer Month. It's held in February every year, and I also want to acknowledge the amazing work of Ovarian Cancer Australia. And a particular shout out to Jane Hill, the CEO, 
um, who's known to so many of us in this building for her fierce advocacy on behalf of, of uh, women who suffer from ovarian cancer. It's also a huge honour to have been asked uh, to be a parliamentary ambassador for Ovarian Cancer Australia, um, along with Meryl Swanson in the other place and Sarah Hanson Young in this place. Um, because, like so many other Australians, um, I have been touched by having a very dear, close friend die of ovarian cancer way, way too young. But sadly, we know that the impact of all cancers have a serious impact on Australians. But the likelihood of survival from ovarian cancer is the lowest of any female cancer. It's less than 50 per cent. Women diagnosed with ovarian cancer face an extraordinarily daunting challenge, and it's both absolutely heartbreaking and equally inspiring to hear the stories of people who've walked on that journey. And this morning, Alyssi Jack Kufasi shared her experience of her journey with ovarian cancer. Alessi has only just turned 30. Tragically, she has stage four ovarian cancer. She's dealing with the challenges and decisions that no young woman should have to face. Alessi's ovarian cancer is terminal. But it's a devastating reality for so many women who are diagnosed with this insidious disease. And Alessi's bravery this morning in sharing her journey and her experience with the illness, her experience with the treatment, and the emotional trauma that has followed her subsequent diagnosis was one of the most incredibly powerful speeches I have ever heard. It demonstrated how absolutely every effort must be put in to improving diagnosis, treatment and support and prevention in the first place of this horrible disease. By sharing her story, she has, a, has taken powerful action to increase awareness, but more must be done to progress this message. Currently, there is no early detection test available for the screening of ovarian cancer, which means often when it's diagnosed it is already in advanced stages of the disease. And without the ability to do early screening and detection, many, many more Australian women's lives will be lost because we have missed the opportunity to treat them at an earlier stage. And that's why we must continue to increase our investments in health and medical research in Australia particularly so that we can find early detection measures and mechanisms that will allow women who are diagnosed with ovarian cancer to be treated much early to give them a better chance in life, as we wish to do for all other people in Australia who are diagnosed with cancer. Under the coalition, we were pleased to have been able to make $21 million available for ovarian cancer research, um, and we will continue to work with the government to make sure that this research investment is continued and an absolute top priority for our government, the government of this country, going forward. But along with improving access to treatment and making sure we've got research into better treatment and diagnosis, it's also important that we have the right programs to support women when they are diagnosed with all sorts of cancers, but particularly ovarian cancer, given that it has such a low survival rate. Um, in February last year, um, $2 million was provided by the Coalition for, to Ovarian Cancer so that they could continue to provide the vital psychosocial telehealth services through their TEAL support program to go along with the psychosocial supports that so many women value so deeply when they find themselves on this horrible journey that is cancer. Today, uh, Ovarian Cancer Australia are asking for $4 million to continue this important work important work to make sure that every woman who is diagnosed with ovarian cancer does not work that journey alone. It seems quite a small ask. So I'd like to take this opportunity today to particularly thank Ovarian Cancer Australia and all the amazing people that work in research, who work in support, who work in the mental support services for the extraordinary work that they do, the tirelessness, the selflessness that they present every day as they walk beside women who are taking this terrible journey. It's critical that we continue as governments and as people in this place to support programs that are going to support women um, who have to make this journey. It's important that we continue to support research. We must do all we can to increase awareness, to increase education and to make sure that medical research and support for victims of ovarian cancer is the best that we can provide them. Senator. Uh, Senator O'Neill. I seek leave to associate myself with remarks from Senator Rustin. And if by leave I might table the um, 
the piece from the Irish Nationalist uh, about Nessa Daly for Delaney for the, uh, for, for the chamber to have on record. Um, I seek leave to table uh, this document. Leave is, leave is granted. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Steele-John. Thank you. Last month in my home state of Western Australia, a small amount of radioactive material went missing somewhere near the Pilbara. Under the so-called care of fossil fuel giant Rio Tinto, this material fell off the back of a truck. Now, you didn't hear that wrong. Uh, it fell off the back of a truck. You honestly could not make this up. Worse, this material contained within a small capsule remained lost in the Pilbara for a week. One week. Seven days that a radioactive pellet was languishing somewhere out in the community before it was found at just south of Newman. This capsule was about the size of the nail on my pinky finger, lost somewhere in a 1,400 kilometre stretch of desert highway. I think the Chamber can appreciate just how unlikely its recovery was, how lucky and how unacceptably high uh, and incredibly, uh, absolutely unacceptable it was that it was lost to begin with. Now, this radioactive capsule posed a serious health risk. Emitting the same amount of radiation a person would be exposed to in an entire year. It had the potential to cause a radiation sickness and burns to anyone who may come in contact with it. And the significant environmental risk it posed through contamination to soil or a water source is almost unbearable to think about. Yet the maximum penalty under the law for such an egregious brief breach of safety a mere $1,000. Radiation Services WA, a radiation management company uh, that services the mining industry, described the loss of this radioactive capsule as highly unusual. Let's consider that. Every year around the world, more than 1,000 incidents of radioactive materials uh, go missing. Here in Australia, we've had 27 such incidents in the past seven years alone. Does this really qualify as highly unusual? I don't know about you, but it strikes me as frighteningly too usual. The incident forms part of a much bigger picture here in Australia, of AUKUS, of the federal government's proposed dump of nuclear waste in South Australia, the repeated attempts to revive the nuclear power a conversation, they are all connected because they all put our community at an unacceptable risk. We need fewer nuclear projects and less reliance on nuclear technology, not more. We need far stronger safeguards around the management of nuclear material and far stricter penalties uh, for any such breaches. We need a guarantee from our government that the community will not be exposed to this kind of risk ever again. Because how are we to trust them when they insist that a nuclear dump or a nuclear propelled uh, submarine is safe when they cannot even keep radioactive materials from falling off the back of a truck? This incident is a timely reminder of what the Greens have been saying since our very inception. Nuclear is never the answer. Radioactive materials pose an unacceptable danger to the community and the Greens will continue uh, to fight to ensure that these uh, soul-shivering radioactive incidents uh, never occur again, that this is the very last time the WA community is ever placed at such a risk. Thank you, Senator Steele-John. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak today on the important issue of women's safety. Any government and any policy which allows a violent male rapist to choose to be placed in a women's prison has profoundly lost its way. For a number of years, women's rights campaigners have been trying to warn that self-identification policies, which have been embraced by governments worldwide in the name of inclusion, create loopholes that dangerous male predators will exploit. 
The response to women raising those logical concerns has been for left-wing politicians and media outlets to go on the attack, not against the predators that exploit these loopholes and put women in danger, but against the women who sounded the alarm. We've seen a classic example of this occur over the last few weeks in Scotland. The Scottish government allowed a man called Adam Graham to elect to be sent to a women's prison after being convicted of raping two women. As many in Scotland have pointed out, Adam Graham was far from the first dangerous male sex offender in Scotland to be housed alongside women. But this time, something happened that the Scottish government wasn't expecting, and that was that the media actually called them out for it. And there was a predictable and swift public backlash, particularly because the Scottish government had spent the previous months insisting that this would never happen and that anyone who suggested that it would were bigots. As usual, women who correctly pointed out that what would happen were attacked by the political left as transphobic, as turfs, all the usual slurs thrown at women by the left to intimidate others into staying silent. The Scottish Government and its First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, confirmed that those women were right all along when it was announced last week that Adam Graham would be moved out of women's prison. But by dodging questions about other male sex offenders in women's prison, Ms Sturgeon has unwittingly revealed the truth about self-identification in prison policies. That truth is that such policies are always based on secrecy and falsehoods and are unjustifiable when exposed to public scrutiny. That's why the governments and lobby groups who create these policies do whatever they can to hide the truth from the public. And this brings me to Australia. In this country, we don't have to look overseas for evidence that dangerous men can identify as women and be placed in women's prison. It's happening right here. And every government, state and federal, knows that it's happening. They rely on the silence and complicity of the media to sustain this policy to attack any woman who raises it in the public domain. Just like in Scotland, governments and the media in Australia have stayed deliberately quiet about male offenders who identify as women and request to access women's prisons. How many Australian media outlets have reported that a man sent to women's prison in Victoria had spent six years in a German prison for repeatedly sexually abusing his six-year-old daughter? that upon returning to Australia he was charged and imprisoned for failing to comply with sex offender reporting obligations, that despite this conviction he is known by police to use multiple different identities, which has somehow been permitted, according to the AFP and answers provided to me through Senate estimates, on the grounds that he did not officially change their name, rather chose to informally be known by other names. And that is a direct quote from that response and that he committed a serious sexual assault on a woman in 2021, yet was sent to a woman's prison. Any reasonable person knows that this is indefensible, just as the Scottish government ultimately could not defend placing Adam Graham in a women's prison when they were caught out. And that's why activists and governments put so much effort into stopping the media reporting on this information so it never reaches the public. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to talk on the issue of interest rates. Now, interest rates are something that we've talked a lot about over the last few years, and you would have heard uh, time and time again uh, those on this side of the chamber telling the Australian people that interest rates are always lower under the Liberals, under a coalition government. And I've said it myself, but I thought I would just dig back through the records, look at the actual facts, and put some of the facts on the table about those average interest rates under Labor versus the Coalition. Firstly, for mortgage holders, obviously the underlying cash rate is not the mortgage rate. It's a 2 to 3 per cent higher for a mortgage rate. But the average cash rate since 1990, when the RBA started publishing the cash rate, under Labor, 6.17 per cent. Under the Coalition, 3.69 per cent. Again, for an average mortgage holder, where the interest rates are 2 to 3 per cent higher than those average cash rates, you're looking at average interest rates under Labor of around 8 per cent, between 8 and 9 per cent, and under the Coalition of between 4 and 4.5 per cent. 
So you're talking about a very real difference for mortgage holders in this country. Now, what about the highest cash rate we've seen in that period since 1990, 32 years? Let's call it a generation. Uh, under Labor, the highest rate, over 17 per cent after the recession we had to have in 1990. Now, the highest cash rate under a coalition government, 6.75 per cent. My mum and dad were small business people. My mum and dad had a farm with an overdraft. This is uh, something that affects small business owners fundamentally. A difference like this was the difference between making a profit and making a loss in those years under Labor when we saw the interest rates hit 17 per cent. Because again, this is the cash rate. A cash rate of 17 per cent meant for my mum and dad's overdraft a rate of 22 to 23 per cent per annum. And finally, let's have a look at the lowest cash rate recorded under the ALP versus under the coalition government. Lowest cash rate recorded under the ALP was 0.85 per cent. I admit that's low. It happens to be the first month that they were in government, inherited from the coalition government. Uh, but under the coalition government, 0.1 per cent. So we see over a period of 30 years, in fact, over the entire period where the RBA has been publishing a target cash rate, the coalition delivering lower interest rates than Labor. And that's something that all Australians should remember. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President. Interest rates went up again today. For those with a mortgage, these constant rises are brutal, as budgets are squeezed to keep paying off a home. For renters, prices are already astronomical and getting worse. We hear stories about families looking for cheaper places to live, of rental inspections with 50 people looking at a single home, of people renting homes without ever having seen them out of pure desperation. And mortgages are rising faster than wages. Rents are rising faster than wages. Food and fuel and electricity are all rising faster than wages. People are starting to make choices to pay the electricity bill or take a child to the dentist for a checkup, a fortnight of train fares or a single session with a mental health professional. Awful, impossible choices, like to pay for new school shoes or to buy groceries. Wages have deliberately been suppressed by state and federal governments with wage caps, freezes and anti-strike laws, and by corporations with increasing casualisation and precarious work. Workers are paying the price, while billionaires are celebrated and treated as media personalities for increasing their already obscene wealth. And corporations, who never waste a crisis, report ever larger profits. It's time to restore wages and to tax profits and obscene wealth. If we do that, we can ensure that every Australian has a secure home. We can fund essential public services that put dental and mental into Medicare. And we can make this country live up to its increasingly tattered promise of a fair go all round. So, Acting Deputy, in the last 24 hours, more than 4,800 people have been killed in deadly earthquakes across Turkey, Syria and the lands of the Kurdish people. Many thousands more are trapped in collapsed buildings and missing. This devastation, grief and loss is in addition to the trauma of 11 years of ongoing conflict in Syria and the region. The humanitarian needs were already enormous, but now hundreds of thousands of more are in need of shelter, food, water, fuel and essential trauma-informed care. Survivors after such grief and pain face the added hardship of a freezing winter, with some areas in deep snow. And while we stand in this building today, warm and comfortable, Hundreds of thousands of people have just undergone a catastrophe, many losing loved ones, and now waiting for our aid, our help in the snow. It is unthinkable. And I note the $10 million in urgent aid announced by the Australian government as a positive first step. And I hope our government remains open to offer every possible assistance in the next days and months to ensure a humanitarian response that helps as many people as possible, and particularly to support local humanitarian actors working on the ground in their own community. And I've spoken to families here just today about what their extended families are facing on the ground. 
and they've asked for the Australian government to ensure that our aid goes directly to the communities affected, whether they be Turkish, Arabic or Kurdish, and that it's distributed free of discrimination. Now more than ever, the broken politics of division in the region must be set aside for common humanity. And I stand here, I think, with all of us, in solidarity with all of those affected. Mr Acting Deputy President, today this parliament heard the powerful Baruz Brachani about the devastating laws that imprisoned him and thousands of other refugees. Every day we hear tragic stories that highlight the inhumane, inhumane nature of our, of our refugee laws that torture and, and cause suffering of refugees. And I want to share just one of those stories with you. Leila and her son were refugees from Iran, and in 2013 they had no choice but to board a leaky boat and seek asylum in Australia. They were imprisoned on Nauru, and her son was just nine. She told that story today through a painting. And this painting is a portrait of her son and his journey as a refugee. It represents the constant threat that he and other children in his situation have received since stepping foot in Australia. For 10 years, they were threatened and bullied and constantly told they were not allowed to stay in Australia, not allowed to study, to get a job, to have a normal family life or hope for a secure future. And the impacts have been devastating for her son and family. And Leela's painting represents just one of thousands of stories from Australia's offshore detention system. Countless families have been victimised by both major parties in Australia. Too many people have lost or taken their lives. The scars and trauma will stay with their families forever. And after 10 years of suffering, Leela told me she doesn't expect the Australian parliament to become humane. And that is a heartbreaking conclusion. But if you listen closely to her request, her request has actually moved beyond this parliament. She wants freedom, freedom to work, to study and have access to basic human rights, freedom as human beings. In the words of the ever-inspiring Baruz Bashani, freedom, only freedom. And Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek, I seek leave of the parliament. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Raskew, you have the call. Thank you. For decades, the hard work of John Bennett AM was done in the shadows, the soft grey light of early morning and the pitch black of cold Tasmanian evenings. Day in, day out, rain, hail or shine, the Bennett family would work. Work that would often go unnoticed, but crucial work that ensured thousands of Tasmanians started their day off right with breakfast. How many of you started off your day this morning with a bowl of cereal? And if not that, how many of you had a cup of coffee? And what do these two things have to do with John Bennett? Well, both of these items are mostly served with milk, and there is no one more synonymous with the dairy industry in Tasmania than John Bennett AM. John was the co-founder of Ashgrove Farms, and if you have not heard of them, they are the homes of the happiest cows in Tasmania. John sadly passed away last month, and I think it's incredibly important that we take a moment to consider his legacy to agriculture, not only in Tasmania, but Australia. There are many words that could be used to describe John Bennett. Icon, founding father, entrepreneur, pioneer and visionary. But he was first and foremost a family man, a father and, of course, a farmer. And I would like to take this opportunity to extend my condolences to his family on his loss. The idea for Ashgrove was initiated by John and his brother Michael and their wives Connie and Maureen in the late 1980s after John spent many years studying agriculture and cheese manufacturing on family farms in the UK. At the time, unemployment on the northwest coast in Tasmania was high and dairy farmers in Tasmania were among the worst paid in the world. Decades later, Ashgrove is a dairy producing powerhouse and iconic tourism destination. Its innovative Dairy Door at Elizabethtown attracts thousands of visitors every year following a $2 million investment in the facility recently. Ashgrove is unique. It was one of the first examples of agritourism in Tasmania and it has paved the way for the industry to thrive. John Bennett and Ashgrove Farms wanted to throw open the gates rather than shut them and people loved it. None of this would have been possible without the vision of John Bennett who had a lifelong commitment to serving his community. John's mark on the dairy industry will never be for forgotten. He paved the way as a founding member of the Tasmanian Farmers and Graziers Association and was a member of the inaugural National Farmers Federation. He first represented dairy farmers in 1972 as a delegate to the Northern Dairy Division of the Tasmanian Farmers and Graziers Association 
and was elected in 1974 as chair of the State Division of the Dairy Council. He was president of the Australian Dairy Farmers Federation from 1976 to 85 and deputy chair of the Australian Dairy Corporation from 1981 to 86. As inaugural chair of the Australian Dairy Conference in 1976 to 85, he was responsible for bringing together farmers and dairy manufacturers for the first time. In 1980, he initiated the establishment of the Australian Specialty Cheese Producers Association. And in the 70s and 80s, John held the role of Director of the Asia Dairy Industries and following that was appointed as President Commissioner of PT Indomilk and Director of the Thai Dairy Industry Company between 1980 and 1987. His standing on the international dairy scene was cemented when he was elected Vice President of the International Federation of Agricultural Dairy Division in 1982. In 1992, he was awarded a member of the Order of Australia for his services to the Australian dairy industry. A common thread throughout the life of John Bennett is service. Not only did he serve the dairy industry, but he was also fiercely passionate about serving his community, which he did until his recent passing. John served his community as Deloraine Municipal Councillor from 1970 to 79 and as a member of the Deloraine Rotary Club for 20 years, where he served as president between 97 and 98 and was awarded a Paul Harris Fellow in 2002. While farming was in his blood, the importance of community events and tourism was also paramount in the mind of John Bennett, which was evident in one of the smaller but not nonetheless significant roles. For three years, John Bennett was director of the extremely successful and popular Tasmanian craft fair from 20, between 2000 and 2004. The craft fair is organised by the Rotary Club of Deloraine in conjunction with other service clubs in the area and has become an iconic event for our state. John Bennett was a leader, a passionate community member and a farmer, but he was also much more, a craftsman, a fisherman and a family man, father, grandfather. He was a visionary who looked beyond the present and manifested a future in which we can all benefit. Thank you, John, for your lifetime of service. Vale, John Bennett. Senator Antic. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher prophetically said, communism never sleeps, never changes its objectives, and nor should we. Now, while the rhetoric has changed, the ethos is still alive and well, and the objectives of communism remain the same, the abolition of private property and total control afforded to the state. And today, believers in Marx's utopian fantasy continue to populate government departments, our education system, universities, and the media. As Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci said in 1915, socialism is precisely the religion that must overwhelm Christianity. In the new order, socialism will triumph by first capturing the culture via infiltration of schools, universities, churches and the media by transforming the consciousness of society. And not much has changed today. Engels, the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, wrote, the abolition of private property is doubtless the shortest and most significant way to characterise the revolution in the whole social order which has been made necessary by the development of industry and for this reason is rightly advanced by communism's, uh, communism as their main demand. The main demand of communists is, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, a catchphrase often used by the World Economic Forum. Marx claimed to be concerned for the rights of the working class, although he never actually worked a day in his life. And he was right when he said that the powerful and wealthy can and will exploit weaker people. But the solution is not abolishing the right to property, but upholding it, not giving total control to the state, but minimising it. Marx desired even to abolish the family unit, the concept of the nation and institutions which he viewed as the old social order. Well, in 2023, the old social order is increasingly under attack. The nuclear family is under attack. Children are being indoctrinated in our schools where they're separated from their parents into social justice ideology, as well as a general dependence on the state, complete with critical race theory, the diversity, equity, inclusion agenda and climate alarmism. Taxes and the cost of living are needlessly high and the state's monopoly over finance and how you spend your money is expanding. Progressive activists backed by the state use identity politics to foster grievances between so-called identity groups. It's no longer about the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, but it's now about one's race, one's gender, one's sexuality and so on. That's why the government promotes 
like things like the voice to parliament and so-called gender conversion therapy laws. It's fostering division, and those become protected by the state, getting them on side to make them dependents. Climate action requires that we ban fossil fuels in pursuit of net zero. COVID requires you to let the government control your medical decisions and restrict your movements. Racism and sexism require employee quotas and mandatory diversity workshops. You can see the trend. We must resist the welfare state, which globalist entities like the World Economic Forum and the United Nations endlessly promote. And we must do the opposite of what Marx argued for, protect the nuclear family and our national heritage. Today, the communists have swapped the Mao suit for the three-piece suit and the corporate boardroom. Marxism continues to rise. It continues to haunt us. But if we understand it, we can defeat it. And if it bleeds, we can kill it. Senator Polly. I rise every February since I've been in this place to speak on Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month, being February, and the devastating effect that ovarian cancer has on women and their families in Australia. Unfortunately, ovarian cancer statistics are not getting any better. Cancer Australia reports that in the four years between 2018 and 2022, ovarian cancer diagnosis has risen. They report that one in 84 women ri risk being diagnosed with ovarian cancer. The Ovarian Cancer Research Foundation reports that every eight hours, one woman dies in Australia from ovarian cancer. That is three women a day, three families that are devastated by this disease every single day. Ovarian cancer is not simple uh, to diagnose. Symptoms are too easily mimicked by those of menstrual symptoms of gastrointestinal complaints. It's so easy for women to put them down to their normal cycle or to think they've eaten something or they've, uh, they're feeling bloated because, of, um, as I will uh, articulate later, uh, women who are um, working as flight attendants, put it down to just their job. Doctors try to rule out other issues through non-invasive methods before uh, putting a potential, uh, the idea that they would have to do invasive uh, tests to confirm whether or not there is ovarian cancer. Now, due to this late diagnosis, approximately 70 per cent of women diagnosed with ovarian cancer are diagnosed with the disease that has already spread and that they are normally in stage 3 or stage 4. We're seeing only a quarter of women diagnosed live more than five years past receiving their diagnosis, early stage uh, diagnosis, and that can actually dramatically dramatically improve the chance of survival by 90 per cent. We have to do so much more about raising awareness in relation to ovarian cancer. Almost one in every three Australians don't even realise that there is a difference between cervical cancer, which is routinely screened for, and ovarian cancer. When it comes to raising awareness, we can all do our part. Have those conversations with your friends, your work colleagues, family members. The more we talk about ovarian cancer, the more awareness will grow within the community. And I'd just like to put on record, uh, and I have my Tasmanian colleagues here, they may not be as fanatical about the uh, Tasmanian Jack Jumpers, the national basketball uh, team from Tasmania, but we are fantastic. We are so proud of them. Water. But what is so different is, and what was so good to be able to be watching uh, our great uh, Jack Jumpers was on the 29th of January. They initiated to wear uh, and to raise awareness, and they wore teal to demonstrate their support for gynaecological cancer. And they were supported in conjunction with the Support Hope Educate She. Now, the fact that a men's basketball team of such great calibre was able to raise awareness is a really good. Uh, example of what can be done, that this is not just a women's issue. 
This is all of our responsibility, and I see those opposite nodding their heads. But it is important that Jack Jumpers, other sporting teams, as the Australian cricket team, have got behind breast screening, best breast cancer uh, Australia. And we know the wonderful work that's been done there. But this is the deadliest cancer for women in this country. Now, the wonderful work that has been done by Ovarian Cancer Australia, and I just want to touch because we're looking for support, because the more pressure we can put on uh, our government, which I intend to do, is to continue to fund the research, the very important work into research, but also they want $4 million. This money will help grow the specialist ovarian cancer nurse TEALS support program and it will also help progress research. Now, what we're finding is it is not just the physical diagnosis and the treatment that women have to endure, but it's the psychosocial psycho impact on their lives. That's devastating. It's devastating for their families, and so we need more nurses that can be there to give that support, that so, social, social counselling. Because the depression that comes from those diagnoses by too many women, the anxiety, the feeling of isolation, and that they're walking this path alone. Now, those services need to be there because it's not just the individual with the diagnosis, but it's their families, the conversations that they have to have with their children and their families. But the economic cost of the depression, the anxiety, the fear that they live with of the reoccurrence, you know, the change to their sexuality, their body image, how they re relate to their intimate partners. These are things that we need to be talking about. The nutritional plans that they need to have. They need dietitians. They need that support. They need that counselling. Because let's be real, in the last 30 years, very little has changed in terms of the treatment and the devastation of this disease continues to grow. I want to be able to acknowledge, obviously, what happens and the wonderful the those that work for ovarian cancer and the work and the wonderful work that they do every single day to support Australian women. But I want to talk about two women in particular. And I thank them for giving me permission to be able to tell their stories and to put it on the record. And I'd like to thank Alyssi, Jack, Kurifusi and Carolyn for allowing me to share their stories. Carolyn was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in March 2022. She went to the emergency department with severe pain in her lower right side. Her doctor did a CT scan. This showed a 16 centimetre growth from the right side uh, around her right ovary. Caroline started treatment and that cancer treatment made her feel terrible. Physically, she felt so unwell. She was struggling with the change in her appearance and how this impacted her mental health. She also has two children. And the first question that they asked when she was talking to them was, am I going to die? This is a horrible conversation to have to have with your children. But with the support of the Teal Support Program and her oncologist, her health has improved overall, and we hope that that continues to occur. But this morning, this morning at the Parliamentary Teal Ribbon Breakfast, we heard from Alyssi. In 2017, as just a young 20-year-old who was living her full life, working as a flight attendant, was diagnosed with stage three ovarian cancer. Alyssi tells her story. She talks about having a full life in her 20s before she was devastated with the news that she had. But she described the intimate details of how she felt, the physical and mental anguish that she was going through. Unfortunately for Alyssi, her cancer has come back three times. And each time she's gone back to study, she's rebuilt her life, Obviously, it's not the life that she's had. The, view, the, the feelings that she had, that she was no longer the beautiful young woman who knew where her life was leading, she had her goals and her plans. 
The devastation of this is the aggressive nature of the chemotherapy and the treatment that she's had has come to a point where she's had to make that decision not to continue with the treatment, that she's looking at the quality of life and she wants to be able to tick off a lot of those, that, those things that she aspired to do in her life, as we refer to as a bucket list, she wants to be able to. But what she really wants to do is she wants to make sure that her life means something, that what she's gone through and the time and time again that she's been able to tell her story, whether it's through the media, uh, through groups, through the work she does with Dimitri Australia and what she um, was able to, to deliver to us today was have to have been the most powerful presentation that I have experienced in all the years that I have been in this place. It was so powerful. There was not a person who has not left that breakfast that has Order. not been impacted. Your and I want time. her to know that she will not be forgotten and her words will stay with us. And I thank her for her courage and the power of her speech has and her expired. message. Senator Rennick. At last year's G20 summit in Bali, the Leader's declaration in paragraph 30 contained an innocuous statement, and I quote, G20 central banks are strongly committed to achieving price stability. Central bank independence is crucial to achieving these goals and buttressing mon monetary policy credibility. This statement couldn't be further from the truth. Central banks are the cause of the current bout of inflation and upheaval in, in the world, and their independence is the problem. The rise of independent bureaucrats has led to the rise of a powerful class of people called autocrats, government officials who are accountable to no one. They have no place in a democracy. Monetary policy is the least understood role of government. In fact, monetary policy is so little understood that there was no controversy in the 1990s when the RBA became independent. Imagine if today's Treasurer was to allow the Australian Tax Office to set rates independently from the Parliament. Yet that is exactly what the RBA can do in regard to the price of money without any parliamentary oversight. This price-fixing arrangement should dispel any notion that the people of Australia operate in a free market. It is time the people and elected politicians woke up to the importance of monetary policy as a tool critical for good government. To do that requires a far greater understanding of how monetary policy works and its history. Many wars have been fought and are currently being fought over who controls the printing press. Before paper money, wealth had to be stored as a form of hard asset, whether it be gold, land or livestock. While always vulnerable to conquest and theft, the custody of wealth was always much more transparent. The introduction of paper money in Europe in the late 17th century changed the way monetary policy worked and saw the rise of a powerful new business class, the banking industry, an industry which produces nothing but controls everything. From the 17th century through to the early 20th century, there has been a constant battle between governments and the private sector as to who controls the price and volume of money in the system. A stable currency is vital if it is to maintain confidence as a medium of exchange. The Revolutionary War was just as much, as much about the control of the new colony's monetary supply as, no, as taxation with no representation. In the mid-1700s, the USA was not indebted to a privately owned central bank. It used its own currency called the colonial script, which provided a reliable medium of exchange. Most importantly, these were notes, not bills, so the colony didn't have to pay interest to private banks. America had learned the secret of money, much to the dismay of the Bank of England. Not surprisingly, the British Parliament hurriedly passed the Currency Act of 1764. This prohibited colonial officials from issuing their own money so that Britain could instead, instead lend to the early settlers and bleed the new colonies of their wealth, much, much like the petrodollar of today, which I will touch on later. Benjamin Franklin claims that this was the cause for the American Revolution, and I quote, The colonies would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had it not been that England took away from the colonies their money which created unemployment and dissatisfaction. The inability of the colonists to get power to issue their own money 
permanently out of the hands of George III and international bankers was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. No country is truly democratic or independent unless it controls its own currency. Currencies are underwritten by taxes on the people. As a result, it is the people, via the democratic process and not unelected bankers, who should control the currency. I don't have time to go through all the political bat battles in regards to monetary policy throughout the 19th century in, in the US, United States, but it is worth noting that, unlike today, monetary policy was a political issue. Unfortunately, in 1913, the private bankers gained control of the US printing press. Unbeknown to most people, the Federal Reserve is privately owned, unlike most other central banks in the world. I should note The Wizard of Oz, a story more associated with the children's movie than the original book, was based on, based on William Jennings Bryan, the, the 1896 Democrat US presidential candidate who advocated against private banks controlling the monetary supply. He was represented by the lion in the book, Brian Lyon. In the original story, Dorothy wore silver slippers and represented the American people. The scarecrow represented the farmer and the tin man represented the worker. The yellow brick road was, of course, gold. The emerald city was the same colour as the greenback and the man behind the curtain represented the central banker. In the end, Dorothy realises that the wizard was nothing but a fraud, much like today's central bankers. The power in her shoes was represented by silver and was outside the control of central banks. Brian wanted silver as a part of the currency standard so that banks couldn't control the currency. The US dollar gained hegemonic state status at the end of World War II when the Bank of England was nationalised and, unbeknown to the British people, they were forced to pay the, repay the cost of war in US dollars for the next 60 years. The transfer of wealth from the old world to the new world was complete. Paper money must be backed by a hard asset if it is to retain its value and credibility. That nexus was broken in 1971, when Nixon went off the gold standard due to the USA's inability to fund the Vietnam War. Inflation quickly reared its ugly head. To curb it, the petrodollar was created with the cooperation of one of the world's worst perpetrators of human rights in Saudi Arabia. Because oil has to be paid for with US dollars, country need to, countries need to borrow US dollars. This means they pay interest to the private owners of the US Federal Reserve. All users of the US dollars, including US citizens themselves, must pay interest to these unelected bankers. The USA of the 1970s found itself in the same position as Britain in 1764, forcing other countries to use its currency in order to pay for foreign wars. Any threat to the petrodollar must be destroyed at all costs. The greatest threat in recent times has been the creation of the euro. The Iraq war was the result of Saddam Hussein wanting payment for Iraq's oil in euro, which was a threat to the petrodollar. The same goes for the war in Ukraine. The sale of Russian energy via the Nord Stream pipeline to Germany will undercut energy supplies backed by US dollars. US dollars is a misleading term, as it is really the deep state dollar. What else is misleading is that the idea that soldiers fight wars in the name of democracy and freedom. Nothing could be further from the truth. Wars are fought to protect the private, unknown bankers who control the world's pr printing press. It is time a spotlight was sh shone on these central bankers and they were held to account for the financial hardship and bloodshed they caused. I believe the 1937 Banking Royal Commission got it right when it said the government should regulate the volume of credit in the system with oversight of its distribution, while privately owned trading banks should be responsible for the distribution of credit. The RBA should stop relying on foreign debt to fund Australia's growth. This only transfers wealth offshore. Rather than an adopt an austerity policy by raising interest rates, which is going to have catastrophic results on many homeowners in the next 12 months, the RBA needs to adopt a proactivity policy through the funding of government infrastructure. Why should Australian governments, both state and federal, have to pay private banks interest to fund the construction of infrastructure, hard assets that generate wealth for a nation? If the government builds a dam for a billion dollars and funds that via offshore debt, then the first billion dollars it creates will have to be repaid offshore, not to mention the accumulated interest, which often ends up to be more than the original amount of principal. This strategy isn't new. 
Lachlan Macquarie was the first governor to see Australia as a country and not a colony. He knew, perhaps not based on the experience of the US patriots, that countries should have their own currency, which is why he introduced Australia's first currency, the holy dollar. Unfortunately today, the holy dollar logo is used by Macquarie Bank, whose business model is to help manage the privatisation of our nation's infrastructure. It's time the RBA adopted quantitative productive measures that will fund infrastructure to build, nation, to build our nation rather than destroy it via this ridiculous austerity policy that is only going to result in the asset stripping of hundreds of thousands of Australians from losing their home. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you. Uh, tonight I'm presenting a speech written by Ken Fleming father of Jack, who passed away at 21 from brain cancer. While this isn't an easy speech to read or hear, it's too important not to. This is Ken's story, and I quote, Brain cancer kills more Australian children than any other disease. It also kills more people under 40 in Australia than any other cancer. I didn't know this. I naively thought leukaemia was the number one killer of children in Australia. My brutal awakening started on the evening of Saturday the 28th of May 2016. My son Jack, who was 19 at the time, complained of a headache. My wife Diana took him, took him, took him, told him to take a couple of Panadol, as we do, and lie down. And we didn't think anything of it. That night he had his first seizure and spent the night in hospital under observation. After several tests later, including a biopsy on the 6th of July, we met with his neurosurgeon, Andrew Hung, on the 8th of July. Andrew sat directly in front of Jack and said, I'm afraid I have bad news for you, Jack, and wish there was some other way to tell you, but you have brain cancer, and it is terminal. It's called glioblastoma, multiform or GBM, and it is stage four. Jack didn't say a word, and I could hear Diane's breathing, but not my own, because I'd stopped breathing. I said, how long? He said, a year? Give or take a month or two. We got 22 months with Jack. Jack said, all I want to do is live, and I knew I would do everything in my power to make that happen. But I didn't. I couldn't, as a parent. I felt my greatest failing was the inability to prevent the death of my child. A chance meeting with Professor Manuel Grober gave a glimmer of hope. He was surprised that someone so young was diagnosed with such an aggressive form of brain cancer. Collaborating with Dr Michael Buckland, they conducted molecular testing of Jack's tumour, a procedure that is not routinely used in Australia for brain, brain cancer diagnosis. The original diagnosis was confirmed along with a number of factors and unique markers that lead to a new treatment regime and access to an, antibo an antibody drug AB2414. While Jack was alive, we invested in a whisky company and while I, I have sold it now, the new owners will be dedicating a barrel for all the bottles to be auctioned to raise money to help fund the testing facility. After Jack died, I wrote a book. Sorry, I read that book. It's Jack's story, and it's not a fairy tale. It's a tale in search of a solution. Leukaemia, breast, cervical, prostate, and bowel cancers, amongst others, have experienced major breakthroughs in recent years and may not be a death sentence. However, brain cancer survival rates are low and have hardly, hardly changed for 30 years despite significant increases in survival for Australians diagnosed with other types of cancer. Since Jack died, I've been, since Jack died, I've been um, collaborating with Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, Sydney University and Sydney Local Health District to establish a molecular testing facility in Sydney for brain cancer patients. Together, a formal submission was made to the former health minister to establish the facility, along with a letter I wrote and a copy of Jack's story and a T-shirt. The T-shirt had a picture of a tattoo on the front, and that tattoo never was. And a picture of Jack on the back, the boy who is no more. 
His response was an invitation to Canberra to discuss our proposal. I had my discussions with the former Health Minister subsequent to that and have a photo of him wearing Jack's T-shirt on a run around Lake Burley Griffin. Unfortunately, COVID got in the way and everything was put on hold. I wrote to the new Minister for Health, Mark Butler, on the 11th of July 2022 and enclosed a copy of my submission for the facility in Sydney, my book and a T-shirt. I also told him that the three pioneers of Australian whisky, Bill Lark of Lark Distillery, Casey Overin and Overin Whisky, and Patrick Maguire of Sullivan's Cove, and our joint project to auction bottles of whisky from the first whisky barrel we produced to raise money for the research facility in Sydney. Minister Butler's response was patronising, dismissive and discourteous, and he made no acknowledgement of the submission which was authored by three prominent organisations and all of whom are directly or indirectly involved in brain cancer research. No thank you for the book and T-shirt, no acknowledgement or even encouragement for the proposed auction of whisky bottles or the cause it was supporting. The response from Minister Butler was a marketing opportunity about all the wonderful things that his government is doing in brain cancer research. I also wrote to Senator Anne Rustin, Shadow Minister for Health and Aged Care, and received a cursory acknowledgement. The reason I approached Senator Lambie was that I needed someone who was principled, fearless and equally passionate about children's health to ask the minister the following questions. These are the questions. Why was such a well thought through and considered proposal to establish a molecular testing facility authored by three prominent Australian organisations completely ignored? Was my book read? And maybe a word of support to three iconic Australian whisky brands to raise money wouldn't have gone astray either. I have similarly written to the Minister for Health in New South Wales in 2022, and at least Minister Butler was one step ahead as I have received nothing from Brad Hazard. I'm not special. I'm just a father who lost a son, and like many parents, I just want to do something that might save another child's life. Seven dollars, seven million, seven million we're talking about, not billion, is desperately needed and maybe a conversation between Brad, Brad Hazard, Mark Butler and the three organisations I've been collaborating with might find a way forward to find a molecular testing facility and help me find solace knowing that I may have helped save a life in the future and maybe the universe will be back in balance again. End quote. That is Ken's tale. And I know he's not the only parent to lose a child to cancer, and he won't be the last. And that thought just breaks my heart. And I know that we've been talking about cancer up here, and it's really hard when someone passes, but I think that we all have to admit what really, really deep down pulls at the heartstrings is when it involves our kids. Whether they mean kids of disadvantage, kids that are sick and dying, but, but let's be honest here, it really does pull at our heartstrings. I'm asking the Labor Party to please look at this, $7 million, and if we don't have one of those facilities, we need one, and it's not a lot to ask. I will see Minister Butler, but I did promise Ken I would say, tell his tale, and I have done that to pay respect to his son. So once again, I'm sure that the Minister Butler will hear this, and I'm just hoping if you could just do the right thing and contact Ken, he's been through enough, and at least show your support and at least talk to him. That is all I'm asking for, and I think, out of respect, Ken and his family deserve that. But not just that. If that $7 million does this, and we can help other kids in the future, whether it's to even slow down the progression and give them a longer life, then for $7 million, bucks, we're not asking a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Lambie. In calling Senator Rice, I just remind Senators of Standing Order 185, subpara 1. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The Australian Greens believe that universal human rights are fundamental and must be respected for all people and in all countries. That principle informed my approach as the Greens' foreign affairs spokesperson, and it continues to inform my views on foreign policy. I want to particularly note and thank Senator Steeljohn, who is now the Greens Foreign Affairs spokesperson, for his important advocacy in this portfolio 
and the passion he has for justice and human rights around the world. I want to start tonight talking about human rights and foreign affairs, starting with Magnitsky legislation. The Magnitsky legislation that Australia has in place is something that I campaign for strongly, including by introducing the Human Rights Targeted Sanctions Bill 2021. And I note there are a number of improvements in that bill that could still be incorporated into our current Magnitsky framework. Having campaigned for that legislation and for the imposition of targeted sanctions against leaders of the coup in Myanmar, it has been a relief to see the Australian government finally impose targeted sanctions against the leaders of the coup. It is much later than it should have been, but it is an important step and one that brings Australia closer to being in line with a number of other countries who have rightly responded to the ongoing atrocities that are occurring in Myanmar by targeting those that are responsible for so much suffering. And I want to thank those community members right around Australia who kept the pressure before, during and after the election. And I also, again, want to particularly note the important work of my colleague, Senator Steelejohn. I also note that the Australian government recently imposed targeted sanctions against key figures who have committed human rights violations in Iran. This is also an important step. And again, I want to thank those community members who have pushed incredibly hard for this. You know that your advocacy and your campaigning for justice makes a difference. I recently wrote to the Iranian ambassador in Australia notifying that I would be acting as a political sponsor for three young activists, Ali Jahangiri, Sina Mohammad Rezae and Mehdi Shirani. Tragically, these three young folk are facing execution under a system that is desperate to stamp out every trace of dissent and silence every opposing voice. And I want to acknowledge all of those campaigning in outside and particularly inside Iran under the unified banner of women, life, freedom. For your courage and your conviction, we thank you. Too many have paid the ultimate price for their principles and have had their lives cut short by a regime that is so terrified of losing its grip on power that any trace of disagreement, any hint of a different vision, terrifies them. Applying sanctions is an important step by the Australian government in responding to the atrocities. We think more can be done to respond to the actions of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps through stronger travel bans and further sanctions. This is an important issue, and the Australian government should be closely considering its approach, including ensuring that it is doing everything possible to respond to these horrific atrocities. I also want to mention the situation in Armenia and Azerbaijan. The closure of the Lokan Corridor has had major humanitarian consequences on the Artsakh community and caused great alarm to the Armenian diaspora here in Australia. The Greens have called on Azerbaijan to urgently reopen the corridor to ensure free movement and security and, most importantly, to prevent this crisis escalating. The Greens remain in solidarity with the people of Artsakh demanding a reopening of the road and reaffirming our support to the rights of all peoples to self-determination. I also want to mention the situation in Bangladesh. And sadly, we continue to see violations of human rights by government. I thank members of the Bangladesh diaspora community in Australia, many of whom live in New South Wales, for their continued advocacy. I had a recent meeting with members of that community and was inspired by their courage and persistence in the face of suffering and attempts to silence them. As Human Rights Watch summarises, Bangladesh security forces have been implicated in serious abuses, including torture, extrajudicial killings and enforced disappearances. The government has arrested journalists and critics under the Digital Security Act and otherwise stifled civil society. Authorities fail to protect LGBT people, religious minorities and Indigenous populations. Women and girls face widespread violence and sexual assault without reliable protection or legal recourse. We urge the Australian government to do everything it can to address these atrocities and to protect, work to be protecting and promoting human rights wherever possible. As I speak about human rights around the world, I want to now focus on the plight of peoples who live under occupation. 
starting with Tibet, which China invaded in 1950 and overthrew the Tibetan government in 1959, 64 years ago. Tibetan Uprising Day is observed on the 10th of March each year, which commemorates the 1959 Tibetan Uprising, which ultimately resulted in a violent crackdown on Tibetan independence movements and the flight of, of the Dalai Lama into exile. And since that time, it's estimated that over a million Tibetans have been killed. And with the Chinese government policy of resettlement of Chinese people to Tibet, Tibetans have become a minority in their own country. In November last year, a group of UN special rapporteurs issued a statement noting their grave concerns. They said they have received information concerning what appears to amount to a pol policy of acculturation and assimilation of the Tibetan culture into the dominant Han Chinese minority through a series of oppressive actions against Tibetan educational, religious and linguistic institutions, in contradiction with the right to freedom of religion and belief, the right to education and cultural rights of the, t of the Tibetan people. And just yesterday, the UN Human Rights Commissioner issued a media statement noting their alarm at the separation of one million Tibetan children from families and forced assimilation at residential schools. And I continue to be extremely concerned about the disappearance of the Panchen Lama 28 years ago. Last year I introduced a motion to the notice paper calling for the Senate to only recognise a Dalai Lama appointed via Tibetan Buddhist traditions and practices without interference by the Chinese government. I am looking forward to joining other members of our all-party parliamentary group for Tibet in April, visiting Tibetans in exile in Dharamsala in India and having an audience with the Dalai Lama. And I wish to extend my sincere thanks to the Tibetan Information Office for extending this invitation to us. Palestine is another part of the world under occupation. Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International and many other organisations have clearly stated that the actions of the extreme right-wing Israeli government can constitute apartheid. Due to the ongoing military blockade of Gaza by the Israeli government, 97 per cent of the water is undrinkable. Media reports indicate that recently there were 144 attacks on Palestinians in a single day. This followed the targeted attack that killed at least seven worshippers outside a synagogue in Jerusalem on Holocaust Remembrance Day, the tragic attack on Jewish people on this solemn day, and the subsequent horrific and unrestrained response from the Israeli government is deeply concerning and is no way to achieve progress towards peace. The cycle of violence must end. In that context, the new Israeli government is incredibly concerning. Breaking the silence stated that, by anyone's standards, this will be the most hardline, ultra-nationalist and illiberal government Israel has ever known. A few weeks ago, over 90 countries condemned punitive measures by the Israel government against Palestinians. We would urge the Australian government to join those calls. The Australian Greens want to see an end to injustice and human rights violations. The Australian government must do more to advocate for an end to the occupation. We want to see peace, justice and freedom for Israelis and Palestinians. Now, I want to finish by mentioning the situation in West Papua, another occupied part of the world. Indonesia has controlled West Papua since invading in 1963, and security forces are accused of severe human rights violations during the occupation, with an estimated half a million Papuans killed. The Australian government has been blind to these abuses and has failed to take action. We are in solidarity with all the West Papuans who are facing such violence. We urge the Indonesian government to immediately withdraw all military forces and to cease attacks on civilians. Instead, we urge them and we urge the Australian government to support the West Papuan right to self-determination. Senator Scar. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I rise this evening to make, uh, make some remarks uh, in relation to the essay which was written by the Honourable Jim Chalmers MP, member for Rankin in my home state of Queensland. 
and the article was entitled Capitalism After the Crises and published in the monthly magazine February 2023. I should say, Mr Acting Deputy President, I've got a copy here. Um, I do actually I did buy the magazine. Um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. That's one of the economic principles I believe in. Uh, so I actually did buy a copy of the magazine, but I left it at my apartment. So I used my one free monthly one free monthly article to print this out. But I have uh, certainly paid my dues, and uh, I've read the 6,000 words in the article. And I want to make some preliminary comments, firstly, in relation to uh, the member for Rankin. Uh, first, I engage uh, on a very regular basis with the same local communities, multicultural communities, that uh, the member for Rankin engages with, and I acknowledge and deeply respect uh, the work he does on the ground and his engagement with local communities and multicultural communities. And in fact, I was, uh, the last event I attended with him was a celebration of Waitangi Day in Logan City just on last Friday. Uh, second, I think it really is important. I think it's incredibly important that participants in the political sphere actually go to the trouble, as Mr Chalmers has done, of putting down his thoughts with respect to his philosophy, etc., in a very well-written, articulate article. And I acknowledge that. Uh, and third, uh, whilst uh, clearly this article evidence, evidences a deep philosophical divide between those who are social democrats uh, on the one hand and those of us who believe in classical liberal principles with respect to economic management. These are two very much mainstream views with respect to the economy and uh, it is quite legitimate that we have this discussion and debate. So I think it is to be welcomed. I may not be able to get through all of my remarks in my 10 minutes, uh, and uh, there may be a collective sigh that that means I'm going to use the next seven minutes, but I will at least attempt to cover some of the main points. Uh, and I'll do this by reference to some of the major quotes in Mr Chalmers' article. The first quote is on page, tw uh, page two of my uh, printout. And I quote, successive leaders failed to find their way conclusively or convincingly past the neoliberalism of the pre-crises period. In other words, while the world was getting more uncertain, we had been growing more vulnerable, end quote. So this is in the manner of Kevin Rudd's article uh, that appeared in the same publication following the global financial crisis. There's this attack on the concept of neoliberalism, as if neoliberalism is a dirty word. So I brought some friends with me in order to defend uh, the concept of neoliberalism and what it actually means. And my first friend, uh, of course, is Nobel Prize laureate Milton Friedman. And in his book, Capitalism and Freedom, he wrote, The existence of a free market does not, of course, eliminate the need for government. On the contrary, government is essential both as a forum for determining the rules of the game and as an umpire to interpret and enforce the rules decided on. What the market does is to reduce greatly the range of issues that must be decided through political means and thereby to minimise the extent to which government need participate directly in the game. The characteristic feature of action through political channels is that it tends to require or enforce substantial conformity. The great advantage of the market, on the other hand, is that it permits wide diversity. It is, in political terms, a system of proportional representation. It is this feature of the market that we refer to when we say that the market provides economic freedom. But this characteristic also has implications that go far beyond the narrowly economic. Political freedom means the absence of coercion of a man by his fellow man. The fundamental threat to freedom is power to coerce, be it in the hands of a monarch, a dictator, an oligarchy or a momentary majority, as we have today. 
The preservation of freedom requires the elimination of such concentration of power to the fullest possible extent and the dispersal and distribution of whatever power cannot be eliminated. A system of checks and balances by removing the organisation of economic activity from the control of political authority, the market eliminates this source of coercive power. It enables economic strength to be a check to political power rather than a reinforcement." End quote. And that is one of my heroes, Milton Friedman. And of course, Mr Friedman was inspired by another of my heroes, Frederick Hayek. And I wish to quote from Frederick Hayek's book, The Fatal Conceit, The Errors of Socialism. This is what Frederick Hayek said. This book argues that our civilization depends not only for its origin, but also for its preservation on what can be precisely described only as the extended order of human cooperation, an order more commonly, if somewhat misleadingly, known as capitalism. To understand our civilization, one must appreciate that the extended order resulted not from human design or intention, but spontaneously. It arose from unintentionally conforming to certain traditional and largely moral practices, many of which men tend to dislike, whose significance they usually fail to understand, whose validity they cannot prove, and which have nonetheless fairly rapidly spread by means of an evolutionary selection, the comparative increase of population and wealth of those groups that happen to follow them. The unwitting, reluctant, even painful adoption of these practices kept those groups together, increased their access to valuable information of all sorts, and enabled them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. The main point of my argument is then that the conflict between, on one hand, advocates for the spontaneous extended human order created by a competitive market, and on the other hand, those who demand a deliberate arrangement of human interaction by central authority based on collective command over available resources is due to a factual error by the latter about how knowledge of these resources is and can be generated and utilised." End quote. That's Hayek, the fatal conceit there is a socialism. And of course, Hayek was inspired by Ludwig von Mises. And I'd like to quote from Ludwig von Mises' uh, magisterial analysis of socialism, entitled An Economic and Sociological Analysis. And this is what he said. Quote, if a socialist community were capable of economic calculation, it could be set up without any change in men's moral character. In a socialist society, different ethical standards would prevail from those of a society based on private ownership in the means of production. The temporary sacrifices demanded of the individual by society would be different, yet it would be no more difficult to enforce the code of socialist morals than it is to enforce the code of capitalist morals if there were any possibility of making objective computations within the socialist society." End quote. The common theme in all of those contributions, the common theme in all of those contributions is that you do not get you do not get better results from seeking to dictate the allocation of resources from a central government under a command structure than you get from the millions and millions of spontaneous decisions made between individuals in a free market who make decisions based on their own on their own interests and who thereby take into account information and knowledge which cannot possibly be taken into account by a government. So we come back to the old debate between classical liberalism on the one hand and social democracy on the other. And I do say, I do say that those opposite should remember, should remember the lessons of the Hawke Keating years, should remember that this country did have 30 years of economic growth. And a major reason for that, a major reason for that was that the both major parties of government were on the same page with respect to the need for economic reform, with respect to the need for growth based on productivity and on the basis of the power of the market to make decisions which government is simply unable to make. Senator Pratt. Oh, no, sorry. Uh I'll go to Senator Pratt. Thank you. Sexual assault allegations, reports of gay conversion therapy, forcible restraint, and unqualified pharmaceutical treatment 
are very unfortunately just a few examples of experiences reported by survivors of Esther House. Esther House was an unregulated private residential facility that until recently was operating in Perth, Western Australia. Over the duration of its operations, the foundation of Esther House promoted itself as providing mental health, alcohol and other drug treatment services, as well as a range of other in-demand general support services. Esther House, in 2019, under the Morrison government, received some $4 million as part of an agreement within the Australian government's Community Health and Hospitals Program. And the grant was announced in person by then Prime Minister Scott Morrison during a visit to the facility. Fortunately, the facility has now closed and in December of 2022 the WA government tabled a report in the state parliament from a parliamentary committee into the Esther House Foundation. And it provided a real opportunity for survivors of this unregulated private health facility to be heard. These survivors were often young and vulnerable at the time of entering this residential facil facility. Some of those survivors have shared their experiences with me, and I say thank you. I say thank you to the survivors who gave their evidence to the parliamentary committee, and I want to send a message to all of those who don't yet feel safe enough to speak out. I hear you, and I too ask questions as to how this could have been allowed to happen, and what can we do to ensure that this does not happen again? I'm pleased and relieved to know that the McGowan government has moved on one of the recommendations of the report, and that is to criminalise practices that seek to change or suppress an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity. There is no evidence that sexual orientation or gender identity can be changed. And these practices are more than ineffective. They are simply extremely harmful. I have sat and listened to the recollections of a number of survivors, and I know that these practices can amount to torture and can cause long-term mental health issues, even suicide. The work must continue to ensure that vulnerable people can access the help that they need without the risk of unprofessional, unregulated and or unqualified operators causing them further harm. The report's findings and recommendations point to state government acts and regulations that need review. We must, at a federal level though, also ensure that national frameworks and quality standards are met by private rehabilitation service providers, whether they receive public funding or not. I'd like us to keep in mind that even without direct government funding, facilities like Esther House can and do receive referrals from government agencies. They re receive referrals from judges and magistrates. They receive referrals from distressed parents and even individual members of the public and self-referral from people in need. They receive in-kind support, small grants and public endorsement from existing state and federal governments, all while avoiding and excluding themselves from the regulatory framework that normally accompanies funding agreements. It stands to reason that the public should feel confident when they access a rehabilitation service offering mental health support, that they will be in a safe and supported environment with qualified staff and a clear complaint mechanism should any issue arise. It's reasonable to expect that services are subject to systems of monitoring, reporting, minimum standards, standards and licensing, 
licensing that includes verifiable statistics and best practice methods with the oversight of a regulating body and a framework. In short, what we should expect from any treatment service such as a hospital. The report of the State Parliamentary Inquiry makes the important and key distinction between a positive regulatory system which includes a barrier to entry where specific targets and quality standards need to be met versus, in this case at best, where in part but not very much there was a negative regulatory scheme in place which focused on dealing with non-compliance of established standards after the complaints were made. But even so, very few of those standards were actually upheld in practice or had any oversight within that institution. It was not until complaints were made that saw the institution closed that anyone saw any kind of protection. I was horrified to learn that neither the Morrison government's grant agreement nor the subsequent amendment made to the original agreement sought to embed sector-specific quality requirements as part of the initial grant's funding requirements. But I'm sad to say the case of Esther House is not an isolated one. Across the country there have been other controversies surrounding, in particular, faith-based, among other, but in particular faith-based organisations seeking to assist vulnerable people but actually uh, perpetuating abuse against them because they do not have governance and oversight that meets quality framework and standards. The inquiry noted in its report similar, compl similar complaints directed at, for example, Mercy Ministries and Healing House. The work must continue to ensure that vulnerable people can access the help they need without the risk of unprofessional, unregulated and or unqualified qualified operators causing them for the further harm. The report's findings and recommendations point to state government acts and we must ensure at a national level that agencies and organisations like Esther House, which have in the past and can and do receive government referrals and government funding, uh, does not happen in the future. In the words of one survivor who shared their horrifying lived experience with me, they said, Esther hurt me, broke me down and made me feel like less of a person or even a being. Every day with myself is a major challenge and it's exhausting. This cannot be allowed to continue to happen. As the report states, the complexity of running a trauma recovery program should have demanded strong governance structures. Where such programs are allowed to exist without them, we're left with an organisation that has the potential to cause far more harm than good and leads us to a place where we have individuals who require more future ongoing mental health support to aid their recovery. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. It's a welcome addition to this parliament that there has been a noticeable improvement in the level of interest that Australian parliamentarians have been giving to the issue of human rights. Here, here. I'd make this observation as a former chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights. It is not good enough to be interested in a human right. It is important to be interested in all human rights mm -hmm. because it's the consistency of their application that protects the human rights of all people at all time. I rise this evening to acknowledge an issue that is very, very close to my heart and an event that took place last year. Australia, we can be proud, has demonstrated through the decades that we are a progressive, forward-looking and humane nation. The abolition of the death penalty here is a proud testament to this. 
Queensland became the first place in both Australia and the British Commonwealth, then the Empire, to abolish the death penalty in 1922. And, is, and it was the centenary of that event last year that I had cause to travel to Brisbane to celebrate, to commemorate this important human rights achievement at the Queensland Parliament. I was pleased to be in the presence of the Honourable Michael Kirby as he gave a keynote address on this important occasion. Justice Kirby noted that capital punishment was quickly adopted in England's overseas colonies, including Australia, notably in Queensland. The reform of this aspect of criminal punishment proved most resistant to change. This is why the abolition of the availability of the sentence of death in Queensland on 1 August 1922, a century ago last year, is so worthy of remembrance and because it led to change across our whole country and, indeed, across the world. But it took time. Tasmania abolished the death penalty in 1968. The Commonwealth followed five years later in 1973. Victoria did so in 1975, South Australia in 1976 and Western Australia in 1984. New South Wales finally abolished the death penalty for all crimes in 1985. Abolition first arose as a topic of intense parliamentary debate in 1899, sparked by increasing public unrest and a distaste for the practice. Hotly debated in 1922, as you would expect, the pivotal Criminal Code Amendment Act, the one that we celebrated, its abolition, received assent by a narrow 33 to 30 vote, but became the law. My state of Western Australia was one of the last to officially abolish the death penalty, but it became a defunct practice after the 1960s. Serial killer Eric Edgar Cook became the last person to be hanged in WA in 1964. I think it is important here to lay out why I personally oppose, and I believe others should oppose, the death penalty. For many people of faith, the idea of state-sanctioned killing brings one of the Ten Commandments, that thou shall not kill, to the forefront of our consideration. And of course we know that the death penalty is the final and absolute punishment. It offers no recourse in being able to, re to correct any miscarriage of justice. Returning to the story of Eric Cook, a West Australian, 18-year-old Daryl Beamish was convicted of the 1959 murder of Gillian Brewer. Beamish was sentenced to death, but his sentence was later changed to life imprisonment after new evidence became available to light pointing to his innocence. Beamish was found innocent because the murder he was charged with was committed by Cook. Another man, John Button, found himself in a similar situation and was later reprieved. The fact that innocent men like Beamish and Button face the hangman's noose for murders committed by another is a clear reminder of the precariousness of the death penalty in the 1960s and now, and why its abolition was an important step forward for society, not to mention an important moral victory. Most Australians today see the death penalty as an abhorrent and outdated practice, and we should welcome that. While from time to time, when unspeakable, unspeakable crimes are committed, we hear calls for its return. We have seen through public polling most Australian, Australians remain overwhelmingly opposed to it. We saw this proof, proof of this opposition, when two Australians from the Bali Nine, Meron Sukumaran and Andrew Chan, faced execution by the firing squad in 2015. There were appeals for clemency for the two from all sections of our society. But unfortunately, we know all too well that the death penalty extends far beyond the boundaries of our neighbour, Indonesia. A key feature of Australia's constant advocacy against the death penalty has been the Australian Parliament's multi-partisan work through the Australian Parliamentarians Against the Death Penalty Parliamentary Group. In the 47th Parliament, in this Parliament, a group of many members and senators have again recommitted themselves to working internationally with other parliaments, with non-government organisations, to advance their abolition of the death penalty. 
When international campaigning first began to abolish the death penalty in 1977, there were just 16 countries that had abolished the death penalty. As of 2021, a total of 108 countries have abolished the death penalty for all crimes. Despite this success, a third of the world still lives under legal frameworks which comprise capital punishment. Tonight I want to particularly acknowledge the work of a wonderful, committed, passionate but small group of Australians. They are known as the Capital Punishment Justice Project. They work to free people from the death penalty around the world. They are a committed group of Australians. I want to share two points that they drew to my attention just last year. The first is in regards to Bangladesh, where the Capital Punishment Justice Program says, since 2009, 2,606 people have been sentenced to death. Many people language on death row and solitary confinement whilst their cases make their way through the courts, which can take more than 10 years. A further 320 people were sentenced to death in 2021. And in regards to Singapore, they have said, since October 2021, Singapore has issued at least 15 execution warrants and executed at least 11 men. Of the 11 men executed, 10 were convicted of relatively low-level heroin tra trafficking and, I was convicted of, and, and one was convicted of trafficking cannabis. There are now approximately 55 people on death row, amongst all for drug offences, mostly members of poor, disadvantaged minorities. This is Singapore, a country we would regard as a peer in the family of liberal democracies. Tomorrow, I invite members and senators to come to a meeting of the Australians Against the Death Penalty, where we will meet with human rights champions from Singapore to talk about this terrible and atrocious practice that is happening in a country like Singapore. I end my contribution with the words of Michael Kirby. The project begun on 1 August 1922 remains incomplete. Humanity must not endure a further century of argument, attempted persuasion and agitation to complete the challenge launched in the Queensland Parliament in 1922. Australians should honour and remember the political leaders, judges and advocates, politicians and civil society leaders for standing up and speaking out on the death penalty. So here in this place, on this evening, I encourage all of my colleagues to adopt the spirit of the 100th anniversary of the abolition of the death penalty and join with me and their colleagues in this Australian Parliament by arguing, campaigning and advocating for the continued abolition of the death penalty wherever it presents itself. Thank you. Uh, the Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.